All right, good evening, everyone. Let's call the meeting to order. This is our March 2nd, 2021 meeting of the Steamboat Springs City Council. Julie, please call the roll. Jason Lacey. Here. Kathy Meyer. Here. Michael Pacino. Here. Robin Crossan. Here. Sonia Macy's. Sonia um, texted me and said she might be a little late, but she'll be here. Bill Pettis. Here. And Heather Sloop. Here. All right, everyone, let's get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's stand together and say that. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation, one nation God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, for all. justice for all. all right. Thank you, everyone. So before we get into our regular agenda, we need to do some quick business on liquor license authority. So if I could get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Myers, second by Crossan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, so we are adjourned. And we are now calling to order our liquor license authority meeting. The roll call is the same. Looks like it's six of us here right now and Sonia will be joining us shortly. And first item on the liquor license agenda is on the consent calendar, item one which is a, to set a hearing date and designate a neighborhood for a new tavern liquor license for the Wine Collective LLC, DBA The Collective. Does anyone on Liquor License Authority wish to pull this item? Anybody in the public wish to pull this consent item on liquor license? Hearing none, I'll look for a motion to approve. Move to approve the consent item number one. Second. Second. Motion by Meyer and second by Bacino. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that passes six to zero. And last on liquor license is approval of minutes from January 19th, 2021. Could I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion, motion by Sloop and a second by Crossan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that passes unanimously as well. Six to zero. All right, now could I get a motion to adjourn from Liquor License Authority? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Motion by Sloop, second by Crossan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. So we are finished with Liquor License Authority. And that brings us back to our regular agenda. And we will start off with city council reports. Council, we obviously have a big agenda tonight. So I'd ask everyone to be sharp and focused with their comments, please. And just go around and see if we have any council reports. Liesl, I'll start with you. No report. Okay. Um, is Sonia here? I don't know if she's joined us yet. No. Okay. Um, Kathy, any report from you? Yeah, quickly, two items. Um, I attended the Main Street meeting this morning the of the Board of Directors. Mm -hmm. the, men the meeting was primarily a discussion of farmer's market. Um, there is a hope that um, they can have more attendees um, and they're talking to the public health department right now. And the other, the other item is um, I'm going to be sending around uh, a draft of a letter. Um, you may recall about a month ago, I volunteered to be the point person on the um, um, migrating mountains study that's being uh, conducted by CAST or, and uh, Northwest COG. And they are in the process of uh, distributing a questionnaire to the public. And this letter is just a letter to the editor um, uh, requesting everyone to participate in the uh, survey. So I wanted to, everybody to see it before it, it gets published in the paper. But it's not taking a position, it's just merely please participate in the survey. Okay, thank you, Kathy. 
Uh, Heather, any report from you? Yeah, um, so I had a lot of um, subcommittee meetings in the last week or so. I've sent you guys the minutes from all that, so I'm not going to reiterate. Um, I did attend the Ice Rink Advisory Committee. We had a couple of Ski Corps meetings. Kathy and I are now on that, um, just due to um, calendar constraints from Sonia. So Kathy and I have taken over for that. Um, what else did I attend? Um, there was a CAS transportation call, um, and those that recording was sent to you. Um, I will say, as of this morning, I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to listen. Um, I had a, a call from um, Executive Director Lou this morning regarding that recording, and uh, she, I mean, I, I've, I've not been uh, silent in how concerned I was with that conversation that um, especially the Metro mayors were were showing and, and giving great information on how they feel the legislative uh, session should go for funding. Um, so Shashant, Director Liu and I had a good conversation. We are going to kind of put forth collaboratively since I'm the vice chair of STAC um, a, a messaging forum to STAC and then to Transportation Commission to kind of reiterate the necessity to have funding be equivalent throughout the state and not have it go just to the metro areas. So just so you know, I'm on this white on rice. We are going to do everything we can to consider and keep fun funding in the rural areas just as well as in metro areas and try to make sure that there is a across the board state um, buy into this and have it not be a uh, David Goliath scenario like it was in years past and make sure that there's a, 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 an equivalent front in the sense that the cities and the rural areas are all speaking with one voice and not being separated. So um, Director Lou and I are working on that and hopefully we'll have more information to give you next week at our stack meeting. Um, other than that, uh, I think Kathy and I will let you guys stay tuned to how the negotiations are doing going. They're actually going very well and positively. I think it took a really good turn last week and um, we'll be able to give you a great input on the 16th, which I believe is what your de our deadline to give you some heads up on that is. So please bear with us and know that we're trying very hard to give you a great um, output, which will kind of steer us away from talking about the big tax word. So we'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks, Heather. And Robin, any report from you? Yeah, um, as Heather had said, we had Hallison Hair Chair meetings that we Heather had sent out the uh, minutes from. There was an airport commission meeting, and you'll hear about the city's master plan later this evening. The marketing meeting um, I attended, I sent to Julie so that you could see what all the marketing ideas are for the spring. And then the one thing that I had spoken with both Jason Peasley and Gary about, um, I had received a complaint on the cluster boxes or lack thereof at Alpenglow. And the fact that we as a city require cluster boxes to go in and yet the post office is not um, doing their share to get um, service to Alpenglow. So it's ongoing, um, the city's aware of it, and Jason's working through Yampa Valley Housing Authority on it as well. But I just want everybody to know that we require something, and then right now it does not appear the post office is following through. And that's it. Okay, thanks Robin. Michael, what about from you? Uh, yeah, and actually Robin, that's a really good point that you mentioned of someone uh, trying to do the same thing at an older property. Um, that's probably grandfathered in. It was at the West condominiums and they want to get cluster boxes because people are living there and they are running into some roadblocks with uh, the post office, but it's something more at the corporate level, not on the local level. I think they're getting help. So whatever we can do from city council, I would help. Um, as far as my report goes, I think um, we had a innovative transportation task meeting last week that went really, really well. Uh, we had the gentleman um, kind of spearheading in the Telluride gondola, Mountain Village, kind of that whole connection with the uh, Transportation Authority. And so he gave us all some really good insight and we'll put that together. You'll get some minutes or at least some summary of that here shortly. 
Uh, other than that, uh, very simple and easy this week. I had a nice uh, little vacation with the kids during blues break. Hopefully you guys did too. Hey, thanks, Michael. See, Sonia has joined us. Sonia, did you have a report for us tonight? Yeah, thanks. Um, just a couple items. Like Michael said, we had an Innovative Transportation Task Force meeting. Um, it really did go well. We got a really good and interesting presentation from the staffer from SMART, which is the most recent um, regional transportation authority in the San Miguel area. And, um, you know, it's a very interesting case study that has just come online and it kind of helped, I think, open all of our eyes to the amount of flexibility that we have within a regional transportation authority to include certain areas, exclude certain areas, whether that's in the vote or whether that's in the service. Um, and actually, I was going to write this up and, and send it around, so I think I will because there's really too much uh, detail just to, to get into. But essentially, um, he was really optimistic about the possibilities that we have here to do something like a regional transportation authority. So that was a really great presentation. Thanks to Jonathan Flynn for inviting him. I guess they work really closely together on issues, which is amazing. Um, and then secondly, uh, I participated in the CML transportation um, discussion. I guess that was the governor's office and a number of different state legislators. And I'm not sure if you guys have already talked about that, but um, at our last meeting, we had discussed that we wanted to, we being the uh, city council, wanted to have the Innovative Transportation Task Force write a letter to the uh, governor and state legislature and ask them if they are considering any uh, transportation funding bills in this particular session, that they would really strongly include and emphasize uh, multimodal and transit. And so uh, the Innovative Tra Tra Transportation Task Force did write that letter. And, um, you know, I was really actually uplifted within uh, the the state level meeting to hear a number of people sort of articulate that that was a priority for them uh, in this cycle. And, you know, I think that the note we got from the Colorado Association of Ski Towns indicated more of that um, transit was not going to be considered or transit multimodal. And I really did not get that impression from um, this transportation meeting. So um, if you haven't listened to it already, I think we were sent a link or if, if, if we were not, everybody sent a link, I will circulate that around so that you can just play it as you're cleaning your house or whatever. And it's a pretty interesting preview of what's to come this legislative session. That's it for me. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Sonia. And I'm going to skip my report. I don't have anything pressing and we have a big agenda. So I'm just going to roll on from me tonight. Uh, let's uh, agenda review. I'm not going to pull up every um, um, agenda because, again, we have lots to cover tonight, but I did want to ask council if you had a chance to look through those agendas to see if any of you had any questions or comments or concerns on the future agendas for the rest of March and April. Anything from council on those? Kind of not specific to the actual meeting agendas, but just more of a general comment. Um, I think most of us, when we saw the 1,295 page packet for tonight's meeting and some of the really meaty items that we have on the agenda, um, you know, at least I fell off my chair. And I guess I'm wondering, um, do we want to, you know, consider splitting up some of these long meetings or putting some sidebars around the length of our meeting? Because I did get some questions from members of the public who are specifically interested in the e-bike discussion, and that's pretty far down the agenda. So, you know, I know we say on our, our packet that we'd like to be done by 10 o'clock, but I'm just wondering uh, if we can put a little bit more, a little bit more of a sidebar around that or, or some limitations on the amount of pages that we are expected to process in just three or four days. Well, I get the packet the same day you do, uh, so I don't have any advanced preview on that. So I know that uh, a lot of these items, uh, particularly the ones that went through Parks and Recreation Commission, I know Angela included all of the prior minutes uh, from all those meetings, which I think that accounted for probably half or more of our entire packet. So we could certainly look at doing hyperlinks for those, but um, you know, I think staff probably Airs, tries to err on the side of over-disclosure as opposed to under-disclosure. So um, I'm not really sure how we can say, you know, packet length should be X or, or Y. Um, I don't, I think as long as we 
keep our comments focused and, and allow for some reasonable, good public input, we should be able to finish approximately on time tonight. But if anybody has any thoughts, I'm happy to hear them. I, I thought we were going to do hyperlinks on old minutes and stuff, especially, you know, and stuff like this. I, I mean, I'm, I was okay because we obviously have read all those minutes now for sometimes five times over. So I, I, I understand that, but I think the hyperlink would be valuable for old minutes, especially two year old minutes or one, you know, even one year back is, you know, it's great for it to be part of the record, but also to have the ability to say for us, okay, yeah, we read that. And if we need to reference it, we can, we can, we can click on the link. Yeah, if I could just add some insight. Um, when I was on the planning commission, we started Agenda to Go. And I know that I don't think everyone here started using that, but I've been using Agenda to Go this whole time on city council as well. And um, it's a lot different than Box and other ones because that's very lineal and it goes from page one to page 1300. Whereas when you're using uh, Agenda to Go, it's broken up into agenda items and it, it's, it's a lot easier to work with. So my encouragement to you guys just use agenda to go uh, when we start having these large packets and it may be something to uh, get familiar with. Okay, so no other feedback on packets. We'll try to work on more hyperlinks on those going forward. Anything else on that? Gary, did you have something on that? Or are you just getting oh, ready for your ready report? for the manager's report. Okay. All right, council, anything else on agendas before we hand it over to Gary? All right, hearing none, Gary, I will turn it over to you for the city manager's report. Thank you, Jason. And yeah, I've made uh, notes about the hyperlinks and I'm sure uh, the clerk's office uh, made a note on that as well. So uh, yes, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna hit the highlights of the city manager's report. Um, the first meeting of the month, we talk about the three departments, the three P's, public works, parks and recreation, and planning. And I'm, uh, the public can locate this on our website at steamboatsprings.net, steamboatsprings.net. Parks and recreation talks about the uh, Holliston Hill ski area, the rodeo grounds, parks, open space, trails, activities, adult update on adult sports, youth programs, marketing, events, gives you an idea how big this department is, Holliston Ice Arena, uh, all of the parks projects that are going on, uh, and of course uh, the Botanic Park, which is a part of Parks and Recreation. Of course, I'm sure they're looking forward to uh, springtime, uh, as well as Haymaker Golf Course. So uh, all those updates are under, uh, under Parks and Recreation Manager's Report. In planning, they've provided updates on development review, uh, and also the uh, Mountain Area Master Plan, which uh, you can find on our website as well under the Engage button. Public Works talks about updates on, from wastewater, streets, uh, engineering, uh, airport operations, uh, water, the million dollar water storage tank, and of course, SST Transit. So um, it's all in there. You can find that at steamboatsprings.net. Lower left is uh, the agenda button. You can hit on the agenda button, go to today's meeting and hit the packet and it's all can be found in there. Or you can go on the government tab up at the top of our website and just hit government. There's a direct link right there to all of the city manager reports going as far back in time as, as uh, I've been here, I think. So uh, any questions on the manager's report? Heather, go ahead. I have one question for Angela um, regarding the parks projects. Um, we had discussed in our House and Hill chairlift meeting um, about the stables trailhead bathroom and mm -hmm. having um, seed engineering develop, um, actually going to them and, and looking for um, numbers for what it would cost to actually do the study. And in here it says that they're going to actually do the study. So I'm questioning if what's actually happening, if we're getting a number for the study or if we're gonna actually pay them to do the study. Sure, I'll try to answer your question. Angela Cosby, your Parks and Recreation Director. We have contracted, and this is through our facilities department too, they are doing a design and then we hope to get some rough numbers so we can request it in a future capital improvement project budget request. 
but there's not too large of a study, but there is a design being produced. Okay, then can you, okay, then I'll ask you something else offhand. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Gary or any other department heads? City manager's report. Okay, no questions. All right, thanks Gary. Thank you, Jason. Okay. All right, so now we, uh, after staff reports, we always do our general public comment. This is the opportunity for people, if you're here to make comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda, um, you, you're welcome to make comment now. If, if you are here for other later agenda items, I would ask you please hold those comments until that time. Uh, but let me read this into the record and we'll see if we have any general public comment. So, City Council will make no decision nor take action except to direct the City Manager. Those addressing City Council are requested to identify themselves by name and address, and all comments shall not exceed three minutes. So I see uh, Kim Schultz has her hand up. And Kim, if you would give us your name and address, and we'll give you three minutes for general public comment. Thanks, Jason. Hi, I'm Kim Schultz. I live at 31733 County Road 35. I'm the executive director of Steamboat Reading. We were an awarded an HRC grant from the city, and I wanted to thank you for this funding and tell you a little about the impact the funds will have. For those of you that are not familiar with Steamboat Reading, we provide a community of support for struggling readers and their families. We provide intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring intervention from highly trained, experienced teachers, learning evaluations to help parents and children understand their academic strengths and challenges, and can diagnose learning disabilities. We have an educational advocate who collaborates with parents and schools in creating individualized education programs and 504 plans. We provide parent education and support and host free beginning reading workshops and a parent resource group. I'm the only employee and we have 10 contractors on our team. Together we provide these specialized educational services. Our focus is on helping children master foundational academic skills, mostly in reading, but also in math, writing, and executive functioning skills. And while doing this, we're building their confidence and self-esteem. The majority of our students have a diagnosed learning disability. Their stories often follow a similar path of struggles early on. And if these challenges with the basic skills are not addressed, they often begin to internalize this and think there must be something wrong with them. They begin to lose confidence and many develop anxiety about school. They act out in order to avoid doing work or just refuse to do it because it's better to get in trouble for not doing their work than take the risk that their classmates and or teachers will see that they can't do what's being asked of them. At Steamboat Reading, we're working to change the story for these children. We're educating parents on how to support beginning readers and how to recognize early signs that their child is struggling to be able to get them the right support. For our older students, we figure out the lowest level of skills that they need to master and help them build a strong foundation. Mastering foundational skills helps rebuild their confidence and self-esteem. We teach them how to advocate for what they need to be successful in a classroom. And as they find success, we change their trajectory. There are two very different places that include a high percentage of people who are dyslexic, our prisons and MIT. We are working to help children see themselves with the potential to do anything that they want to do. I'll leave you with a little feedback that we received recently from one of our parents. Our son is in first grade and has struggled to learn the basic building blocks of reading. This has affected his confidence and his ability to learn. After working with Steamboat Reading for the past five months, he's shown dramatic improvement in his ability to retain what he has learned. He's grown significantly in his reading skills, but most importantly, he has grown in his confidence and he has told us that he's proud of himself. Reading is hard for him. It doesn't come easy like it does for some other children. But with Steamboat Reading's help, he's learning how he learns and starting to trust himself with taking chances in his learning. The funding from the city allows us to offer this parent education and support programs for no charge and also supports our scholarship program that provides financial support so all families can access our services regardless of their financial situation. So we're really grateful for your support. Thank you so much. All right, thanks Kim. Thanks for all your good work. Thanks for coming in tonight. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right. Is anybody else here for general public comment for any items that are not on tonight's agenda? If so, please unmute yourself, give us your name and address, and we'll give you three minutes. Anybody else for general public comment? Things not on tonight's agenda. 
Okay. Hearing none, I will close the general public comment. All right, and that brings us to the community reports section of our meeting. And item four, this is COVID-19 action items for discussion. So council, uh, you'll notice that I've slightly changed the title on this. This was a, I think we've been calling it COVID-19 discussion. And the reason I changed it is I, I think I'd like us, if we're gonna keep having this on as an agenda item, I'd like us to use this time to focus on any specific action steps that we can do to help the community uh, related to COVID-19 and, and our response as a community. So if I think, you know, a good way to look at this would be if there's anything we that you, you see or you're hearing that we could do to help the business community, to help the county with their efforts, uh, anything you're hearing that's a concern on the street about, you know, how our response is being handled to the COVID-19 situation, I think this that's how I'd like to focus our discussion on this section going forward. So um, I'll open it up to council with that. Uh, if any of you have any action items for discussion on COVID-19, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, I do. Um, two things. Number one, um, from the city, um, I know Gary had talked briefly about possibly opening city hall back up, uh, even if it's limited. And I'd like to know where we stand with that because I think that benefits the public to have our offices open. So I'd like to know about that. And second, um, today we heard really good news um, walking around the base area that City Market, Walmart, and Safeway will have um, vaccines, and I hope it's the truth, for Friday when um, things open up for 60 and plus. So I don't know whether Kathy might have more information on that from um, attending the policy meeting today. Oh, they're every other week now. But um, that was the buzz around the mountain base area today about um, additional locations having vaccine um, possibly by Friday. Okay, Gary, did you want to take the city hall item? Yes, uh, Robin and uh, city council, we are beginning discussions. We're aware of that, that the numbers seem to be going in the right direction. Uh, what we don't want to do is uh, do the whipsaw and open up and then we go the wrong direction then we got to close again so we need to give a little bit of time we also need to give the clerk's office time to staff up uh, for the last time we opened up yes we had a person uh, up front uh, managing uh, the front office but literally nobody came in i mean there was just it was we have we have to kind of maybe redefine that job description to keep that person busy and uh, give them some work. And the type of work needs to be work that can be interrupted because you're gonna be answering phones and, and uh, taking any walk-in traffic, which I think is gonna take a while to, to build back up. But last time we opened, very, very little walk-in traffic. So uh, we're just, uh, you know, I was doing a lap around City Hall uh, yesterday and I thought, you know, we need to get, we need to get back open uh, to the public. So I agree, Robin, but we need to make sure that we do it right and staff up and have the, the right people up there and we haven't talked about what hours yet, but I'm guessing we'll probably take a hybrid approach rather than just going full on. We'll probably open for a half a day like we did last time and gradually work toward opening up uh, to regular business hours. Okay, thanks, Gary. Kathy, did you have any follow up on Robin's second item? Robin's correct. The uh, the stakeholders group meets every other week, so I have no no factual information about vaccines. Okay. Hopefully it's the truth. <laughs> so I'll pass along um, a concern that was shared with me just for you guys to, you know, chew on and think about whether this, there is an action item in this or not. Um, you know, with the news being released today that two states have decided to fully open and are not any longer requiring masks, the question came to me about, you know, what do we do when the visitors come to our state, or excuse me, our city, uh, from areas where the rules are very different. And somebody had suggested to me, you know, do we need to be requiring testing for people who are coming from the states that have chosen to uh, fully open and relax all restrictions? So I'm not suggesting that we discuss or make a decision or consider that today. I just wanted to share that with you because you, if I've heard it, you're probably going to also hear it. Um, and, you know, it's something that as we've talked about before, the city council can only make things more restrictive, not less. So that could be something that would be within our purview, should we choose to um, consider it. I think uh, I think before we would do anything like that, we'd want to hear from 
public health on that, obviously, from Dr. Harrington and, and the other people at, at, the, at the county who run public health. And then um, we would obviously have to look at, you know, who's going to pay for that and how, how would that look? So, and do we have capacity? So I think before we would make any step like that, we would probably need some, some kind of direction from public health that that would be an appropriate step. And I've, I've tuned into some of the Board of Health meetings, uh, not all of them, but I, and I don't know that, I don't recall them talking about that recently, but maybe, maybe they have. And Jason, no, Jason, I, like I haven't either, but um, I just wanted to pass it on because I told um, the constituents who brought this to me that I would and that we have this time for those types of suggestions. And I'd like to check with uh, Pitkin County who did have a, a testing requirement uh, that was implemented. And uh, not too long after that, they became the most infected county in the state. So they are in the process of revising their testing procedures. So it'd be interesting to just hear from them and see what their experience is and, and check on their revisions and find out how they might be able to make it more effective if we go that direction. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, into the discussion a little bit. I'm really impressed with um, Governor Polis and how we've done this. I mean, along the way, a lot of constituents are asking and, and wanting, there's a big faction of our community that just wants to open up and um, when we see things that happen with the dial 2.0, um, I, I got to tell you, I was in California during blues break and it was definitely a lot more uh, restrictive than Steamboat has ever been. And um, it's it, it made me appreciate Governor Polis and our public health, our county commissioners and how we're they're, they're just responsive you know we can only do so much as city council but then when we start to get our murmuring around and we need to you know either write a letter or try to encourage the county commissioners public health from a city standpoint of what people are saying that they're kind of already on it and you know polis kind of pulled this 2.0 thing and then you got to realize there's a there's a habit of, of uh, character when it comes to this COVID response to shutdowns and restrictions. And we saw it when they came up with the Orange Plus, right? Uh, we wanted to open up our restaurants for the winter season and they came up with Orange Plus. They came up with the purple. So there's a lot of um, moving uh, to this. And I appreciate that because as we're getting more data with COVID, we should be able to look back and say, hey, here's where you know, we don't need to do that because the data now says we can do this, right? And I really appreciate that about our our state because I think some other states are still stuck in last March and some of the restrictions are based upon last March and that's not accurate. We need to kind of be up to date with where the current statistics are with testing, uh, hospitalizations and deaths, right? That's why we closed it down. And I'm really just, I got to tell you that if there's anything that comes up from a city standpoint that we can do, uh, I was just impressed that the, the county and the state were almost lockstep already and we didn't really have to do a whole lot uh, because we're already opening things up. And so I'm just encouraged to get the community to continue doing that. Um, don't know much about the mass thing of doing testing. I don't necessarily trust that PCR test 100% because it has its false positives and false negatives. I had an experience with that right before we went to California. We had three tests. One was uh, two or PCR tests. One was positive, one was negative. Uh, one was at Walgreens, one was at the emergency care. Uh, they were within three hours apart. So there's a lot of data that's still out there that we have to worry about. So I'm not a proponent for, as we have increase in positivity based upon these PCR tests that we don't shut things down. We need to keep it concerned about our hospitalizations and some other things. And I gotta tell you, I think the governor and the county commissioners right now are doing a fine job. All right. Any other action items for discussion on the COVID-19 issue? Anything else, Council? All right. Thank you very much. And that brings us to item five. This is our Route County Noxious Weed Advisory Board interview. And we have one applicant, and she, I believe she's here tonight, Karen Vale. Hi, Karen. Karen, I think you're on mute. There we there go. go. How's that? That's great. Karen, we really appreciate you uh, applying and it's an important job and, and really always appreciate when anybody's willing to step up and volunteer. So just wanted to take a couple minutes if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and why you would like to serve on the board. 
Sure. Uh, so I, I mean, my background is as a botanist. Uh, I have been in the Valley my whole life. Firmly, firmly believe that we need to take care of our land, do the right thing for our land. And uh, the mission of the weed board, uh, I definitely support. Uh, and I definitely have the background. I think I could add a lot to some of the projects they're doing and um, some of the, the newer I ideas are kind of passing around. So I'm really excited about, about the possibilities. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council, did anybody have any questions for Karen? All right. No well, questions, Karen, but just a comment. Having yeah. known Karen for a decade plus, and she's very humble about her uh, skills and expertise. She's an author of a number of books about the flora of the Yampa Valley, and we would truly be honored to have her on that board because she probably is the leading expert in the Yampa Valley. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. She's a great weed warrior. I think I got my, <laughs> my weed warrior pin the same time you did, Karen. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I echo those comments. And Karen, really appreciate you stepping up. And we have you on the agenda later tonight and on the consent calendar to approve adding you to the board. Uh, so we really I have very good faith that we will approve that. And uh, we really appreciate you and your expertise and being willing to serve. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. That's probably the easiest interview I've ever done. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Karen. We appreciate thank you guys. it. guys. Have a good night. You too. All right. Okay. So that brings us to item six. This is our fire department 2021 staffing update. And we have Fire Chief Chuck Sarasoli to give us this presentation. Take it away, Chuck. Thanks, Jason. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, Chuck Sarasoli, Fire Chief. Um, I am aware of your busy um, schedule tonight, so I'll try to make this update uh, brief and quick and then uh, answer some questions at the end. Can everyone see the screen okay? Um, so uh, real quick, what, I, what I'm, I'll be looking for tonight is some direction on um, uh, kind of following up on a presentation we had uh, last October um, regarding our 2021 staffing and the SAFER grant. And so I'll just do a quick review of where we're headed and then talk about a couple of um, discussion items and, and be asking for some direction from council. And so right now I need to see, there we go. Okay, so um, the two main items, and I'll, I'll actually have a, a third to this um, that w is in the presentation, but the main thing is um, staff um, wanted to take a look at the SAFER grant um, posting for 20, fiscal year 2020, so if coming into 2021, um, and just uh, kind of give some recommendation on what, our, what we feel the best strategy um, for success on this grant would be. Um, and so a couple things, a few things have changed since fall to now. And so as you'll see through this presentation, um, what we're going to be talking about is either coming in and requesting to hire, uh, to apply for the grant to hire four firefighter EMTs, um, or uh, if council feels more comfortable, uh, the hiring of two firefighter EMTs. And you can obviously see the staff recommendation there, um, which I'll try to give you some background on. Um, real quick, just a reminder of where the fire department's strategic plan is headed and what our goal is um, here with the next five years. Um, really where we want to end up is having 12 firefighters on each shift and the ability to staff um, two, our two population districts with a fire engine and an ambulance. Um, we currently have eight firefighters on each staff, so this would require um, hiring of about 18 firefighters four additional firefighters on each shift and four floaters, um, which we have um, currently two vacant positions. The idea is to try to stagger this implementation so that it doesn't come in one big hit and one big um, budget um, impact. Um, and in the meantime, we work to improve that daily, uh, that daily staffing as we build that to that goal. Real quick on the SAFER grant. Um, the SAFER grant is basically a, a FEMA grant um, and its main goal is to try to increase the number of firefighters in communities to help them meet industry standards. 
Um, they do this by hire by hiring uh, typically additional firefighters. However, in tw- in this year, they're also looking at rehiring laid off firefighters or to retain firefighters facing layoff. Um, so right now, also in this year, they're paying 100% of personnel costs for three years um, with no further commitment from the municipality. Um, the main things to keep in mind are it does not cover any additional operating costs associated with bringing those firefighters on. Um, it does not cover additional overtime expenses. Um, it, it covers scheduled overtime that's built into their, their um, normal schedule, but not additional overtime. Um, and so what council would be looking at is um, a future commitment to keep those firefighters estimated at about $100,000 per firefighter um, starting in year four. That um, is an estimate taking into consideration that they will be moving through a pay plan the three years that they're being covered by um, the SAFER grant. And so they, 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 the initial impact that the SAFER grant would cover starts at about 86000 um, the the, fi- the safer grant is fairly limited in and narrow in its scope and what it's looking for uh, as far as w- how it'll fund. Um, it really wants to see that the increased staffing will improve the local fire department's ability to comply with staffing response and standards that enhance community and firefighter safety. The largest percentage increase in that compliance um, with the relevant section receives the higher score. So the better you can you can do with that those additional firefighters, the better you'll score. It's a really a narrow focus on how well a fire department can respond to a residential structure fire and try to get 16 firefighters with the initial first alarm. Um, we we don't get 16 firefighters on an initial first alarm to a residential structure fire. So obviously we, we have the need. Um, and so what we wanna try to do is show how adding firefighters will work us towards that goal. Um, that we don't necessarily have to meet that goal, but we wanna try to get there. So they wanna know how we're doing now and how this grant will help. So real quick, the case um, for two firefighters for us will be two firefighters that act in that floater position, which I talked about in the fall. So really our case in this case would be the addition of those firefighters will help us um, hopefully reduce having to go to a seven person minimum staffing level. Right now we provide eight persons um, 24-7, 365, and we backfill everybody um, that takes needs take off PTO or sick leave or is injured. Um, but we have a very, um, we have a, a defined overtime budget. And if we hit that, we have to think about um, reducing our minimum staffing levels. So this will help us um, hopefully not hit that overtime standard by having these floaters or that overtime budget. It'll also add two floaters to our overtime number or two firefighters to our overall staffing numbers to help respond um, in callback situations. It doesn't provide a great step towards meeting that NFPA standard, um, but it is a step and we can make that argument. This one will come with an operational cost uh, implication of about $100,000 in year one. Um, I did provide some information on how we came up with that number. Um, The first year is a big hit because we have to put on an academy um, to train um, and get these folks dialed in and ready to respond and be capable of providing backup. In subsequent years, um, we're estimating about $15,000 a year per firefighter. And, and again, I have those those numbers of how we came up with that. Um, so in this case, two firefighters would be $30,000 additional operational costs starting in year two and moving forward. Um, we have a much better uh, kind of case to build for the safer grant if we ask for more firefighters. Obviously we can have a better case that we're, we're closer to meeting the standard. In this case, what we would do is we would increase our daily response capability by adding a firefighter to each shift. So we would put not one firefighter on each shift and then the fourth firefighter would be a floater that would help us keep those overtime costs in check. Um, In this case, we are adding nine to shift. What we wouldn't do is increase our daily minimum staffing levels. So we would still have a minimum staffing level of eight. Um, So if we had two or more firefighters that needed to take a day off on any given shift or were sick or injured, um, we would backfill to eight and not nine. Um, This would help us also, this would, would actually help us even more to not drop below that minimum staffing level of eight. 
Um, that additional person will have four additional firefighters available for callback response. Um, this is a greater step towards that NFPA standard. The big thing on this one is operational costs will go up um, a little bit. Now, uh, we do have some efficiency in numbers in this case. In, uh, we have to put an academy on either way if we have two or four. So um, four people is kind of that magic number where we don't really have to increase um, the instructors in the academy or their time. We can still do a good academy with four people. So that reduces the training hit. So we're, um, we're estimating $136,000 for year one to bring on those four firefighters. Um, but then the subsequent uh, annual costs would go up um, using that $15,000 a year per firefighter number um, to 60 a year at, uh, starting in year two. So some other things that we want to just think about when we are applying for the, safe, the SAFER grant is that the grant uh, application closes on the 12th, um, but they will not start awarding um, the grants until May, and then they basically dole it out as they review applications and, and um, award grants. This goes on all through summer um, and as st is stated in the grant can go through the end of September. So it is possible that we won't know whether we were awarded the grant um, all the way up through September. So this could have um, a pretty big impact on when we can get these personnel up and running and trained. We're estimating that from the day we can bring them on, we can get them trained and ready for backfill within four to six months. Obviously, if we if we don't know until um, we got the grant until September, then uh, we're pushing into 2022 until they're really up and running. Um, and then, of course, uh, part of my concern that I mentioned in October is we're tr right now we're working on a, a shoestring budget, right? We cut everything in 2021, um, training, everything um, operational equipment and everything. And so we will be looking to normalize that budget in future years, 2022. I think the outlook looks better than it did in the fall. Um, but when you add people, it's harder to normalize that budget. Obviously, we I'm estimating a $60,000 increase um, annually just to have those four, those four people on. So um, obviously, there'll be additional operational budgets as uh, implications as we try to normalize our budget again. And when we try to get the personal, the personnel pay plan and step plan um, back to back on track and, and stabilized. Um, and then I guess the other thing that I'm looking for from council tonight is a little bit of direction on what if we don't get the grant? Um, the ideal situation would be, I have a really good idea of what council would want to do so that if we get as soon as we're denied, I can move forward in whatever direction um, council would be looking to do. And the options I have here are, well, we still want you to hire the four people. We'd like you to go back to just hiring the two floaters, or um, we don't want you to hire anyone in 2021. We'll wait and apply for the grant again, or we'll look at uh, our personnel budget um, during budget, normal budget cycles in 20, for 2022. So that wraps up that uh, uh, presentation and really brings back to um, the, dis the main discussion items of applying for the grant. So I'll open it up to council and any questions you may have. Right. Thank you, Chuck. I'll go around and see if we have questions. Um, Sonia, any questions from you? No questions? Okay. Kathy, questions? Yeah. Um, Chuck, where do we have the space to add one per per shift. I mean, literally, um, if they're on, we've got three shifts, do we have the room for them to even sleep? We do. We have, um, right now we have extra room at the mountain fire station. So our, our plan would be to bring them out here um, and have them stay out here. And then as during one of my presentations, I really went over that flexible staffing model that we utilize. And so depending on the call that comes in, we're going to pivot them to the best response we, we have. But we do have room in the mountain station right now. And then do we, did I understand you to say we currently have two floaters vacant? Um, you know, I did, I, I think I did say that we, we have, we have one floater right now. So that, that's not vacant. Um, and we're hoping to um, create the, so no, we don't have two floaters vac vacant. I misspoke on that one, Kathy. We have one floater. We're hoping to hire one this year. 
Um, and we'd need a total of four floaters uh, to get to that 18 firefighter number in the future. So I'm, I, I, I may have had a typo on the presentation, but we only have one fighter, fire, firefighter floater right now. And we actually took out all of our floater positions um, for 2021. Is there any reason why we can't hire that floater position or would that complicate the grant? Well, I do have, uh, so I have one of those positions is a floater position. So, and I, th I think that's what I was trying to allude to in, in the, the, um, the presentation is that if we got these four positions, three of them would go on shift, one would be a floater, and then we would have two floaters at that point. So we'd got have it. nine per shift with two floaters. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? None at this time. Thank you. Okay, Robin, any questions? Yeah, just to parlay on what um, Kathy was asking, the one floater that's open right now, is that in the budget anyway, or do we pull that out for this year? We pulled out, we pulled that out for this year. Okay, so if the grant, if we, if the direction we give you is to go for the four, and the grant came back for two, would you then continue, you come back to us to say, hey, we will still wanna hire the other two or how, how would that work if you, if you put the grant, if we try to get the grant for four and we maybe get two or three of them and not all four? Yeah, and so, you know, the complicating thing about this is uh, there's so many different ways to approach how we bring these people on. And, um, you know, we will make work whatever we can get. So um, if we apply for four and we get two, then certainly um, I would look for, and maybe we can have a little bit of discussion tonight on what council's leaning towards. Um, and so we would have a good idea of whether, well, did, you know, did council, did it feel like council would like us to come back and ask for two more, or would they just be happy with the two? If we got two, we would put them in the floater positions, um, which is, uh, which is great. It would help us a lot. It would add to our staffing level and, and be a good step forward. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would we be eligible in 22 for safer grant money again? Yes, we can continue to apply for it. And, um, you know, in talking with Winnie, um, we don't think getting or denied, be either getting awarded or being denied is gonna change our chances in, as we continue to move forward. Thank you. Michael, any questions? No questions at this time, thank you. Liesl, questions? Um, just one question. Chuck, I would imagine we'll see with this, um, if we get all four uh, savings then in overtime, do you have any idea what that could look like and if that would kind of balance out the additional operation, operation costs we have? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, Liesl, because. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I have a concern with our overtime budget right now. What we have, um, we try to estimate and, and anticipate potential injury or illness, um, but also we, we have to try to estimate PTO usage. Mm -hmm. Nobody used PTO last year. And so we have a lot of people that are, are at the top of their PTO allowance and will need to use PTO this year. So my concern actually is, we, if things start loosening up and travel starts opening it up, um, we will see a heavy PTO usage and potentially um, really gobble up our overtime budget. Um, so maybe we'll see some savings and that would be very helpful, um, but I, I, I just don't know at this point. If we have two firefighters injured, that eats up our PTO budget, or I mean our overtime budget pretty quickly. So. There's just a lot of variables in trying to estimate that overtime budget when you don't have any um, any wiggle room on your your minimum staffing levels. Was well, I to understand that, Chuck? If we do get the four, if you have nine people on a shift, one gets injured or one's out on PTO, you are not going to fill that. You're just going to essentially do with eight. So for that reason, we probably should have lower, at least somewhat lower costs. Yep. Right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think maybe a better way for me to answer that, Liesl, is I would be hesitant to to um, give that up until we were more uh, through the year before I was, you know, saying, oh, we're we came in way under budget on overtime. 
So I've got a question. What's the estimated timeline of when we would find out if we get this Safer Grant award? So, like I said, anytime between May and September, <laughs> I think if we have a poor, if we have a, if, if most, and, and I don't, it's hard to know who, what other departments will apply for the grant. Um, but if we have a bad argument, we might, or a bad case, and it really gets dismissed pretty quickly, um, which I hope we don't, I think we have a pretty good, pretty good case. Um, we would know earlier, right? And we, we could know as early as May or June. Okay. Winnie, did you have any feedback on that? I saw you pop up there. I just wanted to note that the fact that this is this, they changed the grant to not require matching funds is huge in future budget years because this is a three year grant. And normally it has matching funds that escalate in years two and three. And so the fact that there is no matching funds for the period, the three year period of the grant is actually a pretty substantial savings in years two and three, if we anticipate that we would bring people on in years two and three. Because the, the lack of matching funds is really only due to the pandemic. And the last time we were in a major recession, they did the same thing and then it went back to matching funds. So it is timely to do this this year as opposed to next year because of that lack of the match requirement. Thanks, Wendy. Okay. Thank you. Council, any other questions for Chuck or, or Winnie? No? Okay. Um, is there any public comment on the fire department 2021 staffing update? Anybody here to comment on the fire department item? Nobody here for that? Okay. So I'll close public comment. Council, um, Chuck's obviously looking for some direction on where we go from here and comfortable, first of all, make sure we're comfortable applying for the safer grant. And then secondly, if we don't get it, either we don't get it entirely or we uh, don't get it at all, what kind of direction would we have as far as looking at adding additional staff members on the fire department from that point? So who would like to kick off discussion on that? I will. Go ahead, Kathy, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think we should put our best case forward. And that would be the three uh, uh, three firefighters and one floater. Um, and um, I just think that it, it makes a more compelling commitment on our part. Um, and hopefully the whoever, is this a federal grant or a state grant? I didn't, Chuck. It's a federal grant, FEMA. Okay. okay, it's a FEMA grant. Um, I think we should put our best foot forward. And um, as far as what we do in the future, I, I think this should really come back to council at that time. And I'm leaning towards three, adding one per shift if we don't get the safer grant. Um, and the reason is that will improve our um, manpower on three shifts. And if, uh, again, I, I really think Chuck, if, if we won't know till May or September, we may be in a much stronger position financially to do even more. So, um, I, I would say let's go with four right now. Yeah. I'd like to jump in. I agree with Kathy 100%. And I think Winnie made an excellent point that um, it's kind of a no brainer to go for this safer grant while the match is not on the table. And I would just also like to remind us that we have talked about this before. And we had some pretty heated discussion, as Heather will remember, um, in the context of the 2021 budget about whether or not we needed to add these uh, positions immediately through the general fund or if it was more strategic to wait until the safer grant came forward and you know we, we had all kind of landed on it being more strategic to wait for the safer grant. So I kind of feel like it's a decision that we had some to some degree already made through the budget cycle. So I'm in support of the four and um, <clears throat> giving it our all and I have full confidence in Winnie that she can uh, write a grant like nobody's business and she's very successful with this kind of stuff. So working with Chuck, I have a feeling we'll have some good, good outcomes. And if we don't, I think we revisit uh, basically looking at our budget and looking at other opportunities. Council, um, other feedback? 
Go ahead, Thanks Liesl. for your memory retaining, Sonia. <laughs> so I'm in support of four. And uh, everything that Sonia said is exactly what I reiterated at budget time. So let's do it. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I agree as well. I think the only thing I want to add is I'm not comfortable saying that what we're going to do if we don't get this grant, because I'd like to make that call once we get that decision. So yeah. um, I, I think we definitely will have that conversation if we don't, but I trust Winnie's grant writing skills as well. So let's just hope for getting those four. Yeah, I don't see any reason not to go forward with the, the grant with the full four. And yeah, I think we'll obviously need to look at things again if, if we don't get our full request. Um, but hopefully if, if things are looking good, if, if we don't get our request, then it's probably time for us to think about adding some of those positions. So it sounds like council's all leaning in that direction, at least. Of course, it's all dependent on budget scenarios as they you know, change in the future, but hopefully we'll get the grant. Oh, okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Sounds like we're going to go for four. And uh, if we are not successful, I'll schedule a time to come back and present some options to you at that point. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Okay, so that concludes item six. And that brings us to item seven. This is our multi day events discussion that. Gary Suter, our city manager, is going to bring to us. And Gary, I think you brought this to us per council request. So I'll turn it over to you for presentation. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your support. We've had a lot of internal conversations on uh, fire department staffing and uh, a lot of iterations. So I think we're on the right track here. And you're spot on. That lack of matching funds is uh, huge. So uh, thank you for your support on that. Yes, Jason, this was uh, a city council request to bring back additional information you kind of get the broad view of special events. And Jason, you've said this before as well. This is really about the bigger question of how does the community feel about tourism and about special events? And, uh, you know, we've been getting quite a bit of uh, pushback on that topic. Um, so just I want to provide some background. I'm going to share my screen here in a little bit uh, as well. But as background, the special activity permit process, when I, when I got here five years ago, uh, I was pretty disappointed with our uh, uh, special event permitting process. It was pretty fast and loose. It wasn't, it was highly decentralized. Uh, there weren't a lot of uh, regulations or guidance from city council. So we spent two years uh, along with city council uh, developing our special activity permit process. It took two year period. Uh, we involved all the stakeholders, all the owners and, and producers of, of, of the uh, major events uh, in Steamboat Springs and uh, it culminated in policies that council set. Uh, I included those as uh, attachment one in, in this uh, packet item. Um, these policies, basically the goals in there, they talk about minimizing community impacts. They talk about ensuring public safety, always a top priority. Uh, and they talk about supporting event planning, which has definitely improved in the last couple of years and a fun event experience for uh, both locals and, and visitors. Um, in May of 2019, Council adopted policies. You defined event categories, you classified the venues, uh, you defined the capacity of a venue, uh, you defined the capacity of services that the city could provide, the number of events that can take place uh, in a specific area, uh, you addressed reasons for denying a permit, and you also defined the city manager's role. About a year later, in April of 2020, City Council, uh, we still had issues with too many events going on in too many close, uh, in close proximity and too many locations that were too close to each other. So in April 2020, City Council adopted an additional venue policy regarding relation, the relationships of those venues. And you also determined some automatic blackout dates. We added some additional requirements such as emergency response plans. So we've really professionalized our uh, event uh, review and uh, planning process. Uh, those, as I said, those were attached in the packet so that we could, uh, you could refresh your memory as to what those rules and regulations were. Then the pandemic hit. Due to COVID-19, uh, last year we really, almost all of the major events were canceled and uh, staff has not had the opportunity to really implement those policies that council adopted um, in April of last year. And as I said, 
most of that focused on Howlson Hill because there's so many venues over there in Howlson Park and they start to pile up and impact one another and, and uh, it would degrade the quality of the event for, for everyone involved. Uh, I included other attachments uh, which provided details on, uh, on the events that we have and attachment three that Rachel put together shows the flow chart for our event process. The, uh, the staff has not recommended any action on this. We're, we're just bringing this to council for your information, any discussion, any additional direction that you'd like to give us. There's also a, uh, a tidbit in there on the fiscal impact. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. Hopefully this works. It says screen two, so let's try that. And are you seeing the list of events? Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm just not going to read these, but these, this is a list of the uh, events. Most of them are summer, except the last two at the bottom, Winter Carnival, Winter Wondergrass, obviously winter events. Uh, but there's a lot going on here in the summer. And, uh, and you can see they're separated out by sporting events and non-sporting events. And uh, some are beloved and some are not so beloved. And this is really typical with uh, my experience in all the resort communities, really depending on the events. And, and uh, uh, some are really supported by the community and, and some not so much. So you can take a look at those. And I wanted to scroll to, this is just additional information, about page 74. So pardon my scrolling here. So these are more details on those events. Just to give you an idea, I asked Rachel to put this together, give me an idea of the approximate number of participants, the venues that they use, the number of days uh, that they're here. So this is just some more detail on those uh, sporting events that were listed previously. And you can see some are fairly big and get into uh, four figures, uh, multiple days. Um, so, you know, some run the whole summer, uh, some are just a couple of days or a weekend. Those are the sporting events. And again, all of this is in the packet. This is page uh, 7.19 in the packet. These are the non-sporting events, uh, the multi-day non-sporting events. And you can see uh, most of these are, uh, are events that uh, are mostly geared uh, toward locals, the con uh, summer concert series, of course, Art in the Park, both local locals and the visitors love that. Uh, same thing with Pro Rodeo, one of my favorite things to take our guests to. Uh, hot air balloon rodeo, food and wine, river festival, farmer's market, which goes uh, all summer, and, uh, and so on. The other thing that I wanted to share, which uh, is, is really interesting, we got, and I'm not sure if council's seen this, but we got the draft results of the community survey. This is going to be coming out on uh, Thursday with the city council packet, um, and we'll, we'll include all the attachments uh, in that. Uh, along with a report from Whitty, and we'll be talking about it a week from now. And uh, here's a page from that that just talks about the bigger question. It addresses the question, we wanted to hear residents' opinions on the role of tourism in Steamboat Springs. And overall, it was about eight in 10 residents that believe tourism has a net positive impact on the, on the community. So it's a very broad question is, is uh, Tourism positive or a negative? And it was basically 80-20. I'm gonna to go to the next page. This is a little more interesting, gets a little more detail. How much do you agree or disagree with each of the following statements? Tourism is an important part of the identity of Steamboat Springs. And you'll see about 90% uh, are saying, yes, tourism is an important part of, of uh, our identity. Uh, same thing, tourism has a positive impact on our community because of the tax dollars and jobs it generates and the boost local businesses, about 90% say they strongly agree or somewhat agree. To be fair, at the bottom of that uh, chart, tourism has a negative impact on our community because it takes, uh, it makes it much less affordable to live here. And you'll note in the, uh, the narrative above, uh, there were a lot of the 18 to the 34 year olds that weighed in on that. And that was about um, about 80% that said, yes, it makes it less affordable to live here. Pretty common with all resort communities. And then also tourism has a negative impact on our community because of the crowding. And again, it's a little bit less, about 75% that said they strongly agree or somewhat agree. 
And then uh, finally, about uh, two thirds, one third, uh, residents said, if you had to choose, this is really important as we go into our tax discussions uh, next week and the week following, which of the following would you prefer? Keep the status quo, tourism with lower property taxes, about two thirds, or reduced tourism with higher property taxes and fees. You know, that's probably about what I run into on the street. And uh, just, just this week, I had someone uh, telling me, some longtime local residents saying, hey, you know, um, yeah, it's getting too busy. Give us, lay a property tax on us. We're, we'd be right at the front of the charge for that. I'm going, okay, but I think you're in the minority. And yes, that, that's what it appears. So those are just a, a few things that I wanted to show you with the uh, community survey. Again, that's a teaser. And the uh, final will come out on that uh, Thursday evening with, with the packet. The last point is the uh, overall feedback on our process and council's work and the process uh, has been positive. So it's really helped professionalize the process and we've had uh, good feedback from event producers, owners, uh, participants, and uh, wanted to relay that to you as well. So uh, that's pretty much the report I have here on kind of the bigger picture of all of our events. And uh, we're not recommending uh, any action by council, basically support the existing policies that you all have adopted. And uh, let's see how they work this summer. And we could meet in fall and review those policies and uh, take a look at how effective they were or, or if they need to be tweaked. So that's the staff recommendation. I'll kick it back to you, Jason. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for that information. Council, did anybody have any questions for Gary on the multi-day events discussion? Anybody with questions? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, Gary, I agree with you that this is a very uh, significant improvement in terms of the process uh, for considering these events. What I'm not clear on and I don't see in this particular packet is the criteria for consideration of events and the relative weighting. And I, I feel as though we had kind of gone through that as we develop these policies, but the only place I'm really seeing anything is kind of that box on your flowchart that says, you know, the, re the departments get together and they kind of hash through the application. So my concrete question is, um, do we have uh, a checklist of criteria that are being considered? And do we have a relative weighting like we do with something like the CIP um, scoring process? I don't believe we have weighting but uh, I will ask uh, Rachel Lundy, who's the special events coordinator and uh, coordinates all of this process, uh, if, uh, if there's a specific list of criteria. I think the criteria we use are the ones that were specified in the uh, regulations that council adopted. And uh, Rachel, I'm not sure if you're on the line or not. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, Rachel Lundy, Special Events Coordinator. Uh, we do have a checklist that all events um, have to utilize and submit uh, specific items for their application. That includes uh, the general application, um, the event safety plan, if applicable. And um, they also have to submit a map of the venue, um, an operational plan. And right now they also have to submit their COVID mitigation plan. Okay, so that's helpful, but I guess, um then I guess we don't have kind of a ranking criteria for each event. For example, I'm thinking about, you know, things like risk management, you know, do if we were to score an event on how well risk would be managed, you know, we did talk about this with Chief Christensen in the context of stacking multiple events at Halston and, you know, what does that look like? But, you know, if I were to say, okay, from a risk management perspective, is the stinger higher than the some other event, we really couldn't objectively answer that, could we? No, right. uh, go ahead, Rachel. Oh, I was just gonna say, we do allow um, existing events to take precedent on new events. So if we were um, working with maybe three existing events trying to coexist on the same day in the same location, we would work with all three to try to accommodate any issues that staff had or possibly relocate um, the event or possibly find a different location. Okay, well, I'm just, I'm a little concerned. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Gary. I was just going to add, uh, we definitely listen to public safety. Safety is a top priority as it is of councils as well. So 
if fire weighs in, if police weighs in, the net Doppler has been an invaluable resource in terms of safety and risk management or coming from bail and, and super mega events over in bail. Uh, so yeah, we weigh all that. And if, if they say it's too risky or cut this out or move that, we listen to them. But no, we have not prioritized or ranked the events in terms of which are the most important or the highest risk or the lowest risk or which ones we like or which ones we don't. I mean, it's, no, we haven't ranked them. We just look okay, well, and pull them up thank against you. the criteria. That's helpful to have. And, you know, I think just as we're thinking through this and, you know, really trying to make sure that we are being objective and applying criteria that are the same to every single event, I think it might be helpful to articulate some of the criteria that we use and weight them. So that's just a, a question uh, and a suggestion. Thank you. Helpful. Council, any other questions or feedback to Gary and staff on the multi-day events discussion? Do we ever give any consideration to local versus um, uh, visitor events and, and who's sponsoring those? I, I know, I mean, kind of similar to the fact of like giving priority points to contractors for bids if they are local versus, um, you know, out of, out of county. Do we do that with special events and would or could we consider that as part of a waiting process? Because I think in all reality, I, I think we heard clearly from prior event sponsors that they would like to be considered since they are local and supporting, you know, local kids and local economy. We do not uh, give preference. We don't, do not have a local preference in the existing policies, Heather. And uh, if council wanted to go that direction, we. I would suggest we schedule a work session and figure out the criteria and or the weighting of uh, any of these criteria. Um, you know, what we have found in the past, when we started to separate these categories out, like nonprofits or for-profit, uh, if we said, oh, here's a discounted fee for nonprofit, basically people just did an end run. If they were out of town, they'd find a local person or a local chapter, and they'd apply through that nonprofit to get the discount. So. That's one of the big reasons why we just created a level playing field and are treating everybody uh, equitably uh, so that we don't get in these criteria and create the gains of people trying to do end runs around the regulations. I understand why we did that, but I, I still think there is a, a recorded measure that can be utilized to how many local people will be actually attending or being or going to this event versus you know, how many non-locals are coming. I think that's an easy measured record. And we would just ask the event producer then to provide us those numbers. I, okay, well, we should talk about that. Okay. You no, know, and yeah, I've seen, I've seen this in other cities where they gave preference to basically community events which you've already done, uh, basically Fourth of July parade and Winter Carnival, those sorts of things. We, you know, we provide all the free support services for those. You've definitely provided a uh, a favorable bias toward those local community events. And uh, I've seen communities that have said this is this event is for community development. It's for locals. Uh, free beer and free music for everybody. Yeah, going to be a happy time. Uh, if somebody's coming in from out of town and uh, charging money and they have a, a, a for-profit organization that's from Denver or another another city, I've seen them uh, place them lower on the category. The only ranking we have now is existing events, like Rachel said, versus new events. So we give priority to existing events. Well, and, and with that, with the existing events, I mean, if you look at the, the, the little chart that you gave us, I would say darn near close over 50% of those are you know, probably the majority locals that are, are part of it. So that's why I see that as being another categorical, you know, delineator as to what we can do to ensure that our locals are actually being part of the community and the events that we are offering. As, as I said before, you know, when I've been at CAST meetings and other meetings, there there's this incredible wave to hold events for locals and make sure that locals aren't being pushed out of their own community on every summer week or weekend 
and making sure that there's an inclusivity to the people that live within those communities. And so that's why I'm asking if there was any, you know, palette for, you know, giving some priority to, you know, local, local users. And that would be so, a council policy discussion. And, and I uh, guess to that point, Gary yeah. and, and Rachel too, uh, do we have, do we, do we even know if this is a problem? Have we had local groups apply for any permits or activities that we've denied because of venues already being too full or do we have a, a long history of or issues with that being an actual problem right now? Um, not in the past two years that I've been overseeing the process. Didn't we have to deny, and maybe Winnie can weigh in, didn't we have to deny a uh, summer concert because there were, uh, I can't remember, just too many overlapping things at Howelson. Might have been a couple of years ago. Um, this is too much Rachel can on. speak to this, but yes, part of the issue with our blackout weekends of the July 4th, the weekend after July, the, and the first two weekends in July, is that we had too many things going on. And so we did move the summer concert series to a Wednesday, right? We moved them ahead of the 4th of July because of the concern about police capacity and the fact that we did not want to push a traditional 4th of July event out. Um, and so we made, because the summer concerts are not necessary, they're, they're a great traditional event, but they're not a traditional 4th of July event. So we made them move out of that 4th of July weekend. Yeah, that's great. But, but what I'm hearing is we don't necessarily have a problem of locals applying like too late or something like that and being therefore being denied because other groups have already received approval. That was why we allowed existing groups to have a two year window of reservation and a new event is a one year reservation. Um, and I shouldn't note that Triple Crown is a new special event because before they were here under a contract basis. Okay. All right. So I'm not and sure that answered your question, Jason, but yeah, there's been some movement around and a lot of these policies were devised because of conflicts and council's goal of trying to uh, mitigate the impacts and uh, uh, make it a little easier on the community. Okay. Council, what other questions or feedback do you have for Gary and staff on the multi-day events discussion? Well, I'd like, I would, I'd like to know if anybody has any type of a palette to have the discussion of you know, local community um, priority versus not. Well, and Heather, what I was going to say was, you know, because we we haven't really had this in effect, it's there, but we haven't been able to use it because last summer basically everything was gone. So why don't we give it the summer and let staff come back to us after the summer's over? And then I think Gary's probably taking notes on all the comments right now and. Um, that would be one of them and let's get through the summer and see how it goes and then we can have the conversation after we have some experience with it as opposed to before it i guess my argument but back to that would be then we would have events that would then be ones that have been occurring already and those people then would be prioritized because they've already had an event in town so I just want to make sure that we're starting on an even playing field before the playing field occurs this year. Well, and for me, you know, when you've already approved something and if we say that it's for two years or whatever, we'd have to make a decision whether we're going to grandfather those decisions in or not, whether we do it now or do it in September. Let me just talk a little bit about the timeline. Uh, we would have to schedule a work session with City Council to talk about the two, the two uh, points that I have here, evaluating our criteria and weighting those criteria. And then also uh, one of those criteria would be local, local uh, owners, sponsors versus outside sponsors. And we need some strict criteria for that because we might have somebody from Denver that says, oh, I got a PO box, I'm a local now and I get my mail there. I mean, there will be people that are gonna do end runs around that. So we need to make sure if we go that direction, we have strict criteria. I wasn't oh, saying sponsor though. I was saying actual people that go to the event. Okay. Um, 
so uh, local versus outside attendees, right? Okay. How would we judge that on a, an event that had never been taken, taken place? I guess I have a proposal that um, might be sort of a hybrid of what Robin and Heather are proposing. Um, Heather, I understand your point about, you know, events that have would be new in 2021 are now established if we look at it after the fact. But one way to deal with that would be to um, to run this program in 2021, and it's a, it's a pilot, it's a pilot operation. And so, you know, things like established events, events that started in 2021 wouldn't wouldn't fit that because they're in the pilot phase, not in the actual rollout. That would kind of give it a fresh um, opportunity to do the weighting and the ranking and the criteria and the analysis of it without, you know creating um, basically picking winners and losers, I think is the problem that you're coming up with. So, I mean, if we could do that, then we could look at the way, I think I, I really wanna see the weighting and the ranking and the criteria, because I think it keeps us safe to be able to be objective and to document that we have been, just as we do with our community support processes and other types of things. But I do think if we run this as a pilot and we agree that afterwards we work out the kinks, one of those kinks being that we add the weighting and the ranking, um, I think we can kind of get at both of what you guys are trying to accomplish. I I like your guys' sentiment. I'm just trying to figure out how realistically or logistically this is going to work. I mean, in what Rachel kind of just said, it's not like people are all sending in their applications at the same time and she's trying to weight it against each other to pick who gets to go forward. They're coming over a rolling period of a year to two years and kind of first person in gets picked. And so I would love to prioritize locals. I, I just don't see logistically how that's gonna happen. I really don't. And so, you know, to me, this system of what are they or are they not doing is more of a kind of what we're gonna discuss next for Triple Crown of, are they having negative impacts on our community? Is there a safety concern? Are there reasons we should not accept them? Not necessarily a waiting system of who gets in and who doesn't. I'm a little concerned about the time frame too. If we tried to implement new policies for this summer, it's just too late. By the time we would come up with that, evaluate that, introduce it as a resolution or an ordinance, do a reading, uh, summer's going to be here, and it will. Whatever we do, I think we'll have to apply either for winter or or uh, next year. So I'm just concerned about timing to try and change all the rules. The, the applications are coming in now. I think we require a 45 day advance. Uh, notice, and you're right, Lisa, let's first come, first serve, and uh, if we get booked up or the facility's taken or we don't have the capacity to accommodate, then yeah, they get denied or they pick another weekend, and there's been a lot of that going on too, uh, especially pre-COVID. There were a lot of people that were juggling their days and trying to figure that out, so I'm just a little concerned about timing, and uh, the other thing I've heard in other resort communities I've worked, when you have events that are primarily for locals, the locals love it, the businesses not so much because the locals don't spend money <laughs> to go out and and frequent the restaurants restaurants and and bar well if you have free mu if you have free music typically the restaurants and bars do okay the other businesses just shut down because the locals don't go and shop the visitors do come in and shop and they support retail and that's another issue that i have heard uh one of the balancing acts of of uh tourism is uh you know if we do things just for locals they're generally going to cost a little bit more money and uh, and businesses just don't aren't that supportive of that because the locals just tend to not go out into the stores and, and shop. So there's implications with all this and we're kind of getting into the weeds, but uh, I wanted to share that. Is there, is there agreement amongst council though that Heather's point that she brought up, you know, that if we're piloting this as a pilot, can we freeze events in their current status? You mean a moratorium on events? No, 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 <laughs> not okay. at all. No, well, when I decide that I'm going to pop up my, you know, uh, um, my uh, horse show for the first time ever in 2021, and I'm going through this pilot process, now I'm an established event as of 2022, right? Because I've already been an event. And I kind of feel like what Heather was saying, you know, is that this kind of jumps people ahead with a process that we're not 100% tweaked on. So, I mean, I would kind of say that since we're going through this pilot phase, any events that come through, 
If they're existing as of now, they continue to be existing. If they're new as of now, they continue to be new on the other side of the summer. That's kind of what I'm suggesting. I see. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to weigh in on that because when we approved this, we did not approve this as a pilot project. So um, unless we go back and backpedal, I think what we talk about in the fall gets created for 2022. And then we say it's a pilot project for a year. I don't think we can go back and backpedal with these folks. You have art in the park that's been here forever. And now you're going to tell them that they might not be able to come back next year because they put 10,000 people a day on our streets. You know, I don't I, think anybody's saying anything like careful. that, Robin. I don't know where you're coming up with that. That is absolutely that's not what she's saying. saying. She's saying that anything that's existing currently to date will stay existing after the summer and we go through the 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 prioritization or whatever we want to say next year and say that all those existing things are still existing it's just any new permits are considered new next year as well it, it's not changing the course of what is going on now uh, and Gary, i just think it's hard often? to call something a pilot after we've approved it and did not use that word. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure what we'd be piloting. Michael, let me hear We're from not. you. Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious on how often this conflict that they're talking about comes up or are we just creating a solution to a problem that we don't have? Is that was my point earlier. I was trying to find out if we had any, like if this has been a problem, have we been denying people because you know, other groups have been already ahead of them, but it doesn't sound like this is even a problem. Am, am I wrong? Feedback on that? Has been positive. The feedback has been, has been positive. Uh, after our uh, summer of uh, H E double L a few years ago, yeah, we we spent the two years developing this process, and and I think it's you know we had one one summer where we could apply it, and we didn't get to apply the new rules uh, in twenty twenty. Um, so yeah, I think overall it's been going uh, fairly smoothly. Uh, I, I, I'm fine if council would like to talk about uh, splitting some of the hairs. And I, and I, I, Sonia, when you raised the question, I'm thinking, yeah, we have a local uh, horse uh, advocate that says, you know, I want to have a, uh, a cutting competition at the rodeo. And you invite people from all over the West. Is that a locals event or is that an outside event? Is it a locals event because we have a local that's organizing it? I just that's where we need to make sure that we have these really specific criteria, and uh, by which to judge these events. So, just try to give examples. There's a, a thousand questions that come up, and I think what we've done is, and what council has done, is created enough rules that we can broadly apply and apply equitably uh, to manage these events more effectively, with the overall goal to uh, minimize community impacts, take care of public safety, and make sure that it's fun for all involved, residents and visitors. Okay, I have a suggestion to kind of kill this. I, You know what, let's do what we've always done this summer. You know, like you said, we haven't seen what it's done, but I would really ask council, because of what we've seen in the metrics from last summer and the sales tax revenue that came in with no events and realizing that almost 100% of the communities that are in resort towns are actually revisiting their special events and their event processes this year. Even though this is our first year, fine, let it happen. Let's get the metrics and let's revisit this in the fall because the reality is we can make changes and that means just open the whole thing up. And if somebody says, I have issue with X, Y, and Z, then you can change the prioritization. You can do whatever you want, but the bottom line is, Let's move on let's realize that we haven't tried it out, but realize that every community in a resort is readjusting and opening up their event processes, knowing that COVID changed everything and sales tax changed everything with zero events in all these communities last year. And that's why everybody is restudying this. Amen. It's an iterative process, not a pilot project. Poor choice of words on my part. I apologize. Yeah, and I think I think we all wanted to see how this would go this summer and then get a debrief in, in the fall. And I think that makes a lot of sense uh, because, you know, we we obviously have a lot of concerns. It sounds like some of the concerns may not be 
materializing in real problems, at least as of yet. But certainly with the new special event uh, or multi-day event policies that we've adopted, we we should take a look at and see how they go after the, how, how they went after this summer and we can make changes. Absolutely. If it, if something isn't working, if it needs to be changed, we can look at it and make changes in the fall. And thank you, Heather, for clarifying that. That was the question I was going to pop Jason was does council want to have a work session on this this spring or do you want to test drive uh, the new rules this summer and then have a work session in fall. So that's kind of, I was going to simplify it. And if I can get direction from council, that'd be great and we can move on. Well, it seems like since we did the work and adopted new policies as of 2019, and we haven't really had the chance to try them out, let's see how they work this year. And then we can adjust from there and change things as we need to. Let's definitely try to get a work session in the fall, even if it is a 15 minute, here's how it went and we don't sure. want changes, but at least have it on, the calendar so we don't lose track of it. We will modify the work session schedule. I think that's great. And I will ask Rachel and uh, everybody that's involved on the review team to uh, make notes this summer of uh, what's working, what can be improved, uh, what's not. So, and then we can report out in the fall. That'd be great. Okay. I'll see, uh, see if we have any public comment. Is anybody here to make some public comment on our multi-day events discussion? If so, please unmute yourself, give us your name and address, and we'll give you three minutes. Anybody here to comment on the multi-day events item seven discussion? Mr. Jamison would like to. Go ahead, Bill. I wanna talk about multi-day events and venues that are applicable. Uh, when you adopted uh, the quote multi-day event in combination with special event policy, no one ever considered Emerald Park uh, fields for anything inconsistent with the established policy of, I think the word is local organizations and individuals. No one else can use it. And until Triple Crown, two years ago, I believe, was allowed by contract to use them, there was a firm policy. Well, I see nothing that should allow a non-local organization to use triple crown, uh, to use uh, the ball fields at Emerald Park. And unless you want to change the policy that's adopted and published that specifically says it's restricted to local organizations and individuals, the city manager or event staff or anybody else on these multi-day activities shouldn't be able to uh, override that established policy. Uh, second, I think that your uh, multi-day policy needs to deal with uh, the same organization uh, putting back to back to back weeks in the community, particularly if they're not a local organization that's just utilizing the uh, infrastructure of the city for a for-profit uh, activity. So those are two areas where I think that the uh, multi-day event and special event policy can be improved and they can be improved now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Anybody else to comment on the multi-day events discussion? I just unmuted myself, Katie Lindquist. Hi, Katie. Hi. I just wanted to speak up a bit about maybe what Heather was talking about and how it might um, be applicable to some events. I put on the tour to Steamboat, Katie Lindquist, director, and uh, we this year are having our event at Olympia Hall, which is really only feasible if there's not three other events going on concurrently, meaning uh, a concert, the rodeo, and Triple Crown. So I guess one thing that you might want to think about when you're looking at um, how many permits are permitted is space and even talking with the last speaker, uh, how many 
how many events permitted in an area. So um, I'll just throw that out there. We're a local event. We bring in far away people, but we raise money for local charities. So then I guess my other point would be, then there's that span that um, you might want to consider. So that's just my 10 cents on that one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Anybody else here to make comments on multi-day events policies? Jason, it's Lisa Popovich. Do you have a minute? Hi, Lisa. Hi, um, Lisa Popovich, Main Street Seamote. Um, I would ask that as you look at this subject, perhaps you also look at um, uh, marketing dollars for special events and how we distribute that and make that policy in line with how you care to go forward. So um, it sounds like as we look at special events, we have things that are, that put heads in beds, things that help to entertain locals, um, and then sing, things that satisfy guests who come here without attaching themselves to an event. Um, and the way um, we move forward with those special event, that special event funding um, may need to change based on the policies that you guys come up with and the decisions that you make. So I just am posing that to you to consider as you move forward. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Anybody else here for comment on the multi-day events discussion? I, my name is Mike McCormick and I wanted to jump in quickly. Um, I own the Breck Epic and we are talking or have been talking with the steamboat chamber for for quite a while about doing something bike centric there we specialize in uh events that are stewardship minded um and also do a good job of of staying out of the way the conversation that you're having about waiting and ranking um i think every mountain town is having right now uh, on par with the same one they're having about reevaluating, as was stated earlier their relationship with events uh trying to achieve balance uh, between uh, an ambient uh, event for locals um, or events that include locals or events that attract uh, guests from out of state or across an international border. Uh, most of the towns that we deal with and we, we produce events all over the country um, are striving for that balance uh, to, to come up with just the right thing. Um, and they're really looking for things that um, get out of the way. Uh, I think mountain residents uh, are a little bit evented out um, that's our observation, at least. We have a, a bit of a war chest of ranking criteria that we'll pass along to the chamber folks that they'll then submit to you uh, for consideration. A lot of the these mountain towns have done the work already, and uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Um, you can figure out what's important to you, how to classify events, whether they're for locals or for out-of-town guests, and every step in between. Uh, and then also, you know, insert your own criteria, uh, whether it's sustainability, um, backcountry minded, front country, you know, uh, uh, an event that closes down Main Street. Um, you can really decide what those are, how to weight them. And there are existing metrics that we'll, we'll pass along. It's a great conversation to have. Um, with that, I'm going to go back on mute. Um, thanks for the time. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Anybody else here to comment on the multi day events discussion? If so, please unmute yourself, give us your name and address. We'll give you three minutes. Anybody else to comment on the multi-day event policies? Okay, hearing none, I'll close public comment on that. Uh, so it sounded like Gary Council's ready to uh, see how things go this summer. We're, we're a little late in the game to make drastic changes now. We would probably need to have several months of public outreach and council meetings and work sessions to get through any changes at this point. And since we so recently adopted these updates, we can see how they go this summer, but definitely get this on the fall for debrief and we can start thinking about how we adjust as may be necessary going forward. That sounds good. And uh, if uh, Kara Stoller's on the line, uh, yeah, if you get that uh, input uh, from Mike with a Breck Epic, uh, yeah, please forward that. That might be, there's no sense, I agree, in reinventing the wheel. That could really help frame the discussion. And uh, I appreciate all the public comments. Good, good ideas. Thank you. Or if yep. Mike could just send it directly to you, that would be great too. Either way. Yep. Yeah. All good. <laughs> all right, Council, any other feedback for Gary or staff on this one? All right.
right. And we'll close up item seven and Gary, we'll keep it with you on agenda item eight. And this is your update on the Triple Crown Sports Special Activity Permit. Right, uh, speaking of special events, it seems like that's a natural uh, segue to Triple Crown and their special activity permit. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, and uh, as, of, uh, as Mike had said, uh, yeah, events are a part of our identity, uh, but there is event fatigue and Heather has experienced that at the cast meetings uh, as well. With events uh, comes controversy and I've experienced this, experienced this my whole career and uh, you know, spent a summer in Telluride and you, you watch the mass evacuation when Telluride bluegrass hits, except for the people that love bluegrass. And, uh, uh, but the rest of the folks just leave town. They, they get event fatigue. And, uh, and I understand the controversy. Um, I, I acknowledge all of the comments. I acknowledge the community sentiment. I appreciate everybody weighing in uh, on this uh, important topic. And uh, we will continue the discussion. It is, it is a balancing act for city council. And I, and I realize that. I did want to apologize for uh, the extra 100 pages in your packet, but anytime there's a controversial issue, I just do not want to uh, cut out information and say, well, I didn't include this or I didn't include that. Uh, maybe we could do hyperlinks, Heather. I think that's a good suggestion. But yeah, I put everything in here on Triple Crown so you can see everything. There's duplication on all the, all the rules and regulations, all five of their permit applications, all the conditions, uh, special requirements, everything's in there. Little bit of background. Um, Triple Crown previously, and most of you know this, most of the public knows this, had a 10 year contract that uh, expired in uh, 2020, in August of 2020. Council appointed a negotiating team to renegotiate the contract, which basically kind of exempts them from the special activity permit process. And it's even spelled out in there. It says if you have a separate contract, you don't have to go by those rules, you go by the contract. So uh, Heather and Robin uh, negotiated after multiple meetings, uh, a proposed contract that included a reduction in the scope of uh, the events, a reduction in the impact of the events, a two-year contract versus a 10-year contract. Uh, the sponsorship funds that we had previously paid to Triple Crown were negated, no longer pay sponsorship funds. Uh, they negotiated an annual capital improvement uh, contribution and there were other limitations and terms and conditions in there. Uh, on that proposed contract. In January, second meeting in January, council voted on that contract and voted it down on a 4-3 vote. I said at the time, well, really, and people said, well, that's it, right? And I said, no, they still have uh, a right, as everybody else does, to apply for the special activity permit. So all the contract did was really guarantee them two years for the use of those city facilities with all the terms and conditions that went along with it. And they certainly had a right to apply for other special activity permits. So I've included those in the packet. All five of those are included as uh, attachment one. Uh, and as I, as we just covered, council has uh, developed over a two year process, uh, policies and, and conditions uh, that were approved by city council. I also uh, included a sample conditions of approval letter, uh, which was provided as attachment three, uh, COVID conditions. I mean, who knows, we hope we're out of COVID by summer, but I have a feeling it's still going to impact events. It's gonna look different. Uh, and additional requirements that are also included as attachments four and five. Um, I am not recommending further action by city council on this. I did not wanna bring this to council for a vote of city council, but you can certainly give me as the city manager further direction. And that's uh, reiterated under the, the legal issues component of the staff report that says the administrative process does not foreclose council input. Uh, staff may seek and the council may provide uh, input and direction regarding special activity permit applications. So the staff recommendation, you know, I took all of this, I weighed all of the information that I got. I considered that I heard the arguments of council. Um, I've uh, read all of the input. A uh, majority of that was uh, opposed to Triple Crown. There were some businesses that supported uh, that. Um, and uh, I do intend to approve the special activity permits for the three June events and uh, those June events only. I basically split the loaf. It's kind of like representing the split vote of council. So they were applying for three June events and two late July events, which is the World Series for Triple Crown. I looked at the existing rules and policies and determined that they complied with all the existing rules and policies. 
Um, I considered impacts to the community and the fact that they would be lessened to the reduced scope of the events, uh, consistent with the policies. And thank you, Heather and, and uh, Robin for, uh, for negotiating that in the contract, because I think you made, you made a lot of headway with Triple Crown in reducing the number of teams and, and the impacts to the community. I believe we're applying appropriate conditions to the permit to ensure uh, that our facilities and the municipal interests are being protected. Uh, I have considered uh, the community impacts and, uh, and the significant negative community sentiment toward Triple Crown. And I understand that and, uh, and consider that as well. And I appreciate uh, all of uh, the, in the input that everybody's provided and uh, consider that as well. I had to weigh that against the economic impact. So I consider the economic impacts. I consider the fact that this is uh, being done in early June where there really isn't a lot of certainty as to what's going to happen. And uh, the businesses, many businesses have been suffering for the past year. Some have closed, some have lost their businesses. Uh, this creates some certainty in the early summer and believe I, it should provide economic benefit to know that there is gonna be a group coming in here uh, with some positive economic impact. I also considered the Chamber's uh, business survey, which uh, I read uh, before it went out and when it came back and over, I don't know, it's like well over 200 businesses. I think it was 250 or 260, something like that. And uh, two thirds of them either supported the event or said it had no impact upon them. So uh, two thirds of the, of, of the businesses surveyed uh, said they either supported or it had no impact. So I had to weigh all those out uh, and uh, make a decision to continue to uh, work with Triple Crown to relocate the World Series uh, in July, and I have, I have uh, concerns about traffic, and I expressed that uh, to Mr. King. Uh, this is going to be a construction summer that's going to impact everybody, and uh, and again, weighing the negative impacts upon the community of that in late July, uh, I've decided to go forward to approve the special activity permits for the three June events, and uh, work with Triple Crown to get them to relocate to alternative locations. The World Series in July. Overall, I believe this is uh, consistent with uh, the community's sentiment about, the, about tourism that I just showed you in the last presentation, uh, about tourism and events as a key part of our economy. And uh, that is my decision. And I, I'll kick it back to you discuss, to dis, for discussion, uh, Jason, uh, with City Council and for any uh, guidance and uh, input that you might want to provide to me. Thank okay, you. thanks, Gary. And before we do that, I just want to make sure, and maybe you and Dan can make sure I'm on the right track here, just so councils and the community understands the, the situation now. So my understanding is Triple Crown is applied now after we rejected the two-year contract. Right. They, they have applied for these special activity permits, and per the municipal code, those are to be reviewed and then granted or denied by by staff and, and you in particular, Gary. Is that is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And then the municipal code also, as I understand it, doesn't give council the ability to override or modify or veto or appeal your decision on these issues, correct? So you could give me direction. Right, but but we can as council if we see there individually, if we see just like in the last session that we talked about multi-day events, if we think there are important factors or considerations that you should think about and weigh, or if we think for some reason there's something you haven't thought of or staff hasn't thought of or you've missed, we can certainly individually give you some our thoughts on that, right? You could do that. And, uh, you know, if council, uh, looks at the information that I provide. Yeah, it's not coming to council as a decision. And uh, if we had an ordinance that said council made the decisions on special activity permits, then it would cer certainly be in your court. Um, if I get direction from city council that's, that says uh, based upon the impacts and community sentiment and whatever other uh, impacts that you determine uh, as a basis for denial and, and uh, provide me that direction, then I will follow that direction. I won't, I won't be insubordinate to city council. Okay. All right, with that, I'll open it up, see if anybody has questions. Um, 
Let's see, Heather, any questions from you? I have only one question and I don't, I think it would probably go to um, Angela. What is the scoop with Emerald Fields? Hi, Counselor Sloop, Angela Cosby, your Parks and Recreation Director. I'm actually gonna ask for Dan Foote's help in answering this as well, as there's some history there um, that was prior to my time. And I haven't seen anything in terms of the prohibition of use of emerald fields in writing. Maybe there's something I missed. There is definitely something that limits use only to youth play and not adult, but I haven't seen anything that precludes from locals versus visitors. But Dan might have more information. Heather, this um, this goes back to the early 90s before Emerald Park was even a park. Um, there was a lot of debate about um, you know, the impact of the neighborhood, uh, particularly as back then the access went through Pamela Lane. Uh, and I, I think, you know, before I tell you what I think, you, you know, there are certainly, um, there's certainly more than one opinion about this. But uh, for a long time, there was an understanding that um, the use of Emerald Park Fields would be limited either to youth uh, or even to local youth events. Um, and that really pretty much came up specifically in the context of Triple Crown because, um, there was always interest on Triple Crown's part in, in using Emerald Park Fields, uh, you know, due to the lack of field space elsewhere in town. Um, you know, my understanding is that we then uh, went ahead and changed or, or dropped that policy to the extent that it, it ever was a formal policy um, when we reconstructed the access to Emerald Park and uh, took the traffic out of Pamela Lane uh, and sent it, you know, directly across the railroad tracks south of the Hampton Inn. So. Historically, yes, I think that it's correct to say that there was some sort of a limitation. Uh, you know, whether or not that was formally adopted or not, I, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, no, that, that is not the case now. Can I ask a question, follow up then? Why did we have such uh, an issue two years ago with allowing a trial period for use by Triple Crown for those fields if this was not such a contentious issue? I can help answer that one. In the 10 year contract that Triple Crown did have with the city, it did not include use of Emerald Fields. So we needed to make an amendment to that contract to allow use of the fields. So to answer uh, or to respond to Mr. Jamison's question of that, uh, the city manager or city staff shouldn't be able to execute those types of things, that was actually executed by the city council. Okay. So it's still, just to reiterate, Dan, it's still vague as to if it's really just youth sports or local youth sports, that's still kind of a up for interpretation by whomever situation. Sure, and, and I, you know, I've, I've heard people from the Pamela Lane neighborhood say that the deal really didn't have anything to do with access, that the city had agreed at one point or another, um, that it would always be restricted to youth sports or local youth sports. So, um, you know, there's there's some disagreement as to what went on historically, and uh, you know, regardless of whether or not it's youth sports or or local youth sports or adult sports, um, you know, I, I think that two years ago we saw that the the neighbors, which is Pamela Lane, and the Botanic Park, um, still think that there are impacts to to uh, to what they do when Triple Crown is um, is using Emerald Park fields. Robin, questions from you? Uh, interesting point, Dan. Um, if we're going from 200 teams to 70, I would think the field usage everywhere would be less. So there'd be less impact down at Howison, there'd be less impact over at Emerald or whether it's at the or middle school or out in Hayden or whatever the contracts end up being. Um, so I'm, I'm having a pro I'm not understanding why there could, until we get, if we are able to get through this summer, number one, due to COVID and number two, due to what we decide tonight to give Gary to go back with, um, going from 200 teams to 70 spread out around the community seems to me to be 
a really positive way to lessen the impact everywhere. So can somebody explain to me why the impact wouldn't be lessened not having as many teams or is the impact going to be the same with 130 less teams, which is 15 per team plus parents. So I'm, I'm not understanding that piece of it. Uh, and Angela, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, obviously, we won't really know what the impacts are uh, until and unless Triple Crown is here this summer. But yeah, it seems pretty obvious that um, if we reduce the number of teams by about a third and we also reduce the number of weekends from seven to five, that, you know, the impacts will also be reduced. Um, and, you know, I think that that was sort of the whole point of, uh, uh, of the city's negotiating position when we were in the contract discussions. Um, but at the same time, I mean, reduced impacts don't necessarily mean no impacts. And, and I, uh, I think that's the concern. Thanks. And just to be clear on that, Dan, you said reduced from seven weeks to five. I think Gary's recommending three weeks, not five to be approved. I, you know, I was talking, uh, in the context of the contract negotiations, um, which, uh, contemplated, uh, there being five events, um, and yes, uh, what what uh, Gary is proposing to do is an even further reduction to three events. Okay. Michael, any questions from you? No, no questions. Okay, Kathy, questions? Questions. Sonia, any questions? No questions. Liesl, any questions? No questions. Okay. I think my questions are answered too. So why don't we see, is there, if there's any public comment first before we seek any final feedback to Gary. So if anybody is here to comment on item eight, which is our Triple Crown Sports Special Activity Permit discussion, please unmute yourself, give us your name and address, and we'll give you three minutes. Mr. Jamison will lead it off. Go ahead, Bill. Well, let's start. I sent the city council all of you should have received a link to the policy of the Parks and Rec Department, specifically regarding Emerald Park Fields. It specifically says it's for youth activities and it's for local organizations and individuals, period. That's a published policy. And city council can change it, but the city manager shouldn't be able to uh, uh, go around that policy. And I suggest you look at what your policies are and look at the link that I provided each uh, council member, a copy of which went to the city attorney as well as the city manager. So you've got the published policy and it's quoted verbatim. It was copied right from the city uh, webpage. So there should be no discussion on Emerald Park. It shouldn't be part of any special event for Triple Crown. Two, the only reason Triple Crown is what was previously stated in this conversation by uh, someone, Triple Crown kept complaining they needed Emerald Park because they had so many teams and there weren't enough fields. Well, that argument's gone. They're not, they don't have so many teams. You've reduced it by a third. So any basis that, uh, by contract, City Council allowed uh, them on Emerald Park is no longer valid. So I would urge you to direct uh, the city manager to follow established policy and deny these applications since they utilize Emerald Park ball fields. Uh, in addition, we've talked for weeks and nobody's uh, addressed the question of why Triple Crown isn't paying a commercial fee, not just Triple Crown, but all commercial organizations. Why aren't they paying a commercial fee for any field use? I've suggested $50. You don't like $50? Make it 45. But the idea that a commercial or for-profit organization is utilizing our infrastructure at a discounted rate, the rate was established so local people could utilize the fields, not 
that a commercial organization didn't build their own or pay a commercial rate. So before any special activity uh, things are approved, the first thing you ought to do is amend your uh, fee schedule and provide a commercial uh, rate for fields. You do, I've given you the information. You do it for all the other uh, facilities that the city has, whether it's uh, Olympian Hall or the, the community center or whatever. So why aren't you directing staff to amend that uh, athletic field schedule? So if you, if you don't wanna just say no to Triple Crown this summer, you need to make some uh, direction that uh, is reasonable. And the idea that uh, Triple Crown is, uh, brings all this tourism as uh, some council members have indicated, Triple Crown didn't come last year and tax revenues didn't suffer like everyone predicted they would. So I urge you to uh, think carefully about uh, the community impact. And uh, I don't wanna see uh, in your face confrontations between Triple Crown uh, participants and residents of the community. It's, it could get ugly oh, and I hope it doesn't. Thank you. Any other public comments on item eight, Triple Crown special activity permit discussion? Hi, can you hear me? I'm Joe Kabuti. Hello, Joe. Could you give us your full name and address? Joseph Kabuti, 351 Third Street. Great. But lived here for 45 years. I've been in retail all the time that Triple Crown has been here. And when they first came, they had men's tournaments and the men's tournaments were pretty rowdy and everything. And the city asked them to change to youth tournaments and they did that. And from that point on, I mean, I had all that jazz and they were in the store a lot. And now I run a t-shirt shop downtown. And when they have been in the store, they've been respectful. They've been nice. They've been good customers. Um, especially in June, we lost the Mustang Roundup. I don't know if we'll have a beer fest. So in particular, the fact that they came in June has really been a boost to the retail economy. And I think that, I mean, I see tourists from all over the world come into these t into the t-shirt shop that I work at. And these people are as nice as anybody that comes in. I mean, are you gonna, are you gonna say that a busload of college kids from Michigan or Iowa can't come in? They're rowdy, they're disrespectful. And some of the people that we're talking about that have uh, big dollars and everything, you know, are affluent customers. Then sometimes they're not, they're not nearly very nice. They think they're, you know, what doesn't anyway. <laughs> I mean, I think that they are not any more respectful than the triple crown teams and they've been coming for a long time. And I know that there's been this, this, um, I don't know what you want to call it, fight between them and the residents. And I think it, it stemmed from the early tournaments and they've never forgotten it. And I think they're good stewards. I think that they come to town and from what I see, and they all come into the store that I work at because I sell Steamboat t-shirts. I think that they're good folks. They're respectful and I think that the number of teams that are coming is not going to have that huge huge impact that everybody talks about so I really think it's important that that we allow them to come I think that they're just as good a tourist as anybody else if not better and for us to well against them because who knows for how long or why I don't think that's I don't think that's right. So, as far as I'm concerned, and most of the retails on my street, um, we'd like to see Triple Crown come. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Anybody else here for public comment? I see Larry Mishaw. Larry, would you like to jump in? Yeah. 
Um, I think it's pretty clear that Triple Crown is a lightning rod for event fatigue, traffic fatigue, tourism in general. And yet they're not solely responsible for this, but they're clearly the, the brunt of it. I think we need to treat Triple Crown fairly as we would any other organization. I think Gary and his team, they have a process you know, for doing that and we need to stay kind of focused on that. Um, while I'm pleased that Gary's you know, f on board with June, I'm really disappointed in the July decisions because from my point of view, those week long events are much harder to replace than weekend events. Those World Series events drive midweek business and butts in beds spend money in beds during middle of the weekdays, which otherwise wouldn't be here. While I understand Gary's concern about traffic, I watch when people check in. There's a lot less cars per bodies in World Series events. It's a family and they tend to pack in big suburbans and they actually have less cars. So uh, while I'm disappointed with that, I'd like to at least focus on Triple Crown, finding that balance that we talked about. And like Joe said, these are families that are coming to Steamboat. And if, if there's any hangover from old softball tournaments, that's so far gone from what they are. Triple Crown's been a really good partner for the 35 years I've been in the lodging business. They reach out to teams and threaten to pull them out of the tournaments if they're not behaving well at our properties. They have that leverage and they, and they apply it well. I think as a city, we need to use the assets fairly and to their best purpose. And ball fields are one of those assets that we have. And so we should use those appropriately. And when it comes to youth sports or local or Emerald Fields, I mean, we need to treat Triple Crown fairly if we're going to allow. We love youth soccer and lacrosse. We host a lot of those. But I'm not sure the field knows the difference between, a, a, you know, a soccer cleat and a baseball cleat or, or whether the person's from in town or out of town. But, you know, we support our nonprofits through soccer by inviting a lot of teams from out of town using those same fields that Triple Crown is. So if people's angst is that Triple Crown is a for-profit business, then yeah, maybe we need to look at some commercial differentiation from nonprofits. But I do believe, you know, in the best interest of the community, it's a public-private partnership that's worked, even if it's not gonna be like it once was, they're a good fit for the community, they can be a part of the balance, and we need to proceed with them. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Anybody else here to comment on Triple Crown discussion, item eight? Kerry King, uh, CEO, Triple Crown Sports, 3930 Automation Way in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, talk with the city council real, real quickly regarding what's happened here. And, you know, this is our 40th year of being in business as an organization. And our business started in Triple Crown Sports, a family owned company. We grew up on the Western Slope. And, you know, we're part of the community. I grew up in Steamboat and I feel like a local resident uh, myself. We were very amenable to moving from a 10-year agreement to a two-year agreement that included a ton of concession reductions, paying for facilities, uh, moving away from any kind of sponsorship that the city would provide, and also reducing our team counts, reducing um, a, a lot of impact that we had and really working well with the new negotiation team between Robin and Heather. And uh, after 40 years and about $450 million of economic impact, which is a total sales tax collections of $21 million roughly over the course of our 40 years and a $12 million annual impact to the economy uh, with 8 million in direct spending, this is a, a big, important investment for the local businesses to make sure it's, it's, it's part of the economy. Um, and Steamboat has provided around $3 million of, of cash or in-kind trade for this impact over the course of time. And so it, it's been a good deal for Steamboat. And it doesn't count the secondary impact that Triple Crown Sports, as well as the other event ride holders like soccer and lacrosse, have on selling uh, homes in the community, having winter tourism come to your community. So we're, we're a marketing component for future visitors um, and all the events that you have, which are over 30 events in your community are doing similar attributes, whether they're for locals or, or uh, produced by locals or attended by locals, they're, they're providing a marketing impact. Uh, secondly, Triple Crown is a is considered by the Parks and Rec staff because I've I've worked directly with them 
as the number one partner to work with because of a few really important um, respectful things that we do as an entity and that we've done over the course of time. We take care of the facilities that we rent and utilize. We assist the partners um, that we actually work with, like the lodging, Larry mentioned, what we'll do with teams if they uh, damage the hotel room or destroy property, we kick them out of the event. Um, paying customer, paying bills at restaurants, um, uh, maintaining quiet in public spaces, being respectful to local citizens. We're one of the stewards of the community that really try and respect the, the locals sentiment of a, a, a city that really desires to have its quiet and its, its business uh, simultaneously. And Triple Crown has been treated differently over the course of this last maybe 20 years and especially this last year with special surveys done for our event and not other events um, we are treated differently and and for what reason there's been a lot of talk um, between Joe uh, Kabuti and Larry that maybe it's the slow pitch softball adult world we are a youth family oriented organization and that's what we bring to the community uh, which are very good um, for this community and as travel restrictions open up, I do see lessened impact from COVID in communities that don't have events. And I know all mountain towns, we're working with Jackson and Park City and Steamboat Springs and various other mountain communities and everybody's weighing event fatigue out. I worry that if Steamboat does disable events in the community, it could negatively affect the business owners that I know, the families that I know that live there that depend on uh, tourism. And after 30, 30 events, it looks like a tourism community to me. And we've already, over the course of our 40 years, reduced our impact to such an extent that you have no Girls World Series, you have no soccer, no lacrosse um, from Triple Crown Sports. We've moved to Park City, um, San Diego, Reno. We've displaced a ton of events from Steamboat to other communities. And I understand right now from what I'm seeing um, from this city council is that this community is not active in investing in tourism, in sports tourism, especially hey, Terry, sports I'm sorry tourism. to interrupt, but I need you to wrap it up because you've okay. gone a little bit over your yeah, time. Yeah, so um, we want to use Emerald. We'll reduce, we, we really want to be a part of the community. And um, you know, hopefully we can, we can be there in June and July. Like Larry said, we want to be there for the for the full two months, five events. All right, thank you. Anybody else here to make comment on the Triple Crown discussion, item eight? Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment. Um, Gary, I wanted to follow up um, on some of those comments. We. I wanted to ask you about the fee discussion. My understanding is that Triple Crown, just like any event, would have to pay fees, and they would be paying fees if you approve these applications. And as my understanding is, that fee setting is also in your discretion entirely. Am I right in that? We have a uh, fee schedule. Yes, city manager uh, in the city of Steamboat Springs uh, sets the fees, and. Uh, and it works well because they're modified pretty regularly. And uh, an example of that is at the airport, uh, Stacy realized that there were different demands between summer and winter. Obviously you want your aircraft covered in the winter. So we, we developed separate seasonal uh, fee schedule for the airport. Uh, having to go back to city council for those fee adjustments every time is, is uh, rather clunky. So yes, it's the city manager's responsibility to, to set fees. If we're gonna increase them greatly, uh, that will have uh, negative public comment, then uh, yes, I bring that to city council and advise you accordingly and seek your input. Um, you know, in terms of the uh, commercial fee and, and uh, separating that out, uh, that's something that we could look at. I'm sure it was probably looked at over the two year process. I'm not sure why it's not in there. The only thing that I did here was when we when we uh, looked at targeting the private entities, uh, the private for-profit entities, 
and we gave discounts to the nonprofits. Then all the private entities just found an end around and found a nonprofit, local nonprofit, to sponsor them and apply. So uh, we just tried to stop that, but. There might be some validity to coming up with commercial fees. We just need to make sure that we define that clearly. And my guess is you'd probably have both locals and uh, out of towners paying that commercial fee, depending upon their organization and whatever criteria we come up with. So um, I'm not sure, Winnie, if you wanted to weigh in on that uh, in terms of uh, the commercial fee or Angela. Uh, yeah, Gary, I'll weigh in. Angela Cosby, your person rec director again. The first time Mr. Jamison brought this up, we as staff thought, good idea, why don't we do that? Um, and we looked into it and talked about it as staff. We haven't had commercial uses renting our fields regularly. In the past, Triple Crown's agreement did not include field rental fees, so that didn't apply. And most of the rest of our uses are by nonprofits or sponsoring for a nonprofit. So we really appreciate Mr. Jameson's suggestion and we're researching what those possible fees could be to bring to Gary's office sometime in the near future. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Winnie, did you have a follow up? I yes, we did consider uh, within the whole special events process the differentiation between commercial and really what it came down to is that because all of the for profits went through a nonprofit that we came up with a public event versus a private event. So there is different pricing within our special events process for something that is a public event versus something that is a private event like a street party or a birthday party or something like that, um, that is, is really just a private use. So we, we do have differentiation in the special events pricing based on that. Okay. Thank you for that follow up. All right, Council, so we need to give it any feedback. Uh, Gary, as he mentioned, he's happy to uh, hear from us on, you know, individually, if we have any ideas on what factors or considerations he should take into account. You see Gary, his, uh, his plan for approving the three events. So I think it's time for us to give any feedback on, on those items that we see. So happy to kick it to Council. Who would like to go first? I'll go. Go ahead, Heather. Gary, I'm in support of you doing June um, with one caveat. I think um, because there's just so much gray with the Emerald Park and the fact that the um, event is smaller, I would like to just take that contention out of the mix completely and make sure that we, you know, Triple Crown is more than welcome to come in June, but just not utilize Emerald and keep it to where it was prior to 20, what was it, 19. Thank you, Heather. Okay, thanks, Heather. Who else? I'll go. Go ahead, Sonia. Um, you know, Gary, I know that you and the team do a good job of trying to balance all of the interests here, and that's the job of any good city manager, and we have one, and that's fortunate. Um, but I'm kind of challenging some of the weighting that was used in um, considering this application. And, you know, in every one of our communication forums, we have kind of a little place where we ask about being consistent with council goals. And I just want to kind of read the mission statement here of the council. We plan, partner, and provide superior services and a safe environment in our thriving, authentic community. So I'm stressing the words partner and stressing the word safe because I feel as though um, the quality of the partnership and the safety factors were not considered adequately in, uh, in considering approving this. And you know, one of the reasons that I, I think this is just that um, I'm not sure if all of council received a letter uh, dated February 8th in which uh, Triple Crown is threatening to sue us if we do not by March 15th approve their applications. And, you know, uh, I think to me that letter was a really disturbing um, approach to what everybody is calling a partnership. And, um, you know, I can read to you just that uh, if the city council cancels just Triple Crown without some type of legal justification and permits any of these other events, then we will be suing the city of Steamboat Springs through antitrust litigation, we would seek representation from the most prominent antitrust competition law firm. 
and through this person. This lawsuit would seek damages for Triple Crown and all customer lodging bookings in 2021 20, and possibly further. So then we are left with an ultimatum as to how we um, can get out of the lawsuit, which is essentially approving the request by um, a certain date. Now, that's the partnership factor that concerns me. I mean, I, you know, we were asked to treat Triple Crown as any other organization or event. And I'm just going to throw out there how many other organizations or events have threatened to sue us preemptively before we have approved their applications. So that's just something to ponder. The second thing, and this is what really concerns me about this letter, is that and this is Triple Crown stating, in 2021, we are somewhat concerned about the possible physical harm or property damage that Steamboat citizens could inflict on our staff or customers. Triple Crown is concerned that our residents are going to inflict physical harm or property damage. That's in writing, and that is a I mean, I guess I'd consider it a shot across the bow. I would consider it, I don't know what to consider it, but to me, it, it concerns me because if there's that concern out there that you know that our, our residents are gonna harm somebody, why would we want to bring that group here who already feels unwelcome, already feels threatened, already feels as though they're going to be possibly physically harmed. So, you know, when I look at this, you know, I understand that, that Gary, you're trying to do your job and balance all the interests, but I mean, this is not like any other situation in the sense that we have a threat of a lawsuit um, and, you know, we've got a safety situation here. We have an event that is concerned for their people's safety and to bring them to our town, knowing that that's, that's, that's a concern, it really makes me wonder if we have done a good job of looking at the risk management question. So, you know, the other piece that I just think has been overlooked as well when we talk about e treating every event as every event, this is the only event that I'm aware of in which an, a firearm has been discharged accidentally, potentially harming not just the owner of the firearm, but others. So I would urge you, Gary, uh, my direction would be to urge you to reconsider um, some of these factors and give more appropriate weighting to the fact that we don't have a partnership here, we have an ultimatum, and that what we have really is, is a safety concern. I think having them put, put this in writing to us that they're concerned about our residents harming them, if that happens, you guys are the attorneys, what are we on the hook for? I mean, how does that look? So those are my comments and concerns about the situation as it is today. Okay, thank you, Sonia. Who else would like to weigh in? Any other feedback for Gary? I'll, I'll weigh in just briefly. Uh, I'm going to agree with what Heather said. Um, I support um, what Gary's kind of come to for a conclusion. Um, but I, after kind of reading the website, I mean, it does seem very clear that the intention was not to have um, non-local youth sports there. And I, you know, I, I get that we kind of overrode that this last time, but um, this is different now because it's not a contract. So I, I do feel like we need to kind of honor that. Um, I also just want to point out that um, I voted last time to keep the contract with Triple Crown and I'm voting for them to come in June this time. In all honest, honesty, that is not in support of Triple Crown. Um, I, I was, a, it's maybe too harsh a word, but pretty disgusted by the threat of a lawsuit as well. Um, we asked Triple Crown to repair their relationship with our community and that was a huge slap in the face, I thought. Um, but I do care a lot about our businesses and I am concerned about them coming out of this winter, which hasn't been awful, but it hasn't been good. And I do understand that Triple Crown can bring additional business to our town in June to help. So um, I, I, I think what Gary has proposed has been good, but um, just that piece with Emerald, now that we have that additional information really to weigh in. Okay, thanks, Liesl. What other feedback? Robin, Kathy, who's ready? Um, I'll, go. I'll go. Okay. Kathy, go ahead. Um, I um, The only thing I'm concerned about in Gary's report is where it says staff continues to work with Triple Crown to relocate the World Series in late July. Um, I, and based on Gary's comment, there's an expectation that that's an option. I would hope not. 
Um, I, I'm not sure what that means, that staff is continuing to work with them. That's their problem. Um, and um, I just, um, the, the comment about traffic um, is specific, I think, to the public works projects that we're going to have in this community in late summer. So okay. it's not just general traffic. It's specific, and I think that's why. Um, and I don't. I'm, I want Gary to clarify. That's why the um, proposal for the late July's uh, events were not uh, approved. That's not the singular reason, but there. I expressed that to Mr. King. Uh, that there are going to be significant construction projects uh, going on in the community. And uh, I believe that there uh, will be impacts on locals. There'll be impacts on, uh, on residents and uh, probably quite a few unhappy people. And, and uh, so that was one of, the, one of the factors. But the primary factor was, as I said earlier, was I considered all uh, all factors, including uh, community sentiment. So just try to come up with a compromise, hopefully, that uh, I can get most people comfortable with. And uh, yeah, and I did ask Carrie directly if they could uh, relocate the uh, World Series. They do have some options and I would need to follow up with him and find out at some point uh, they're gonna have to make a decision or I will have to make the decision and uh, enforce their hand. Uh, but I'd rather that they come up with an alternate location so that I just don't have to tell them in advance, okay, you're not coming here or deny the permit and then force them to go find another location. So that's what I mean by continuing to work with them. So I've asked them, they do have alternatives and, uh, you know, it's March, but spring's upon us and, and these folks do need some advance notice to uh, plan their trips, their summer trips and make their reservations and so forth. So. We'll get to that. We'll get to that point, Kathy. We're just not quite there yet. I, I have a follow-up question, Gary. I'm still confused because I'm with Kathy. I'm I'm really under. I'm if we're if you gave us these options and it, the staff option was to approve the June events. Why are we even having a conversation about the July events? I mean, from my perspective, the message should be given now, not if or when they can change their venue. I mean, this is about special event permitting that you're supposed to be approving. So help me understand what was written in the packet and what you're saying now. Yeah, well, I'm just looking for feedback from city council on the July. If, if you guys heard, you guys heard testimony tonight and I wanted to hear from the public as well about the importance and the economic impacts. I gave a lot of weight to the economic uh, component of this as well as to the community negative community sentiment. If council said, yeah, we think we ought to do the, you know, the scope is reduced, we ought to do the July uh, tournaments, I would respect that as well. If, if council's saying a firm no, uh, certainly I'd respect that. So um, yeah, just trying to leave some options open for the community and, uh, and have a, a transparent discussion. So. Um, okay, well then can I change my response, Jason, and say that I believe because of the undue amount of traffic and headache and where Gary's leaning with the community sentence sentiment, et cetera, that we should, he should consider July not being a part of the permit permits yeah. that will be accepted. Right. So what I heard was June was okay. Um, with a condition of uh, no Emerald park and no July. Got it. That's helpful. Thank you. Robin, what about you? Any any other feedback? Yep. Um, a few things. Um, first, I appreciate all the work that's been put into this. Um, I read the thing too about Emerald, um, and I'm I asked Angela, and I, if she could answer it now, that would be great. How many other people use Emerald those three weeks that Triple Crown is here? Because whenever I go buy Emerald, anytime spring, summer, or fall more times than not, there's nobody using the ball fields. So I'd like to get a feel for whether those fields would be in use if Triple Crown were not here. Great question, Councillor Crossan. Um, 
We do have some little league games there, but it is very minor use. As I'm sure council is well aware, the soccer fields at Emerald get a lot of use, sometimes too much use. They're a little love to death. But our softball and baseball fields, our diamond fields at Emerald Park, are they are not heavily utilized. And Triple Crown Sports has, in the previous year, was the largest user. Okay. All right. I appreciate that information. Um, the second thing is um, a member of the public talked about our sales tax, and I just spent a little few minutes looking it up. In June of last year, we were down 11.29. And in July, we were down 4.92. Now, granted, in June, you know, we were dead. There was nothing going on. Um, and in July, you know, we've got some other activities. I and mean, I'm looking at Art in the Park and wondering why we're going to let 10,000 people a day be here for a weekend when we possibly are still paving and doing other things. And we know what the traffic situation is when they're here. And I'm not picking on any organization. I'm just saying, if we need to be fair, we need to be fair to everyone. So I appreciate what Gary said about the economic impact and um, just pull those numbers so people in the public would remember what we had or didn't have last June and July. I think if we're going to be specific to one group, we then have to go back and look at soccer, lacrosse, kickball, anybody, anybody else that uses our fields and brings in people from out of town, whether it's for profit or for nonprofit. So if we, we're going to be fair, we have to be fair with everyone, not just one group or not be fair with one group. And so for that reason, um, I would hope that Gary um, and that we will be able to move forward with the three events. And quite honestly, I think that we need to go back and look at the other two events. I don't know when the timetable stops on that for the 45 days out, but I think that um, I'm, I'm not that I'm not opposed to the what Gary suggested right now, but at the same point, I think we have to be again, we have to be fair to everybody. And Kathy brought up a good point about the traffic. So maybe that is the, the thing that sways me one way or the other on that. But I think the front, front three in June are very important to continue with. All right, Michael, what about you? Any comments? Yeah, I'll make a few comments. Um, if I recall, I made a motion to deny this at the beginning. Um, and I gotta tell you, it's it's a little disheartening with the letter that we got back in February regarding kind of a lawsuit. I understand it um, because we're actually having this conversation right now, um, treating someone differently um, because they're triple crown and they have a history. Uh, however, I'm one who loves the rules of engagement. And right now we have a set of rules and guidelines that we approved and we have voted on and in its entirety that we have right now. And I do not think in any circumstances, no matter how convincing my colleagues have tried to throw my way, I'm not convinced that we need to treat them any differently, but to respect Gary's opinion on what he's doing. He's putting that together. Those are the rules of engagement. Okay. We have a new set of guidelines that he's going by. We need to see and how those work, how they don't work. But by sitting and, and, and nitpicking and dissecting Triple Crown again, we are continually trying to recreate something we already approved. I think what we ought to do right now, and, I, and that means with Emerald Fields, I know about Emerald Fields and it was youth sports. Okay, and so I know we've had some public comment about not letting Emerald Fields be in there. Disagree. It says youth sports, the rules of engagement, not the intent, but what the rules of engagement are. Right now, the rules of engagement, Gary has followed, Carrie King has followed, and we need to honor that. I appreciate Angela with your, your making it and your question, Robin. These fields aren't overused. It's not an issue of the fields, guys. The issue was how they react and how they treat lodging and restaurants. And they have a tarnished reputation for that. As far as our parks and rec, I don't think there's ever been a problem with that. This is the special event policy we have. We need to honor that. We need to follow through with it. And if we have a problem with it, we change it next year. Michael, I just want to make it clear that 
on our city website, it says limited to local organizations. So I, I honestly had no problem with being at Emerald until I saw that it specifically says on our own website that it's limited to local. So just want to make sure you have that fact. Thank you. And Jason, I just want you to know that I feel comfortable with them using Emerald. Okay. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll jump into, you know, I know we've talked about this a long time, so I'll try to be quick. Um, Gary, I know this probably has put you in one of the most uncomfortable positions you've had while you've been our city manager. So I think you've done a really good job in trying to manage and, you know, weighing all the aspects, you know, it's, it's obviously a different scenario where you have to you know, look at this from the perspective of the special activity permit, as opposed to the contract decision, which we had, which we kind of had discretion to say yes or no, you're in a little bit of a different scenario here and you're, you're, you need to follow the rules and procedures that we've adopted. So I think you've done an admirable job. I, I know this hasn't been easy. Um, I think I align a lot with what I've heard from several council members and I think, I think you're on the right track. Um, I do, you know, I don't have this uh, Emerald Park website uh, discussion or, or policy or, or procedure in front of me, but I do think that if we have something that says, you know, they, they shouldn't be able to use that, then that we need to follow that. Or, or if it says they can, then that's, you know, that's fine. It's, it's really, we just need to follow whatever we, uh, we have, you know, listed on our website, whatever we have listed as our adopted policy, that's what, that's what we need to do. So I want you to check on that, but otherwise I think everyone has kind of said, um, you know, everything else. And, and I think you're, I think you're on the right track. Can I make a comment? Thank you. Yep. I'd like to caution, I appreciate what you just said, but if Emerald and if, if we need to look at what's on the website for the future, not for right now, because if it's soccer and it says local only, and I, I didn't read all of them, if it's lacrosse and it says local only, we might, not be not, we might be knocking out every single thing that comes forward to us. So I think we're treading very, on lots of thin ice right now. And I think we have to be super careful until we can clarify what the community wants and how we want to move forward. Yeah, I, I think the key is we need to be consistent, Robin, with what we have in place. And that's what my concern is for all the other events for the rest of the summer in being sure. consistent. So there you go. I think we already had this discussion with that baseball outfit that came and used the fields uh, in the season. And I forget the name of it, but it was that, I don't think, it wasn't the Wranglers. But I know that there was a, a baseball outfit that would come uh, as a high school kind of clinic for the whole summer almost. And they had went out and got uh, sponsors and had the kids stay at people's houses. They, they used those fields and it was a question because some of the kids were 18 years and older. And I think what happened is that we, they ended up using the fields, but it was, it was more in the context of youth sports. And it wasn't the drunken alcoholic adults that were the ones that caused the problem to have that clause in there. So I know that this decision and this conversation has been had, and I know that they have, were using it. So you make a good point, Robin. But with that, I will put my point to, 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 to bed. So I'll just read real quick. It says the Emerald Fields are youth only program programming and limited to local organizations slash individuals. Right. And that's where so, I think we have to be super careful. And I, I, I'm looking at it too. We have to go back, Gary, you and your event group have to go back and look at every single application for this summer and to ensure that it's local only if you're gonna make this decision. I'm just, I'm just concerned. Uh, me too. We'll have to, and I agree, Jason, we'll have to look into that further. I wanna get uh, legal to weigh in as well. Uh, I'm concerned uh, soccer teams come from all over and uh, that could be a big impact. I mean, what are there, 2,500 people that come in for the soccer tournament? So, you know, um, yeah, a lot of these same factors are gonna come in, but I, I do wanna research that, find out what's out there, find out what the basis is for these rules and, and policies, where they came from, where they live. Um, I looked at the, Basically, I considered the officially adopted things that we could find. I didn't know there was a clause on the website that said you local only. Um, but that should be a discussion that we should have this fall because it was brought up earlier and, and uh, we need to cross that bridge and figure out some of the solutions to uh, some of these 
uh, issues, whether they're real or perceived. Okay, well, Council, I think we've given our input at this point. I'm not sure there's it. any stone that has not been unturned <laughs> on this item at this point. So and it's coming back to you in some other three, form. Three, three other times day. each stone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gary, did you need anything else from us on this? No, I got direction from you. Thank you. And I'll keep council informed as we move forward. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the discussion. Thanks, Gary. Um, okay. So normally we take our break at seven. So we're a little past that. I know we obviously have a lot of people on the line who are probably interested in our e-bike discussion and apologize. We're trying to get through this as soon as we can. Next up, we're going to take our 10 minute break now. After that, we'll do our consent calendar. Several of these items should be approved with just a motion, and then hopefully we'll be getting to uh, the e-bike and other more media discussions as soon as we can. So let's take a 10 minute break and we'll be back as soon as we can. Thanks everyone. Thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back. We are now on the consent calendar, so bear with me. I'm going to read all the items into the record. We'll see which ones are approved without discussion, and we'll see which ones are pulled for further discussion. So items on the consent calendar may be reviewed and commented upon in the same manner as other agenda items. Any member of the council or the public may request withdrawal of any item from the consent calendar for further discussion at any time prior to approval. If items are not removed, they may, they may be approved with a single motion. Agenda item nine is a motion uh, to table indefinitely, 1950 Ski Time Square Drive. Um, yes, I don't have the number on that one, but that's number nine. Item, item 10, first reading of an ordinance, an ordinance amending chapter 26 of the Steamboat Springs Revised Municipal Code by amending sections 101, 421, 602, 603, 604, 605, 606, 700, and 802 to add exemptions for final plat condominium slash townhome and final plat replat application types, TXT 20-05. Agenda item 11, first reading of an ordinance, an ordinance amending chapter 26 the Steamboat Springs Revised Municipal Code by amending sections 713 and 714 to exempt city properties from certain platting requ requirements, TXT 20-04. Agenda item 12, a resolution adopting the 2020 Route County Noxious Weed Management Plan. Agenda item 13, a resolution acknowledging a nomination to the Route County Noxious Weed Advisory Board. Agenda item 14, a resolution approving the updated Memorandum of, Under of Understanding for the Yampa River Legacy System Partnership. Agenda item 15, a resolution adopting an airport master plan and airport layout plan for the Steamboat Springs Airport. Agenda item 16, a motion to issue a request for proposals for airport hangar development. Agenda item 17, a resolution modifying permit conditions for commercial tube and angling outfitters. And agenda item 18, first reading of an ordinance, an ordinance amending chapter 16 to add article one general provisions and Article 3 regarding regulation of vehicles, horses, and bicycles to the Steamboat Springs Revised Municipal Code, providing an effective date and repealing all conflicting ordinances. So I'm going to pull agenda item 9 for, uh, we're, we need to table that one indefinitely. I'm also going to pull item 17, which is the uh, resolution modifying permit conditions for commercial tube and angling outfitters for some discussion. And I'm also going to pull agenda item 18, which is our first reading on the e-bikes and related discussion. So I've pulled 9, 17, and 18. Council, anybody else like to pull any of the other agenda items? 14, please. Okay. And I'd like to understand why we gave um, the airport master plan 30 minutes. Is that in case it got pulled in, or do we need to pull it so Stacy can give a presentation? We don't have to, but we just allotted some time because if, if we might, if, if someone did pull it, we would probably need a, a detailed presentation. Okay, thanks. So I heard Sonia pulled 14. Council, any other items to pull? Okay, hearing uh, none. Jason, did you say 17? I did. Yeah, I thought so. Yep. So anybody in the public, I've, I've pulled nine. 14, 17, and 18 for discussion. Does anybody in the public wish to pull items 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, or 16 for discussion? Anybody here in the public wish to pull any of those? Okay, hearing nobody. Council, I'll look for a motion to approve items 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, and 16. So moved. Second. Uh, it was a motion Third. by by Sloop and a second by Bacino. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. And then if I could get a motion to table number nine indefinitely. Move to approve. Move to table. I'll second it then. So Michael did the motion to table number nine and Kathy did the second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Okay, so that means we have 14, 17, and 18 for discussion. Sonia, you pulled 14. Yes, um, I pulled 14 because the, um, the Legacy Partnership has been a really um, productive place for us to have a role in terms of expanding open space and natural areas. And as you guys know, I've been kind of advocating for the city to have a more active presence in terms of acquiring open space in natural areas and you know um 
I was on that legacy, legacy system partnership for many years. So in looking at the MOU, I saw that Gary was the signer on it. And I'm just wondering who has been attending the meetings on the city's behalf and if there's anything moving um, with the legacy system partnership that has sparked the change to the MOU or, you know, is there anything promising on the horizon, I guess is the question. Winnie Delacuadri, Special Projects and IGS Manager. Ginger Scott has been the one that is attending all of the legacy partnership meetings. Um, the city has provided staff support to the legacy partnership since its inception, and we continue to do that uh, through Ginger. And the, the group has really been extremely inactive for probably the last several years. So rather than the group really working together to develop projects, which you know used to happen and has on occasion happened, uh, now it's a place where partners come to get support for projects that they're doing individually. So whereas in the past, it was the place where we developed collaborative projects, now it's more of an information sharing venue where people get support for proje projects that they're doing on their own. Um, by keeping the group active, it, you know, it continues that networking information sharing piece while also provides a venue for finding partners to collaborate with should we ever have funding in our budget to do land acquisition. Um, right now, all of our open space land acquisition um, projects are on the parked projects list. Uh, but we, we continue to engage in uh, the legacy partnership in those meetings through Ginger's participation. Thank you for that update. And Ginger's been there forever. So it's good to have that continuity, I think. Yeah. All right. Council, any other questions on item 14, the MOU for the AMPA River Legacy System Partnership? Okay. I'll move to approve item 14. Second. Okay, that's a motion to approve by Macy's and a second by Sloop. Before I call a question on that though, let me just double check. Is there anyone here to make public comment on agenda item 14? Nobody here for that? Okay. I'll close that and I'll call the motion or call the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Okay, so last two items on consent have been pulled. I pulled item 17. This is the resolution modifying the permit conditions for commercial tube and angling outfitters. And I thought it might be a good idea for uh, Craig. Is Craig here with us tonight? Mm -hmm. Okay. Might be a good idea for Craig to introduce this one. I know we've had some comments on this, so just like Craig to give us a quick overview and then we can see what questions and discussion we have. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. I'm gonna give a short intro as Craig pulls up the presentation. So Angela Cosby, your Parks and Recreation Director. We have a very brief presentation to catch the community and council up on this topic. This resolution is also goes in conjunction with the second reading of the ordinance for the Amper River Tube and the disposable container ban that are later on your agenda tonight. And together they create an improved management plan for the Yamper River. Um, this will help balance recreational uses, but more importantly combined, they improve the health of the Yampa um, and they reduce and educate our private tubers. So with that, I'll pass it off to Craig and then I'll wrap us up. Yes, hi, good evening. Craig Robinson, Parks, Open Space and Trails Manager with the City. And uh, yes, I'll give you a quick overview of the process that we've been through to date. Uh, again, tonight we're here to talk about a resolution modifying permit conditions for commercial tube and angling outfitters. And in particular, we're talking about al allowing these outfitters to flex their approved daily allotments and not exceed their monthly totals. Um, it was back this, this past fall, November 2020, when we brought the past year's discussions from Parks and Recreation Commission and their recommendations to City Council. And as you recall, we, uh, City Council directed staff to move forward with an ordinance for the $5 tube fee and the uh, disposable container ban on the river. And they sent the one item that talked about permit allotments back to Parks and Recreation Commission for further review. 
Specifically, there were some questions about why we had it in place. How did we get there? Is it adequate for today? And is it adequate for the future moving forward? And was Parks and Wildlife on board with what the recommendations were? Um, just a quick overview of the process prior to that. City Council in 2019 directed city staff and Parks Recreation Commission to look at how other communities manage river recreation, to look at the possibility of a tube fee or tube tax and considering private use and fees for those people using the river. As we moved through that public process, we had five public Parks and Recreation Commission meetings. We created a uh, topic on the Engaged Steamboat website where we provided updates and allowed for public comment during that. Uh, we did a questionnaire and collected data from sever seven similar river recreation oriented communities to see how they were addressing some of these similar concerns. Our Parks and Recreation Commission directed that a subcommittee help move forward with some of the discussion to make recommendations. And that was formed up with members of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the Steamboat Chamber, commercial outfitters, and Parks and Recreation Commissioners. We also invited uh, some uh, tube suppliers and salespeople around town and some other folks from the lodging community who did not make those meetings. But that subcommittee did meet twice and made recommendations to the Parks and Recreation Commission, who then made recommendations to City Council, which we talked about back last November. Um, and again, as we just mentioned, City Council sent this discussion about the allotments back to Parks and Recreation Commission for more discussion. On the right-hand side of your screen here, you can see what I'm talking about when I mentioned the allotments. Today, there are three tubing companies that have these numbers permitted for weekdays, Fridays, and weekends. And what we're talking about is allowing each company to flex these totals for the month and use them how they see fit. So we are seeing a lot of unused tubes go by the wayside and through the planning efforts of the Yep River Management Plan, the vision was that we could see potentially 50,000 people on the river with commercial activity. Today, we're seeing about 15,000 people on average. Um, so as we met with Parks and Recreation Commission this past January, we met on two different occasions, and we really took a deep dive back into the process of the Yampa River Management Plan, which was a very deliberate process, uh, community project where various agencies uh, related to river recreation, river health, came together with the community, with user groups, to look at the existing data that we had and create a baseline based on the number of people that we saw recreating on the river. And from that, they, they moved forward with some information and, and predictions about use in the future. Um, some of their goals are the same as the goals that we have today. First and foremost, protect the river health. They want to sustainably manage river recreation. And then they also wanted to address the community concerns that they were hearing loudly at that time about what was happening on the river. The result was several policies, management plans, and use guidelines that were formulated into ordinances, which city council passed with this management plan. And that really guided the use of commercial river recreation as we moved forward. What it did not do it did, was it did not address or put any limitations on, on private use. And those are some of the areas where we struggle and uh, see some conflicts today. Uh, there were some guidelines set up and uh, a monitor monitoring plan was, was put in place to make sure that we were on track with this plan. And there were certain triggers that were identified. Um, some of those items that we saw in the monitoring plan where the triggers have been met were that private tubing has increased and two of the other ones seem silly, but noxious weeds are present, which was a trigger and dog waste on the core trail and the riverbanks is present, which is a trigger. That was present then, it's still present today. Um, but we have seen uh, private recreation, it's kind of increasing every year and uh, the community has not necessarily tackled that. And in some cases we've uh, enabled it by creating parking lots and removed parking restrictions that were in some of these areas. Uh, we also talked about the 2019 Parks, Re Recreation, Open Space, Trails and River Master Plan. And when we talked about the river components, there was some community discussion about changing some of the management strategies. There was talk about the commercial use and, and reassessing whether or not uh, changes should be made to allotments and making things easier for folks 
to use those commercial operators, but no changes were made at that time because it wasn't a, a priority in the planning process. The Parks and Recreation Commissioners at these meetings also requested that we have a member from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, our City Waters Resources Man Manager and Friends of the AMPA present at the second meeting to discuss uh, aquatic health and uh, river health and uh, impacts that we might see if we were to do something like this by flexing allotments. And the, the general consensus is that uh, river health, river recreation is a very small component to impacts to the river, river health and aquatic life. There are many more, uh, much larger impacts. It's a, a bigger, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, th there's more impacts out there that are, have, there's more areas that have larger impacts than river than river recreation, but it is a small component. So it's very difficult to pin challenges or problems for, from river recreation directly linking it to impacts to aquatic health and um, river health. So the recommendations moving forward from this group was that if there are going to be changes, we should continue to monitor those changes. All of the agencies are doing some sort of monitoring, the city included, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and uh, if there is an allotment flexing possibility that we should just uh, monitor that and take in incremental steps before we make larger changes, such as eliminating uh, allotments altogether. So moving forward with the recommendation from Parks and Recreation Commission and the resolution language, uh, the resolution states that the Parks and Recreation Department is authorized to modify permit conditions for commercial river tube and angling outfitters to flex the daily allotments approved in master plans to be used as needed each month while not exceeding the total monthly allotment. Um, and just speaking to why this is in resolution form, the ordinance that we have in place today for parks, recreation and river use requires or allows the city to permit each commercial outfitter. So within those permit conditions, this is where we would be tackling modifying these numbers. And we thought this was uh, important enough and so did our legal staff that we document this in a resolution form and get it approved through city council in the public process. With that, I'll turn it over back to Angela. Wonderful, I'll wrap us up. Council, if you have any questions, Craig and I are happy to do our best to answer them. Um, if you have direction on the recommendations and possible next steps are on your screen. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Craig. Council, any questions on this presentation? Anybody have any questions? Liesl, you had a okay, question? Cool. Um, my <clears throat> first question is, it looks like one of the commissioners asked a couple times about like a biologist or some sort of scientist kind of giving us a little bit more substantial feedback on the effects of, um, you know, the amount of people on the river and how it's affecting the river. And I, I didn't see really an answer to her question at any point in time. Can you give me any sort of information on that? Go so there was, there was a request for Parks and Recreation, or Colorado Parks and Wildlife to address carrying capacity. And, and at what point is there a tipping point from the impacts of people on the river to aquatic health? Um, and the, as I mentioned, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife does lots of testing and noted that there are so many factors and impacts to aquatic health and water health, water quality as well, that you, it was very difficult without doing expensive long-term studies. And then you might not even get the result or, or a result that can pin it back on recreation. But it, they're talking about impacts from uh, drought, from warmer water temperatures, from um, all the variables that we're seeing each year, that those have such a variety of impacts that it's very difficult for them to pinpoint it back to um, impacts from river recreation. I think from the social side of things, it's very easy to point bank erosion, social trails, um, high use to those situations, but they both, uh, the water resources manager and the Colorado Parks and Wildlife officer could not pinpoint direct impacts from recreation to water quality or aquatic uh, health. Okay. Uh, my second question, 
is it didn't seem like there was much discussion around congestion on the river and that that may have been a reason for the caps being per day versus per month. And I'm curious if there's conversation around that. You know, if we kind of open it upwards per month, my guess is they're going to be allotting of a lot of the weekdays onto weekends and that we're going to see a much, much higher number on weekends, which I will tell you um, from personal experience, I've seen the river get extremely congested, for example, on 4th of July weekend. So what kind of considerations are we having around that? So the general discussion that we've been having and uh, through Parks Recreation Commission, our subcommittee and city council was that there is uh, some validity perhaps to the point that the people, the oper creating the opportunities for more people to go with a commercial outfitter is better than having a private person going out to recreate on their own. So by doing this, we are hoping that we are going to be taking some of these private tubers who are, um, going and buying these cheap tubes and going to the liquor store perhaps, which is gonna be illegal hopefully, um, and taking that stuff down the river and not recreating that the community, the, the way the community wants them to, which would be having a negative impact in the waterway. So by doing this, the theory is that you might've had the same number of people on the river as a whole, but now more of them may be down below Fifth Street going with commercial operators. So those numbers could be higher from commercial operators the challenge about determining whether or not we're having an impact on private recreation is that we don't have actual use numbers and they're very difficult to obtain. So the monitoring that we're going to do is going to be, we're trying to implement a camera system to do better counts. We've done periodic counts in the past of private use. It'll be observations. It'll be how are the commercial operators working. It'll be monitoring their numbers, the use that's occurring, public impacts, traffic, and uh, that's that's the plan for moving forward with the summer to see what those impacts are. You know, I, I know there was a lot of discussion about whether or not private use is going to change at all. Um, I'm sure there might be some people who couldn't get in with a um, private operator and that's why they go, um, or commercial operator and that's why they go by themselves. But I, I truly believe a lot of people tube privately because it's cheap and they either don't have the money to go through a commercial operator or they don't want to spend the money to go through a commercial operator. So I think we need to be very conscious that we may continue to see the exact same amount of people using tubes. And I'm not sure that we should be completely cutting that off as I do think that people should have access to law of our nature for free and we shouldn't be charging for everything. Um, so, I, and I, I apologize, I don't remember um, right now what the language is for the resolution, but is this just a one year trial period that we're doing um, this? It is, it's, a, it's just modifying the permit conditions, which it was, no, no one has modified commercial tubing or angling since the plan was adopted in 2004. There have been some other changes within the document based on policy. So this is really a policy discussion and a permitting process. So if it's not working out well, we can revisit it and we can change the permit conditions at any point in time. We would probably do so with a resolution again, just to document the process. I'm sorry, to add on to that, there have been more discussions to some folks. We received some public feedback that some folks wish we would have opened it up and allowed even more flexibility or increased the commercial operators tube allotments. It's staff's recommendation to do this change, evaluate in the fall, see if further changes need to be made one way or the other without making large holistic changes at the moment. I, I have just, some comments, but no more questions. And just to add to that comment, uh, we did provide an option for Parks Recreation Commission with the motions to allow a, a more flexible uh, approach that would have more numbers on the river, and they chose not to make that motion. They supported the one we're talking about tonight. Thank you. Any other questions for Craig or Angela? None? Um, did you get many um, commercial tubers at these two meetings? Great question. Our commercial river operators did attend a good amount of our Parks and Recreation Commission meetings regarding these topics. Okay. We, we got, you know, some public comments, public letters during this week that brought up some really good points. My question is, were those points brought up during these conversations and did you get that letter? Yes. Staff did receive the letter. Parks and Recreation Commission did discuss a lot of those points. 
and they weren't comfortable being that lenient. They wanted to do one change, see if we can notice the impacts before we make more substantial changes. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Anybody here for public comment on item 17? If so, please unmute yourself, give us your name and address. We'll give you three minutes. Anybody here to comment on the commercial tube and angling resolution? Nobody here? Okay. Then I will close public comment on item 17. So council, if there's no other questions, uh, I'd be happy to entertain some discussion, some comments, and then we can get a motion. I don't mind starting off with just some of my comments. Um, when this last came up, I was the one asking, why do we even have caps? Why, you know, why even, you know, if we can't explain why we had this in the first place, why not just get rid of them? Um, and so I really appreciate all the research that was done on all this, but it certainly just brought up more questions for me of, are we doing the right thing? Because it seems like so many of the answers were, well, we don't really know. We don't, we have no idea on this. We have no idea on that. And so I guess I would feel way more comfortable with a trial period. Um, I understand that we can change policies at any point in time. That's true about everything we do. I think it's more of whether or not we're setting, um, how we're communicating to the community and these commercial operators. If we're setting a policy, then that's something that they think that they can continue to rely on for a long period of time. If we do it as a trial period, they understand that if it goes well, we may put it into policy. And if it doesn't go well, it's gonna be reverted back. And I just, I think that I'd feel more comfortable doing that since there's so many questions and so many unknowns about the impacts that this may have. And I should say, I know that this is um, three different pieces. I'm talking very specifically about the um, flexing of the allotments. Um, of tubers, but that's my biggest consider. My biggest concern is just we don't know. Um, and then I do just want to point out again, like it was very concerning to me to see in the Parks and Rec Commission that nobody really brought up kind of this equality piece of there are people who don't have a lot of money in town and they do rely on some of these outdoor activities um, at a free amount to, you know, for their own fun and adventure in life. When I was growing up, I was one of those kids. Um, I couldn't afford to go to the commercial operators. So I just, I don't think that we should be saying private tubers should be gone. Um, I understand that we want to um, limit our impacts on our environment, but I think we just need to be mindful of that. Okay. Thank you. Other feedback, other comments or discussion? Nothing else? And Lisa, just to clarify, so are you saying you'd kind of like to do the trial period just to make sure we kind of set a, a time to revisit this and make sure we don't forget about it and we, we be sure we analyze it again in the fall or in the winter? I think that'd be great in the fall or the winter and just say, yep, congestion wasn't a huge deal. Um, our you know, water experts don't seem to have any concerns of the impacts that we saw because of this change. Um, let's go ahead and make this into policy versus making it into policy now and just reviewing it because then we'd actually have to revert it back. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Um, if you have a certain number that you have for the month and it rains five days, members of the public and members of the public that would go to the commercial outfitter all lose. But the, thought, the group of people that were going to go down on the river without using a commercial outfitter still get to go when the sun comes out. And the commercial outfitter lost those five days. Is that correct? Yes, the, if it's the end of the month and the commercial operator was planning on putting those allotments at a certain time, if it's in the middle or the beginning of the month, the commercial operator with this plan could flex them to later in the month. Okay, because I think that's fair in the respect to Liesl's point, some people can't or don't have the money to go to the commercial operator, but they've got the tube in their garage. And if it rains, they get the opportunity to go the next day, it's beautiful and sunny. And I think the commercial operator should also have that opportunity to um, utilize those slots 
that during the rainy time weren't, or whatever the bad weather might be that weren't used, or if they want to flex them differently between the week and the weekend. If it rains all week, we're going to have a lot of people on the river on Saturday, no matter what. So I think I, I don't disagree with Lisa though, possibly doing this as a, um, a pilot and then revisit it in the fall. So I'm good with it either way, but I like Lisa's thinking on it. Yeah, I think that makes some sense to me too. What about anyone else? Any other discussion on this? All right, then how about we get a motion on the floor? I'll move that we approve the staff's recommendation uh, to adopt this resolution. I'm assuming that's without making it a pilot for the first for the um, allotments. Um, I mean, I guess the question I would have back to that is, you know, does that really need to be in the motion for approval, or is this just sort of operational direction that we're giving the um, staff? I mean, I, I'm open to the idea of that, but I think. I don't think it's necessary in the motion. You could just direct staff to report back and forth. Yeah, fall. that's kind of what I was assuming. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by Macy's and a second by Crossan. And I assume that's also with direction to report back to us in the fall. Can I, can I get some clarification from Dan? I just, we do pilot projects all the time. If we don't think that there's any point to them, then why do we do them? I, the difference why do we do pilot the, projects? Why are, the difference between making it a policy tonight versus a, a kind of a pilot for a year tonight? Um, so my general understanding of why councils do that or why councils put sunset provisions on ordinances um, is to ensure that it makes it back to you. Um, but, you know, that's that's a good question. Yeah, Lisa, and I guess what I would say is that I have really high confidence in the staff that when we give them direction that we want to implement this and then we want to get a report and see how it's working and that, you know, I've never seen a situation in which we've asked that and they have not proactively brought it back to our attention. So I just am assuming that that would be the way it's always been and that we will see it after the first implementation of it. I, I'm just looking for consistency. We're going to be talking about e-bikes here soon for a pilot for a year. And um, it just seems like <laughs> if we're doing it for one, that consistently we should be doing it for the other, if that's really our intentions. Otherwise, we should just change a policy for e-bikes versus doing a pilot for a year. So I tend to agree with you, Liesl. I think there's no harm in doing a trial for a year and, and actually saying a trial period for one year. All right, so the motion is on the floor. And as I understand the motion, Sonia has disappeared, so. I'm in, I'm just plugging in, so I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Sonia and Robin, are you gonna accept that friendly that Heather and, and Liesl are suggesting on making this a, a one-year trial period? No. Well, I would accept friendly, but I would do it as more like either six or nine months to ensure that it comes back quickly and then it's it's off our docket. It's done one way or the other. And whether it's done in the fall or in January, I don't think we have to wait a year to have to bring it up again. We'll yeah, know the I, results quickly. I don't want to adopt the friendly because for one, this has been through such an extensive amount of public process. And um, honestly, I trust our staff to just bring it back to us. I don't feel as though we need to kind of micromanage our motions to include exact specific direction as to when we want to see these things. And, you know, to be consistent, we, we actually added something to our work session schedule previously that we didn't add into our motion. So, you know, my motion is just that we move forward with this as it's presented and that we ask the staff to bring it back once it's been implemented and let us know how it works. Okay. I'm still okay with that as a second. And, and, and my question is also on this is that what, if you decide to put a trial period on it, does it revert back to the way it is before we make this vote? For, and for me, honestly, more than anything, it's about our communication with the community. 
saying that it's a trial means that we have not made our decision yet and that commercial operators should not be just assuming this is going to be the same going forward. If we make it a policy, it's a policy. We actually have to actively change it to not be so anymore. And so I think to me, it's just, I have a huge question mark about whether or not this is the right thing to do because a lot of my questions weren't answered and not because Steph didn't try, it seems like they have some great educated guesses, but people don't know what the answer is yet. And so I'm not comfortable saying yes, 100%, let's do this. And that's what a trial period is for. We're gonna have a very similar conversation with e-bikes. A lot of questions about that too and whether or not we should do a trial. But I would imagine none of us wanna just do a policy for e-bikes and say, well, let's look at it again in three months, right? I, I just, to me, this is how we convey things to the community about whether or not we're trying them out or if it's a done deal. Okay, well, then let's call the question. I think we might have a split vote here. So I'm gonna go around one by one and see who votes how. So I'm gonna call on the people who made the motion first. Sonia, how do you vote on the motion? In support. Robin? Support. Okay, Kathy? Support. Okay, Liesl? I, I'm against it for my explanation. Not because I'm against the idea, but against how we're doing it. Okay, Heather? I'm against it, same reason for Liesl. Okay, Michael? I support it. All right, I, I would vote against it too, just because I'd rather it be a trial period, but that passes four to three. And so that passes four to three with Pettis, Sloop, and Lacey opposed. All right, thank you everyone. Okay, so that brings us to agenda item 18. This is our first reading of an ordinance, ordinance amending chapter 16 to add article one general provisions and article three regarding regulation of vehicles, horses and bicycles to the Steamboat Springs revised municipal code, providing an effective date and repealing all conflicting ordinances. Uh, so we have a presentation here with Craig and Angela. Again, I did want to note before we get into that, that we've obviously received very robust public comment on this. I do want everyone listening and in the public to know that we have received all those letters. We've read them. Uh, they are all in the packet. I think there was some concern from a few people that maybe not all the letters had made it. And as I understand it, staff has been working to update the rainbow packet and, and indeed all the letters that have been submitted are now part of that packet. And with that said, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Craig and Angela to give us a presentation. All right, good evening. One of your another big topics for the night. I'll give you a brief introduction, largely for our community that's watching and listening tonight. So City Council, we're gonna go back in time a little bit. City Council directed staff in the Parks and Recreation Commission to investigate use of e-bikes within our city trail system in September of 2019. In between September or October 2019 and October 2020, Parks and Recreation Commission met six different times to discuss how best to move forward. Within those six different Parks and Recreation Commission meetings in that 12 month period, um, there was six different articles in the Steamboat Pilot. We launched the Engage Steamboat website and had surveys up and also had some dialogue with the community there. We presented to the Route Recreation Roundtable and then had two follow-up conversations with them to keep them updated on the process. We coordinated with Route County writers. We established an email list of interested parties so we could send out email blasts whenever topics were coming back to Parks and Recreation Commission or when it was presented at the work session uh, to City Council this fall so we could receive direction that led us to tonight for this first reading. Um, and then we also had numerous social media updates. I didn't count those, but there was at least over 15 on where it was at with the process. Um, for all of the community that's listening tonight and that we have received feedback from in the past two weeks, this is a lot more public engagement than we had received through the Parks and Recreation Commission discussions. In that year of discussions in those six different meetings, we did have pretty good attendance and feedback during those meetings, but it was no no way the volume that we've received in the past two weeks. And those discussions were more kind of a 60-40 split on pros and cons, and it really depended on which meeting you were at, if it was leaning one way or the other when it came to e-bikes use on Emerald Mountain. So I think that's really important for our community to know 
that we're hearing very strongly right now a good amount of opposition towards e-bikes on Emerald, but we hadn't received that prior to two weeks ago. Um, staff's recommendation to allow e-bikes on Emerald Mountain that was based off of technical research and the public process to date of submitting these materials. I believe if staff and the Parks and Recreation Commission had received this level of community engagement and heard this community sentiment prior to the past two weeks and through that discussion period, that recommendation that's being presented to you tonight may have been a bit different. So with that, I will pass it off to Craig to explain in more detail the process that we went through and what you're considering to me. Thank you, Angela. Again, Craig Robinson, Parks, Open Space and Trails Manager. And as noted, we are here to talk about the approval of the first reading of an ordinance to implement a 15 mile per hour speed limit on specific trails. The uh, class one e-bike use on the Walton Creek Trail and the Yampa River Core Trail, which was previously passed via resolution through a trial period and process with city council back in 2019. It also talks about the uh, trial periods for the use of class two e-bikes on the Emperor River Core Trail and the Walton Creek Trail with a two-year trial. Class one e-bikes on neighborhood trails, specific neighborhood trails that we identified through a process in a one-year trial, and the use of class one e-bikes on Emerald Mountain with a one-year trial period. Uh, as Angela had noted, it was September 2019 when City Council asked for a general update on e-bike use. And at that time, we were also receiving requests from the public to, con to reconsider our policy that was in place on whether or not class, e -bike, class one e-bikes could be used on Emerald Mountain and other soft surface trails. Uh, staff was also observing the boom of class two e-bikes on the core trail and other areas. So we thought that uh, having that conversation in a public setting was relevant as well. Uh, we did have six Parks and Recreation Commission meetings during that time over that year long period. We provided updates and allowed for a public forum on engaged steamboat. We did some surveys. We provided this information and uh, requested input from route, the route recreation, recreation roundtable. And again, there was uh, an email list of interested parties that we kept up to date on the process. And also the steamboat pilot did six articles during that time period. Um, we did talk about the, Steamo, uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission's recommendations at the December 8th City Council meeting. And at that City Council meeting, the Council directed staff to bring these items back before you for the first reading of an ordinance. Well, we talked a little bit about this the first time around, but again, general concepts we heard from the public during this process in support of e-bike use noted that e-bikes make trails and recreation more accessible for people who are older in age and have health issues. Uh, the class two e-bikes in particular are being used more for transportation on the core trail, uh, running errands to the supermarket, going to friends' house, getting out of your automobile, which seems to be a good thing. Um, those people who have the e-bikes say, really, if you've ridden one, it's not a big deal. It's not much different. Um, the IMBA, International M Mountain Bike Association study, is actually kind of talked about on both sides of the discussion about whether or not there's really an impact from e-bike use on trails. And it is important to note that there's not really much data out there. It's a 2015 study that IMBA did, and it's important to note that they said that no broad conclusion should be made from our report, from our study. But they did find that there might be a slight, slight increase in erosion or impacts to trails under certain conditions with the use of e-bikes. But uh, again, that, that's something that I think further study is needed on. Um, people know, like they do with many conflicts and recreational issues, it's the person, it's the rider, it's not the e-bike or the device. Uh, we, they also note that the uh, many other communities have successfully implemented e-bike programs. And we talked about uh, Jefferson County and Boulder County in particular through our planning process where Jefferson County, um, they have about 250 50 miles of trail on, I think it's about 56,000 acres of open space. And they allow their class one and two bikes on all of their recreation trails. And the class one e-bikes are allowed on all of their single track multi-use trails. And as we talked to them about their program, they mentioned that it's a non-issue in their community and they uh, deal, deal more with dog issues and other uh, user conflict issues, not e-bikes. 
Uh, we also talked about Colorado Parks and Wildlife, a state agency which uh, implemented the order from the state of Colorado to allow class one and class two e-bikes um, in all of their areas where bicycles are allowed. So within the state parks today, you actually have class one and class two e-bikes used on many trails. And then there's multi-use single track trails as well where class e-bikes are allowed in those areas. Um, some of the public comment we heard about concerns and we heard about these in a lot of the emails we received recently. Um, they talk about the high rate of speed at which a e-bike can travel. Uh, that is going to bring more people to our trail systems where crowding is already a problem. We're going to see more of that. There's going to be more trail damage. There's going to be more user conflict. They see the motor on an e-bike as cheating and that it's not really a non-motorized device. And uh, after our December 8th city council meeting and the article that was done in the Steamboat Pilot, um, there was uh, some comments to city staff where uh, we had some emails and phone calls about opposition to use of e-bikes on Emerald Mountain. But in particular, as you've noted and Angela has noted, that we have received a lot of public comment in the past week and a half. And uh, I guess it's important to note here that had we had some of these people in the discussions throughout our entire process, there may be a different outcome, but certainly we would have been able to share a lot of this information that we're talking about tonight about the facts that e-bikes are allowed in these areas and it's up to a municipality to make the decision on whether or not they want to be there. Um, it sounds like we're hearing some strong opposition to the use of e-bikes on Emerald, but perhaps there's uh, avenues to still have them on other trails, depending on how you move forward. Uh, specifically within the ordinance language, uh, some of the legal uh, concerns that we've talked about, uh, the state of Colorado, the house bills uh, that they passed in 2017 classified e-bikes as distinct from motor vehicles and clearly said within that uh, house bill or state law that class one and class two e-bikes are allowed anywhere that bicycles are allowed unless prohibited by municipalities. So that's the process we're currently in right now. Many other communities are having the same discussion, whether there's trial periods, whether they're allowed, and uh, each community is making its own decisions. Uh, we talked about conservation easements throughout our process and locally the Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust is now the holder of the easements on Emerald. And those easements, um, the use of class one e-bikes is consistent with the approved uses that are allowed, which is bicycling. And that is consistent with state law and that is consistent with uh, use of e-bikes in mm -hmm. Uh, state parks and also in other counties where they have e-bike use on conserved parcels within their counties. Uh, people questioned whether or not, fun if a pro property was funded through Great Outdoors Colorado, whether or not e-bike use was allowed. And again, Great Outdoors Colorado has noted that each land management agency is allowed to determine, just like the state law says, whether they want to have e-bikes on those trails or not. Some people also question whether or not this would limit the ability for the city to obtain uh, trail maintenance endowment funds from the Yampa Valley Community Foundation. And after speaking with them and the board clarifying the issue, their board noted that it is up to the land manager to determine whether a trail is non-motorized or not. And in our case with the city of Steamboat Springs, regardless of the use of e-bikes on them, all of our trails are managed as non-motorized trails. Um, again, specifically within the ordinance language that you have before you tonight, chapter 16 of the Steamboat Springs Municipal Code is related uh, to specifically to parks and recreation. And in this case, we are creating three articles to uh, clarify the different items that are in there today. Um, some of it is general use, some of it relates to the river, and then again, some of it now relates to uh, bicycle use, motorized vehicles and equestrians. We also included the definition from the state of Colorado uh, for what each class one, two, and three e-bikes are. We clarified the resolution that was passed in 2019 by city council, allowing the use of class one e-bikes on the Upper River Corps Trail, the Walton Creek Trail. We noted that the 15 mile per hour speed limit was going to apply to these trails that we're talking about for e-bike use, but that that uh, 15 mile per hour speed limit applies to all use on those trails, not just e-bikes. It's a speed limit for everybody. 
Um, we also noted within the ordinance the trial periods that we've been talking about. And again, that's for the two-year trial period for the Core Trail and uh, Walton Creek Trail with Class 2 bikes. The one-year trial period on neighbor specific neighborhood trails that we've approved for uh, Class 1 e-bikes and the use of Class 1 e-bikes on Emerald Mountain for a one-year trial period. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Angela for wrapping this up. Wonderful. So again, Craig and I are here to answer any questions, receive direction on recommendations, and possible next steps for council to consider are approving the first reading of the ordinance, revising the ordinance language, or a third one, revising the ordinance of the language uh, for the second reading, removing the trial period for class one e-bikes on Emerald Mountain. All right. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Angela. Appreciate the presentation. And I'll see if council has any questions. Let's get started. Uh, Robin, did you have any questions for Angela or Craig? Um, it's on page 18.3, section four notes. It talks about um, the class one e-bikes on the following neighborhood and connector trails, Blue Sage, Butter Knife, Butcher Knife, Tamarack, Bear Creek, Fox Creek. Was there any, and I know you guys said there wasn't a whole lot of feedback prior to the last two weeks or so. Was there any feedback from the neighborhoods or neighbors on those trails possibly having e-bikes on them or a 15 mile per hour speed limit? The only comment that we received through the process with Parks and Recreation Commission was from the Sanctuary neighborhood, which was a trail that yeah. staff had proposed. And okay. uh, that was removed based on public comment. Okay. All right. And I think... Oh, the other question was on 18.2 in the middle um, and the paragraph where it's indented from the, at the December 8th meeting. Um, implement a one-year trial period allowing class one e-bikes on Blue Save da, 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 with the 15 mile per hour speedman. How wide are those trails? I'm not a biker. How wide are those trails in relationship to the trails on Emerald? Craig, you're muted. All right, I'm clicking back and forth. <laughs> um, a lot of those trails are six feet wide minimum. And so the Emerald trails are single track, so how wide are they? The majority of tra uh, trails on Emerald are single track. And, uh, you know, when we construct new trails these days, we try to build them at 36 inches, but inevitably they grow in a little bit. Um, I would say on average uh, 24 inches wide for the trail tread. All right, thank you. Michael, any questions from you? No questions. Okay, Liesl, any questions? Can you come back to me? It just flew out of my head. Sure. Uh, Sonia, what about you? Any questions? My question is just really for um, council. It's a procedural question and I don't need an answer right now, but I just want to, you guys to think a little bit about some of the points that are in the presentation, specifically House Bill 171151, we do have a subject matter expert in Diane Mitch Bush who basically co-wrote that bill, who could actually talk a little bit about its intent. Um, Gretchen Shaler, who's done a lot of work on these trails, and then we have a couple of other subject matter experts on the conservation easements and the intent behind them. So I'm just asking the council if, you know, as we get into public comment, I know we're gonna have a lot of it. If there are people who can specifically speak to the factual documents that are being presented to us here. Can we give them a little extra time if need be? Okay. Thank you. And um, Kathy, any questions from you? Just comments. Okay. Heather? None at this time. Thank you. All right. And no questions for me. So why don't we open it up? Lisa, for a I didn't public... remember my questions if you don't oh, mind. Oh yeah. Sorry, Liesl. That's okay. <laughs> um, Angela, I asked you this question via email, but if you could just kind of um, tell everybody what conversation there was around just making um, the class one e-bikes allowed on non-single track um, paths, because uh, I think that would be a good part of our discussion. Yes, happy to. The question was asked about allowing e-bikes on Emerald on the non-single track. So essentially Blackmere and Lane of Pain. And Parks and Recreation Commission did discuss this question or this consideration over a few different meetings. And those of you who are very familiar with the Emerald Net Trail System, it's a big network and it would be extremely 
confusing for the public and it would take a lot to properly educate the public on when you veer left, it's okay. When you veer right, it's not. And there would be an abundance of signs. So um, staff's recommendation and Parks and Recreation Commission's discussion was almost an all or nothing approach to Emerald Mountain due to the close network of trails. And then my other question um, is it appears that Parks and Rec actually voted it down to have e-bikes on Emerald three to two. Um, and you guys said that you did not get a lot of this negative feedback at that time. And it sounds like from any of our emails that um, people did not know that that conversation was going on at Parks and Rec. And um, Craig just made the comment that you guys decide not to do sanctuary based upon kind of the negative feedback. So I'm curious, have you guys changed your position at, as, at all as staff? Um, or are you still feeling that this is appropriate to go forward? You're putting us on the spot. We've had numerous discussions. Um, we try not to give reactionary responses as staff. The public sentiment to, I've heard a lot in conversations with the community in the last two weeks of the soul of Emerald Mountain. And I, by all means, am a recreationalist up there too and feel the soul of Emerald Mountain. But it's staff's job to really look at facts and the scientific evidence that we know so far on e-bikes and what it can do in its impacts to the trails. Um, but we have not, we have not changed our recommendation, but we by all means understand the public pushback. And if Parks and Recreation Commission, this, the vote was 3-2, there are eight Parks and Recreation Commission members and we had heard from the other ones over the course of the other meetings. So it was, it was a pretty divided conversation. Um, but no, at this point we have not changed our recommendation, but we've, we've considered it. Mm -hmm. So council, I'm wondering, um, you know, if it might make some sense for us to, you know, obviously the big issue of discussion seems to be the trial period on Emerald. And I'm wondering if it would make some sense to give some indication for, to the public from each of us and how we're leaning on that idea right now to help shape the public comment. Would, would the council be interested in doing that? Just as a, a, great kind of a straw discussion? Yes. I have a question before we get into that. Oh, sure. Um, I've been listening to a lot of school board meetings lately since I really enjoy Zoom meetings. And um, they have a part of their forum for public comment where they have a speaker who kind of defines like a core group of opinions that has 10 minutes in lieu of three to make a statement and then kind of like offsets the, I agree with what she just said, I'm just gonna say the same thing again. Is there a way that we could do that this evening to kind of stave off, how many people are on right now, 80, 56 comments and make sure that collectively they are heard and realizing that, you know, we, we've heard and read everything and have been talking to people on the phone. Yeah, well, so for me, I thought it might be a good idea to help focus the comments by giving some indications on how council's leaning first. And I think if we're going to change public comment process, we should probably make that a decision we outline in the packet. Uh, process and procedure and all that good stuff. So I, for me tonight, I, what I'd like to do, and maybe it would help again to shape any public people that would like to make public comment, I'd like to hear just initial feedback from council just on how you're feeling on the, the trial period for Emerald. And Robin, I see your hand up, so why don't you go ahead and start? Well, uh, what I was going to suggest is we have four things before us. And if we went around the room on one, the 15 mile an hour speed limit, and we all kind of did our straw poll, and then on two for the trial period, then all of the members of the public have heard kind of where we think we're going on all four because they could be commenting on the other ones as well. Right. So yeah, that's a good idea. So maybe Angela, could you bring up, I think there was a page in the, in the presentation that had the kind of four items under consideration, you or Craig, if you could bring that up. 
I really liked your approach, Jason. You know, we've received the most public comment about Emerald specifically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it's really helpful to hear from the public before I'm making decisions. And, you know, we've got a lot of people here who have something to say and sure. it's, it's almost nine o'clock. So if we're going to entertain them for another 15, 20 minutes with our conversation, I'd rather hear from them, frankly. I, I these folks think, have been on since five o'clock. I think the community likes to hear at least where we're starting off from. So I like your idea, Jason. Let's just go around quick. Nobody take 15 minutes, you know, just. Yeah, let's make it quick. Second. Council, we can be quick too. We don't have to always have a, you know, Abraham Lincoln stump speech every time we uh, need to have a few comments. So Jason, why don't you run through? Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jason. Could I interrupt real quick? One point yeah. I forgot to make during my presentation that I think is important for you and the community to hear is that the Americans with Disability Act does allow for the use of mobile motorized devices like e-bikes to be used on areas like Emerald Mountain. So if we were to go down the road or the core trail or wherever it is, so if we were going to, to go down this road um, and not approve the use of e-bikes on Emerald Mountain, people who have disabilities accord, and, and meet the definition within the Americans with Disabilities Act would be allowed to use their uh, e-bikes up there. Um, the fact that this is, if this is approved via ordinance, staff has signage up, but we will definitely reiterate one way or the other, however this is moving forward, with even more clear signage to, to reemphasize the decision that council and the community is making moving forward. But we would also note that uh, with an asterisk or whatever, that if it's no e-bikes allowed, unless otherwise provided by or accommodated by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So just want to be very clear on how that would move forward and what it would look like. Okay, thank you. Liesl, how are you leaning on these items just for now? And we'll, we, will, we will definitely take public comment and as many people who, as we would like, we'll, we'll do that. But Liesl, I'm, how are you leaning? I'm probably gonna stir some public comment because I think I'm leaning towards the trial period. Um, I think Gary made a great statement of, um, this is a great equalizer by allowing class one bikes for people who may not otherwise be able to go up the hills. I will say I got a lot of compelling concerns about the e-bikes. Um, so I am happy to hear the comments, but I think it's very important for people just to know where we're sitting at before they start going. Okay. Sonia, did you want to make any comments or you want to withhold? I'll comment later, thanks. Okay. Kathy, did you want to give any comments on how you're leaning right now? Yeah, I think the um, Emerald Mountain trial is a non-starter for me. Um, primarily because what Liesl just said, I probably fall into one of those categories and to take a 50 pound bike up there. And if I'm not that familiar, um, I think it's a safety issue. I think it's a practical issue. And I just, I don't see the compatibility. I don't think we need to study it. I'm not in favor of number five. Okay, thank you. Heather, what about you? Um, well, I brought up the 15 mile an hour speed limit when we did the trial on the core trail three years ago and was <laughs> shut down. So <laughs> I'll definitely support that. Um, and as much as everything else, I am going to punt because I really and truly am really, I don't have an opinion yet. I've been trying desperately to stay open and focused and I really want to hear both sides again tonight before I form my final thoughts. Okay. And Robin, what about you? Um, I lean towards the way Kathy feels about it, and I'll have comments for it when we get there. Okay, Michael? Um, yeah, I'm all for the first four, but not the uh, Emerald Mountain. And the reason, and I and I hear that point that um, Craig, you just brought up regarding the, the American Disabilities Act, but I, I just have to follow um, this, the Colorado State Law, the HB 17, 1151 allows us to make that decision as a, a governing body. But the one thing that I thought was really key was we got a, a letter from Larry and he said that what we ought to do, a uh, suggestion I think we should talk about it briefly, is get uh, another trail that's just for e-bikes so we have a control to see if it does do anything. So that's kind of where I'm at, but I'm not at all about number five. Okay. Yeah, and that's kind of where I'm leaning to. I'm leaning that the first four seem to make some sense, but I think on number five, I'll, I'll save my comments about that in detail later, but 
I would hold off on that one right now. So with all that said, that's kind of where council's leaning right now, but we're happy to take some public comment. So um, I'm going to open the floor and give, if you could give us your name and address and we'll give you three minutes. And I see Diane Mitch Bush has her hand up. So Diane, thank you for staying faithfully with us. I think you've been with us since the beginning and uh, congratulations to you on that. And I'll give you the floor and we'll give you three minutes. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Jason. Good evening, everyone. I'm Diane Mitch Bush. I live at 65 Spruce Street in Steamboat Springs. I've lived in Steamboat Springs since 1976, and I've ridden mountain bikes on Emerald since the mid 80s. Section four, bullet two of the ordinance before you tonight would allow class one e-mountain bikes on the North Emerald Conservation Easement for one year. Please vote no on that. Uh, Introducing class one motor assisted bikes on our unique backcountry trails on an existing conservation easement where hundreds of people hike, bike, and run every day is a recipe for disaster. These trails have long been designated as non motorized and conservation easements and purchase agreements in prior city parks and rec master plans. This legally re recorded conservation easement for this property in 1996 2011, as well as the GoCo grant the city got to buy that North Emerald conservation parcel from the Orton family at a bargain basement price, all stipulate that this area would be open only to low impact non motorized recreation. In 2020, our Parks and Rec Commission voted not to allow Class 1 e-bikes on Emerald. The recent city survey uh, residents found the majority strongly opposed to allowing Class 1 e-bikes on Emerald. Some have claimed that House Bill 17, 1151 defines e-bikes as, quote, non-motorized, so it's okay with the conservation easement. In fact, that is not the case. I co-sponsored that bill. I was the chair of the House Transportation Committee. We had long discussions about exactly what we were doing. What we were doing is focusing on roads, on paved paths, and on intersections. Uh, we are emphatically not stipulating in that bill or intending in that bill uh, to exclude mountain bikes from statutory definitions of motorized vehicles. The only way they're quote, excluded, and staff has talked about this for all the pages and uh, people have commented on it this evening, in fact, the only way in which we wanted them excluded, quote unquote, is for driver and vehicle licensing. It's because we didn't want to have to have e-bike people get a driver's license special for that and vehicle licensing. This section was never intended to define non-motorized or motorized use on single track trails like what we're talking about here. It pertains only to roads, highways, and paved commuter trails with intersections. Please strike the first whereas from the ordinance. It is inaccurate. Regarding trail degradation, we, we've heard about the IMBA study tonight, and it's focused on throughout that long packet. And thank you, by the way, for reading all these long packets. The data in figure five, page 17 of the actual study, to which you have a link, show that as the test approached 500 laps in the one day study, one day study, the difference between trail erosion degradation from e-bikes and regular mountain bikes becomes increasingly larger, indeed exponentially larger. In real life, what does that mean? It means that the cumulative negative impacts day after day in berm tight curves on soft loamy soil on Emerald would increase the trail erosion and trail degradation exponentially. Uh, many have spoken about, you know, access for people who are old, I'm one of those old people, uh, or for people with disabilities. There are many nearby trails, both in state parks, as Craig said tonight, uh, uh, on the ski area, uh, the Continental Divide Trail, many Forest Service trails throughout our area that provide countless varied trail opportunities for e-mountain bike users right now seeking single track. Allowing class one e-bikes on North Emerald Conservation Easement Parcel will degrade the special, special character of this area and the beloved unique user experience on Emerald and set the stage for more user conflicts. Please vote to remove that section from the ordinance before you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Anybody else here for public comment on agenda item 18? If so, give us your name and address. We'll give you three minutes. Hello, I see some Sam Rush. Yeah, I'm Gretchen, yes. Hi, Gretchen. Hi, my name is Gretchen Shaler, 1383 Manitou Avenue. 
um, I live at the doorway of a trailhead. Um, I have something to read here if I may, and then I want to add a few more comments to it. You want me to sit down? Sure. <laughs> um, Whatever works for you. Okay. <laughs> the Emmer Mountain Trail Vision began in 1989. Rob Worrell started the Mountain Bike Race series that was held on area trails that needed serious improvement due to poor design. Mark Shaler and I believe that we could have made a difference partnering with the U.S. Forest Service, BLM, and City of Steamboat Springs, and various other community groups to create a trail system that is today. 32 years ago, we started this. Mountain biking was a different experience. There were horse trails, game trails to ride on, not designated for bikes. Working with the Parks and Recs Director, Jeff Nelson at the time, and I had the ability to walk into his office because I was running the, the mountain bike race series at the time, asking if we could start changing the trails. And he always said no, <laughs> until one day he said yes. So I had, the door was open. So we, um, uh, where, where am I? So we rerouted a trail named Brian's Worry because it was so steep and so scary to go down to a safer, more sustainable trail. That was one of the first trails we did on Emerald. With the community land managers, Mark and I worked hard to create the trail system on Emerald and other areas within the Yampa Valley. It wasn't easy. We had to know boundaries of where public land and private land intersected. We had to know how to interpret appropriate terrain the, the, for future trails, and most of all, how to talk and listen to people that shared our vision for a trail system that would withstand time and use. And the use part of it is pretty incredible. Larry's, we've done very little trail work on it forever since we put it in. Larry Johnson worked with us to reach out to Lyman Orton. Together, we developed a trail system through his property. I went to the state land board to see how we could build trails on that land. It took more than 10 years and many dedicated people and organizations that got involved. And now we have four mountain bike trails on state land, now BLM land. Mark and I made it our mission to learn as much about trail building quality, about building quality cross-country trails. We went to three IMBA trail schools and learned trail building techniques, grade reversals, which at the time was the Forest Service standard on how to build trails. We were getting good at it too. We had several of our own IMBA trail building courses that were taught here. We, we created protocols for turns that worked out best for the train, our absorbent soils, community use. MGM is one of the first trails that Mark and I built solely with our dog, Micah, MGM trail on Emerald. Building trails took a lot of sweat equity from the community. It was all done in the old days with volunteer help. And in that, we have had thousands of people in the last 32 years show up to help us build trails. We put out the word, and it's sometimes we had 30 people show up at a trail work day. Then local businesses started to support the efforts by providing lunches for their trail work day. It came out, if you ride a bike, you owe one trail work day a year to help keep the trails in good shape. Uh, Winter Sports Club, their kids started doing it, came out to learn community service and how to contribute to the trail system that they use. Mark and I started this project 32 years ago to celebrate the showcase of the Gem of Emerald Mountain. Our intent was to invite all users in a respectful way that was non-motorized, would maintain the end would maintain the historic use of the network and could bring people together to appreciate what we have. Please help preserve this place by honoring the dedication of my husband, Mark, and myself. Also, some of the trails on Emerald link into the BLM land and their rules are different. Wild Rose, the first 440 feet, I believe, is, is city land. The rest of it is BLM land. How do you do a change? There's no, there's no e-bikes on, on that part on the BLM side. 
how is the city going to control the use of going through by allowing e-bikes on one trail partway through on another trail and not allow it on the second trail. Um, so I really ask if you guys would say no, because the intent of the building of that trail work system, that, of that trail system was done with very many people in the public that dedicated their time, gave their time to build a, an, an epic trail system. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Gretchen, appreciate it. All right, and I see that we have a hand up from Elliot Orton. So Elliot, I'm gonna let you jump in and give us your comments. If you could give us your name and address. Thank you. Um, I just say thank you to, to Gretchen and Diane for what they said. And it's incredible to, to feel the, the energy up on Emerald. And it certainly comes because of all the hands that went into building those trails and, and all the spirits that brought good energy to that place. Um, I'm Elliot Orton. I'm sorry I'm not running video. I'm on a pretty bad um, satellite connection here up on the side of Emerald. I live at 38625 Soul Center Way. Um, if you look at Wikipedia, it defines e-bikes as the electric motor powered version of motorized bicycles. They have a small electric motor that powers the bicycle. They are motorized bicycles. I think we shouldn't get hung up on the fuel source. There will be all kinds of things that today we would consider motorized by gasoline that will be powered by electricity, that by powered by batteries. We're gonna have snowmobiles are being built now. There are dirt bikes already that you can buy that are powered by electricity. These are motorized vehicles. And so I'm here on behalf of my family to speak against the proposal ordinance to allow e-bikes on the North Emerald Conservation Easement. Specifically, my father Lyman Orton's prior property, which he gets sold to the city of Steamboat Springs. My father has written to all of you uh, city council members um, a letter, uh, which was in your packet tonight, opposing this proposal. We could all argue what class of motorized bicycles would be appropriate. We could discuss accessibility. We could argue about enforcement. We could talk about whether or not this is a big deal. And we could all argue about an unknown future. But what we can't argue about are the, the wishes of Lyman Orton when he stated that no motorized vehicles would be allowed on this property, which was legally bound through a conservation easement and agreed to by the city of Steamboat Springs at the time of purchase. Now, I, I served on the board of the Vermont Land Trust for eight years and two as board chair. Uh, the Vermont Land Trust is one of the premier land conservation organizations in the country. And they've conserved and stewarded over a thousand easements. Um, land conservation easements are sacred. They're legal transactions and they run with the land. And that means that they apply to all future owners of that land from the day that they're written. And they need to be honored to the original wishes of the grantor and to recommend going against those wishes is concerning. In some cases, the grantor is no longer alive and their wishes must be interpreted. However, in this case, I can assure you that the grantor, Lyman Orton, is very much alive and has written to you all and ask you to uphold the conservation easement that he created and that no motorized vehicles, including motorized bicycles, be allowed on this property. In closing, I just would like to take a moment publicly to thank my father Lyman for his incredible vision and generosity. And I think if it weren't for him, uh, you know, so much of Emerald Mountain Park that we know today, it, it wouldn't exist as it is. It's a, it's a crown jewel of Steamboat Springs and it's a shining example of paying it forward. And I think we all owe him a great deal of gratitude. I want to thank all the council members for listening, for your service to our community, for everybody being here tonight. Um, it's great to see this process in action and very fortunate to live in a community that has this process. So thank you. All right. Thank you for your comments, Elliot. Appreciate it. All right. Anybody else like to make any comments? Looks like uh, Julie McFadden. It's yeah, Julie's husband, John Kowalski here. At yeah, Fort hey, John. How's it going? Thanks. Thank you guys for being here, everyone. I'm um, not Julie, but uh, <laughs> she's, she's here. Um, so thanks, everybody, for being here. And, um, you, you know, we live at 420 Storm Mountain Court here in town. 
And there's a great deal of talk about the leveling of the playing field. And with that said, the American with Disabilities Act seems to appropriately cover, appropriately cover those who wish to participate who are physically unable. And there's plenty of trails that other people, that they, they can hit if they want to. Emerald is a very, very sacred spot in our town. I've lived here since 1998 and it always has been and Gretchen has done so much work. And I, uh, I see it as a safety issue up there for the e-bikes. I don't feel like, the, I, I feel like there's zero compatibility. Um, and I just really feel that it's gonna foster user conflicts and it's gonna change the dynamic of one of the most special places to ride a bike in, in our state. Uh, I really enjoy riding my bike everywhere, as some of you know, but Emerald is such a special place. Out of wherever you go, if it's Crested Butte or Aspen or Durango, there's really nothing like it. And I think it really is something in our community that we have the opportunity to uphold and keep it really, really special. So that's, that's all I got. So thanks, okay. everyone. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. All right, looks like I have a hand up from Soren Jesperson. Hello, Soren, I think you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself and give us your name and address. Hi, sorry, this four hours it has taken its toll. Uh, my name is Soren <laughs> Jesperson. I live at 40360 Anchor Way. Uh, I've been in Steamboat for 12 years. Uh, I just, it's hard to follow Diane and Gretchen and and the Orton family, I appreciate all you've done for Emerald Mountain and, and all Emerald Mountain's done for Steamboat. It's, it truly is a gem. Uh, and so thanks a lot and thanks for letting me talk today. I wanna to talk about a few things. I sent a letter to city council last week. Uh, it's uh, a lot of that letter focused on the process uh, of how we're getting here to the first reading today. Um, I did participate in parks and recreation meetings. I did participate in the engaged Steamboat process, including the survey and the comment period. And if anything, those things revealed that not only is allowing e-bikes on Emerald Trails highly controversial, that the public sentiment has always been strongly against allowing e-bikes on Emerald Trails. Um, uh, you know, that's been clear throughout the process. And just because we're at a first reading doesn't mean that process is over. This is the process. And so although you've gotten a lot of feedback in the last two weeks, that's not last minute feedback. That's feedback in the process that should be considered. And, and it was really, um, uh, nice to hear city staff uh, today recognize that feedback uh, and and uh, somewhat amend their uh, message about uh, the possibilities on Emerald. Um, it was also nice to hear about uh, the clarification on the ADA access. Obviously, those of us that work on public lands and on trails and recreation know the ADA does uh, have the provisions to allow uh, people with disabilities to access our trails. City policy currently allows uh, uh, people with disabilities or uh, uh, differently enabled people to uh, access Emerald Trails. And um, so thank you for, for clarifying that, uh, Craig and Angela. Um, this isn't a referendum on e-bikes. Obviously, this is about keeping Emerald non-motorized and keeping it special. There, I, I work on public lands policy. I work on Forest Service and BLM lands. E-bikes are currently allowed on any motorized trail uh, in on both BLM and Forest Service lands, trails and roads. Um, E-bikes, because of their motor assist, allow uh, users to go places where normal mountain bikes can't go, and that includes roads and trails and motorized trails. There are uh, hundreds of miles of roads and trails around Steamboat that e-bike users of all abilities can access. Uh, and so this, by not allowing e-bikes on Emerald, in no way uh, inhibits e-bike users from recreating in and around Steamboat Springs. Um, we've heard a little bit about enforcement uh, in previous presentations we've heard from city staff that well people are using Emerald anyway and so uh, you know and it's hard for us to enforce so we're going to allow it. Um, you know that's obviously bad policy that's bad policy making um, especially when we're considering just allowing class one e-bikes on Emerald. Class one e-bikes are, are difficult to differentiate from class two and three e-bikes. Um, the easiest way to, to, uh, to enforce something is not to allow them at all. Um, and uh, rather than just allowing one class, that's, a, that, um, you know, that's, that's how you enforce. You don't just allow one class. That, that'd be impossible to enforce up there. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, crowding. Obviously, we saw even during a pandemic, uh, the Emerald was more crowded than ever. This is the new norm uh, when the 
when the pandemic, uh, God willing, goes away, uh, Emerald's going to be crowded and it's going to be crowded forever. This is allowing another use up there. Um, e-bikes, although some people have both, there are a lot of people that just ride e-bikes and will just ride e-bikes. This is going to contribute to parking problems uh, in Fairview. It's going to contribute to conflicts between uh, motorized and non-motorized users. It's going to contribute to conflicts with wildlife, which is another reason there's an easement up there. Uh, and it's going to contribute to winter recreation conflicts. That's an issue that hasn't been brought up much in our conversations yet, but there are people biking on Emerald more and more every winter. Uh, and now you're going to add e-bike use, uh, motorized e uh, bicycle use in the winter time, and that's going to certainly uh, lead to more uh, conflicts up there. Um, we also heard earlier, some point earlier in the meeting, that there's no harm in a trial. Um, I, I want to um, request that uh, that we don't have any trial uh, for e-bikes on Emerald. A one-year trial period is going to be really hard to undo. Um, you know, there's it's common behavioral economic theory, or any parent will tell you that it's a lot easier not to give somebody something than to take it away after you give it to them. That's what I trust you give a cookie to your seven-year-old daughter and try to take it away rather than not give it. Uh, it's a lot harder and uh, to take it back. And so a trial is just passing the buck to somebody else. Uh, and we have an election coming up. You, we have heard the process. This has been a year and a half process. Now's the time to make the decision to protect Emerald, to keep it the gem it is, uh, and, and to, to allow it to provide for the people of Steamboat our kids like it provided for us uh, and the people that have spoken earlier. So thanks a lot for the time. I appreciate it. appreciate all the public comment and thanks city staff for doing this. Uh, and let's keep Emerald non-motorized. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Soren. Anybody else like to make some comments? I see a hand up from Joan D. Joan, you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself. Yep. Okay. Oh, there thank you go. Yeah. Joan Donham, 1327 Manitou. Um, yes, been here since riding on bikes like Diane since the mid eighties up on Emerald. Um, and we all know Emerald is special, but I'll just attack it more from the safety concern. Um, those bikes are very heavy. I think Kathy mentioned it. Um, you know, you can't get them under 50 pounds, I don't think. And then in a full suspension e-bike is like, we're talking 65 pounds, <laughs> you know, and so I just see the day when the tourists come and they rent those <laughs> and they take them up Emerald and they don't know how to ride a mountain bike number one, let alone when they come up behind me, you know, cause they're gonna be going faster and then I'm supposed to get out of the, their way. So I have to get my bike, which I can lift and get off. But then, then they have to be able to pass me on a single track. It's not gonna happen. The same way if I'm coming uphill those people coming down have to get out of my way, correct? Well, this all works great up there now. It's amazing how well it works up there. Anybody that rides up there, it's just amazing. All these people up there and there's no conflict because everybody, ever, everybody knows it's all two way, watch out. And our bikes are light enough, we can lift them a little bit off the trail to let people come and go. These bikes are heavy. If somebody decides, oh, I'm gonna be on the downhill side and try to move, they're just gonna roll down the hill. I mean, that bike is heavy. They're not gonna be able to just scoot it over a little ways. And then for me to go by them, and it's the same going the other way. So that's, I, I just, it's just, there's just so much I see as conflict about it. Plus everybody says how quiet they are. Well, as we know, there are maybe a few up there. And oftentimes I'm up there hiking with my dog. And my dog has alerted to the sound of an e-bike from way back because it's a little high pitch if you if you hear them, you know, so it's a motor, you know, it's a sound. And my dog will hear that sound coming from a long way away. And I'm going, what, what? I, you know, she stops and alerting to something. And, uh, and sure enough, here comes an e-bike. And so that's wildlife, okay? So that's a sound that's different up there too. To, just a little something else to think about because it's a motor, you know, it's a motor. And that's all I want to say. I, it's a big safety conflict. Okay, thank you very much. Do thanks, not Joan. I propose no e-bikes on Emerald. Thank you. All right, thanks for sticking with us tonight. All right, and I think I saw a hand up from Scott McFarland. Yes, sir. I didn't know if you could see me or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 
I didn't get through all 256 pages of uh, history, and uh, my apologies. Well, first of all, I'm, uh, my name is Scott McFarland. I live at 1847 Hunter's Court in Steamboat Springs. I've lived here 42 years. Um, I have I own a mountain bike, which is now hanging in the garage, and I have an e-bike. Um, I had one for two years. I've ridden all over, uh, probably close to 17, 1800 miles on the trails. A lot of what has been said tonight is, um, I think, lacking in education. Um, I frankly, the bike I use is a class one e-mountain bike, full suspension. Um, I can do everything, I can do more with that bike than I can with my existing conventional bike. Um, I think we're making a mountain out of a molehill here. I think our bigger problem with Emerald, maybe uh, trails that go up to uh, Buffalo Pass, I think the problems are going to probably be more just the, the increase in public use of our amenities that we have here. And COVID uh, has increased it drastically. I don't ride, um, similar to skiing here on uh, on weekends, I don't ride those trails when there are a lot of people. I don't like to be on the trails when there are a lot of people. I met, I did a little study last year. I did, I did a lot of riding on uh, Spring Creek. And I probably interfaced over the time, over the whole summer, probably a thousand people. Um, I think I counted on one hand, six people yelled at me because they were mountain bikers. They were avid, conventional mountain bikers. Most people didn't know I was riding one. A class one bike, a pedal assist bike that doesn't move unless you pedal it. It's more of a, even though it has a motor, as everybody's calling it, it's, it's really... I think it's really something more along the lines of of making uh, better gearing to allow you to go up a hill easier. I don't ride up that, that any faster than I rode up before. I ride up at four to five miles per hour, and I ride down without it turned on. Um, I think I think that it's really. I don't know about class two throttle type bikes, but I can say for a class one bike that's pedal you have to pedal to operate. I consider it an improvement in technology. I would have I would have bought one 30 years ago because, quite frankly, I'm not a Uber athlete, and I don't have the ability to convert the oxygen we have up here to the the energy level that other mountain bikers who are, who are you know much better athletes than myself. The reality is now you know no, no different than we have. Um, you know, in, in our evolved in technology with skiing, with wider skis. We have snowboards up there. I like snowboards. No, I don't like snowboards. But the reality is they're there. It's a, it's an improvement. It brought a lot more people to the sport. And as far as the weight of the bike, having ridden that many miles, actually, I can probably honestly tell you an, an impact study that I did personally. At the the it is a misnomer to think that there's going to be you know, additional impact to the existing trail system. Frankly, going uphill, you're going to spin out less with a with a, with a pedal assisted bike. Than you are without one. Um, I think the problem with with the, uh, the the trail degradation, which will continue to happen, has a lot more to do with the speed and the aggressiveness of the rider. That's what's wearing the trails out. Um, and that's going to happen whether there's pedal assist bikes up there or not. So I, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the e-bikes. I think our, our our problem in Steamboat now is probably that we have to stop our marketing, and we probably have to look at how we're going to manage throngs of people that have discovered this place, especially in the past year. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Scott. Anybody else here for public comment on the e-bikes? I see Michael Kent. I see your hand up. 
you could unmute yourself and give us your name and address. I'll give you three minutes. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Mike Kent. I live at 40465 Haven Place. Um, I agree with everybody's comments tonight except for Scott's, and <laughs> I don't want to, I don't think it's a pro e bike, anti e bike discussion that we're having here. I think it's an Emerald Mountain discussion. And I think Scott misses that point. Uh, I think we're talking about Emerald Mountain. And rather than reiterate what everybody has already said tonight, which I agree with, um, there's just a couple things I don't understand. And I don't know if I'm the only one that finds it kind of, I don't even understand why this is an open topic for discussion about allowing motorized vehicles on Emerald Mountain. Um, just briefly, uh, in 2008, the city of Steamboat Springs adopted an open space and trails master plan. And the very first line, the very first line relating to the goals of the trail system on page 31 states, quote, to create a multi-use year-round non-motorized trail system. The current city of Steamboat Springs Parks Recreation Open Space Trails and Yampa River Management Plan dated August of 2019 states that Emerald Mountain Trails are, quote, intended solely for non-motorized use, unquote. So, so I want to say is just, I mean, I submit there is value in non-motorized areas. Um, for example, like, like with the recent announcement of a uh, ski core Altera's plans, for what they want to do up on the, the ski area. Um, I think there's going to be increased uh, desire and value on preserving non-motorized, non-circus atmosphere areas. So I think they're only going to become more crucial and valued as time goes on. Um, so I find it kind of ironic that this is even open for discussion. Um, Currently, I see, I just read the other day that there's a new master plan being developed for the mountain area and the city's accepting public comments to help develop um, such master master plan. But I, I, it's almost kind of what's the, the point when the city doesn't even acknowledge their own master plan for Emerald Mountain, but totally states non-motorized. Um, so that's basically my point. I, I just hope the city council has the wisdom and the foresight to preserve Emerald Mountain as non-motorized as it was intended uh, for us and for future generations. So thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. I see two more hands up. So I see Lorraine Martin. Lorraine, please unmute yourself. Give us your name and address. We'll give you three minutes. Sure, can someone raise a hand if you can hear me? Yep, we hear awesome. you. Great, this is Lorraine Martin. My address is 26050 Vista Valley Court. Um, I just wanted to speak up really quickly on a point that was mentioned earlier. I wanna issue a small correction or adjustment to maybe what you had heard. Um, Forest Service and BLM land in the Steamboat area currently does not allow e-bikes to be traveling on single track trails unless they are designated as motorized. So I think that's pertinent to this discussion when we consider uh, the special recreation management area that exists on the backside of Emerald. Uh, that is BLM land. The conversation that circulates more broadly around BLM um, is that e-bikes are coming more into acceptance. Um, so the, I think that the outlook on that side of things is that, is that eventually we might see them on that side, but everything is going to change jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So um, just something to keep in mind. Okay, thank you, Lorraine. And I see a hand up from Chris Hagen Boo. Chris, would you unmute yourself and give us your name and address? We'll give you three minutes. Chris, are you there? Chris, I see your hand up, but I don't see you. Hey, can hey. you hear me now? Yep. All right, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in here. Um, my name's Chris Hagenboo, 2685 Long Thong Road Steamboat. And I do not think uh, e-bikes should be allowed on Emerald Mountain for many reasons. And, and for now, I'd just like to discuss two of the primary reasons. Um, first and foremost, public safety. And second, the land use sustainability. 
I have been teaching at the ski area, teaching skiing for 43 years and snowboarding. And the number one thing that is embedded in every ski instructor and snowboard instructor is safety. How to be safe, what it looks like, what it feels like, and why it's so important. I've been riding a bike on the Emerald Mountain for 42 years, and I am concerned about my own safety and the public safety. When ski areas were first allowed to put lifts in, the contingency was that ski areas had to provide instruction so people didn't go up the mountain and kill themselves. Anyone can rent an e-bike, anybody can rent skis, but it doesn't mean anyone knows how to use them. Motorcycle traffic on single track trails is not compatible with pedestrians trying to attempting to use the same trails. This is a high risk proposal. You know, I'm lucky I've only had two mountain bike collisions myself in over the years. Once a teenager ran into me coming down Spring Creek going fast and not looking ahead. And then in Park City, I was going uphill around a corner and a downhill rider T-boned me, knocked me off my bike, and he went down hard trying not to hit me. His arm was bleeding, he was sure he broke his wrist, and neither one of us blamed each other. It just happened suddenly. I would be very gun shy of coming around a corner and having a motorcycle coming up the hill at me with speed and with a beer cooler in her luggage rack. That's a lot to run into. It hurts just thinking about it. I'm also concerned about alcohol use because that's what kids do these days. I ran over a beer can and see me today, but most mountain bike riders do not put six packs in their backpack because it's extra weight. Motorized bikes, no problem. People will do it. It will happen. As far as the um, the matter of the e-bikes, you know, suggested that it's just a um, certain type of e-bike, every e-bike will be up there. There is no way to control it. With the land use front, impacts caused by overuse happens and, and it will happen. Right now, MPR has washboards, dangerous holes. Some of the turns are blowing out, also a safety issue, but it's also damaged to the point where I can't get my friends to ride it with me anymore. And it, it's not sustainable to allow motorcycles without having annual maintenance budget and a maintenance plan. You can't just put motorcycles out there and do nothing to maintain the trails. It's not fair to the people who volunteer to bear, 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 build the trails themselves, and it's not fair to the users. We need to be environmentally responsible as a community. I'm happy to volunteer to fund and build e-bike trails in the meantime, and as everybody knows, there's endless trails people can ride. E-bikes are new and new trails need to be developed with specific criteria for line of sight, one-way traffic designations, difficult ratings, and public safety. I appreciate your time and consideration and if you have questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. And it uh, looks like I have one more hand up, Sandy Kent. Do you want to give us your name and address? We'll give you three minutes. Okay, uh, Sandy Kent. I'm at 40465 Haven Place. Um, a lot of things that people mentioned I agree with. It kind of ruined my three-minute speech that I was going to give, so I'm not going to repeat everything. I do have one thing to add that has not been said. Um, maybe I should start with I strongly urge City Council to ban e-bikes on Emerald Mountain, so that's my position. Um, I just want to talk about another area in Colorado that's similar to Emerald Mountain, and that is um, the Sky Mountain Park and Snowmass, very similar to Emerald Mountain. That's governed by uh, Pitkin County Board of County Commissioners. Um, it's very uh, comparable to Emerald Mountain because both areas are close to town. Both have multi-directional trails. Both have genuine single track and both areas see heavy use by pedestrians and bikers. I talked to um, the director of uh, Pitkin, uh, Pitkin County Open Space and tried to get some feedback on these trails. And he told me uh, Pitkin County Board of Commissioners does not allow e-bikes in Sky Mountain Park because they consider class one e-bikes motorized. 
Sky Mountain Park includes conservation easements that specify non-motorized use only, similar to Emil Mountain. The Roaring Fork Transportation Authority did a study a few years ago to see the public's acceptance on e-bikes on trails. That study showed support for e-bikes on paved and commuter trails only. Also, the Roaring Fork Transportation Authority employs, employs rangers that enforce the e-bike ban on single track, and that has led to a few tickets. Um, in conclusion, the recent surge we've seen on recreation on Colorado public lands has made it really clear how important and special Emerald Mountain is. Um, the growing popularity of Emerald Mountain trails means we have to ensure it's preserved as a non-motorized use for future generations. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you, Sandy. Um, so we've received a lot of comment uh, tonight already, and I, I do want to be mindful that we need to get back to council soon so we can move, the, move our decision forward. But I did want to see if there's if there's anybody else who wants to make a comment, I would like to see if you could if there's anything new that you'd like to add that hasn't been discussed yet. I, I welcome you to give us your name and address and, and give us that comment. Anybody else have anything new that they'd like to add to the discussion on e-bikes? Are you seeing uh, Thomas Wood down there? No. Nope. Thomas Wood, Sandy, unmute your mic. Start talking. Yeah, you need to unmute yourself there. I see someone with an iPhone with a hand up over there. There we go. There we go. Hi, I'm Sandy Buchanan. I live at 1055 Saratoga. I'm not Tom, but Tom agrees with what I have to say. I uh, lived in the Fairview neighborhood all my adult life. And uh, I'm kind of flabbergasted we're here that any of you council members that live and breathe in Steamboat would consider doing this to Emerald Mountain the crown jewel in the backyard. It's 100% guaranteed use is gonna increase on Emerald and I'm okay with that. There's more people in town we need to share. But you're adding a new use. It's you guys that are deciding to do this. And it is such a horrible idea. Most people I know are flabbergasted that you're even considering it because of all the things that anybody here has ever spoken. The Ortons, Diane, Soren, everyone. Gretchen, everything that's ever happened up until this point begs you to preserve this, to have the guts to say, what a treasure we have. This is what I want to do. This is what the town I want to live in. This is the soul of the town and I want to preserve it. It's just crazy that you're even considering the tsunami. You're rewarding a group of people that you readily admit don't obey by the rules. It's flabbergasting on so many levels. I'm just going to leave it at that. And I know you guys are going to do the right thing. I pray you're going to do the right thing. All right. Thank you, Sandy. And I see iPhone has a hand up. I don't know who that is, but if you could unmute yourself and give us your name and address. Give you three minutes. Hey, uh, this is Matt Helm, uh, 441 7th Street. And I've lived here about 20 years. Um, I'm a teacher at the high school, um, Steamboat Springs High School. I'm also also a uh, bike ambassador for Steamboat Springs. I've been doing it for about three years. I'm probably on a bike about every day. Um, I ride regular bikes and I do ride an e-bike. Um, I actually have a disability that a lot of people don't know about. And having to explain that every time I get stopped somewhere is also going to be a pain in the butt too. So what I end up doing most of the time is ride up Buffalo Pass Road and try to ride the motorcycle trails. Motorcycle trails are not made for e-bikes. Um, an e-mountain bike is made for single track. It is not dangerous like all these people are saying. I know almost everybody that spoke tonight, but I don't ever see any of them on bikes. Uh, maybe a couple of them. Gretchen, yes, of course. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of fear mongering when it comes to e-bikes. I think there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of uneducation about them. Uh, class one e-bikes are very easy to distinguish between class two and three whether people say they are or they are not. Um, people say that they can go 20 miles per hour uphill. I will tell you, no, they will not. You might, I might average eight miles per hour uphill if I'm pedaling fast in turbo mode, but usually I'm in eco or trail mode doing maybe five to eight, five to six miles per hour. 
coming down the mountain feels just like a mountain bike. There's no, no difference in the feel of a mountain bike. Um, I used to ride downhill bikes that weighed as much as my, my e-bike weighs. Um, so I just want to say that there's a lot of misinformation and I feel like there's a lot of people that have the not in my backyard mentality. Um, and that seems to be kind of a trend in steamboat and it's kind of annoying. You know, I've been here 20 years and I see that trend a lot, like very oppositional to change. Um, we've been talking about e-bikes on Emerald for at least three years now. I think one trial, one year trial is going to be beneficial. I think you'll see that there will not be user conflicts like everybody's worried about. So I urge everybody to vote to allow the one year trial. Um, I know that a lot of you said that you're hearing all these complaints. You're going to hear the complaints more than you hear people for something like this. Okay. You're going to hear the squeaky wheel and they're probably going to get the grease. That's how things work. So that's all I want to say. I want to say, at least give it a chance. Um, there are a lot of people I know that, We'll benefit from it, and we should not be afraid of e-bikes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matt. All right, so we need to wrap up this public comment uh, so we can get to council, but does anybody in the public have anything to say that has not been said at this point? Anybody have anything that hasn't been noted to, to add to the conversation? Okay. Hearing none, I will close public comment. All right, council. So obviously had a lot of passionate input there and a lot of important stuff for us to consider from a lot of different perspectives. So uh, did anybody have any questions to follow up or are we ready for some discussion and then a motion? I have a couple. Sorry, what was that? I have a couple questions. Yeah, go ahead. So, Craig or Angela, can you help me understand the, the sentiment that e-bikes are heavy and they're going to damage our trail system and help me understand, I know that both e-bikes and mountain bikes are getting lighter and lighter solely for, I guess, speed and ease of use. Um, what's the difference between a 200 pound man riding an e-bike, a uh, mountain bike, and a 150 pound woman riding an e-bike. I mean, are we going to see such dramatic difference in running of the trails and degradation? Like Scott had said, I, that you're gonna not have that wheel spinning uh, situation with an e-bike. Are we really looking at true damage to the trail system anywhere? That's a great question. As we talk to other communities who like, like Jefferson County, again, who did trial studies. And by the way, Jefferson County has a dedicated open space tax that for their community. And they have a very large, well-funded program that has rangers and everything. Just saying, be great for our community. But they've conducted lots of studies and uh, they did not have any comments about seeing more impacts and trail degradation from the use of e-bikes since they've opened up the trail system. Now, I don't have the answer for you. That 2015 study was what it was. It, uh, it cited some slight increased uh, use or damage to trails. Um, I think part of the discussion is also how um, they may accelerate, I guess, the, the bigger discussion here is user etiquette and are people go, how people are going to ride. Um, if somebody is riding a regular mountain bike and uh, hitting their brakes and locking their brakes up into all their corners, that's not a good scenario for our trail system. So I don't know if I can answer your question as far as uh, it would seem like a, a 200 pound male versus a 150 pound person with a 50 pound bike may have the same impacts, but I don't have the answer for Okay, um, and then if we instill a no e-bike policy on Emerald, how are we going to enforce this? And how is someone going to be able to delineate like um, our iPhone user said, uh, a disability versus someone that says, hey, I just got my knee replaced and it's gonna be a rough season. So I'm gonna ride my e-bike up there. What, I guess, how does someone, 
how are we as a city going to police this? I'll take that one. Angela, your Parks and Rec director again. Enforcement on every issue within our park system, whether it's the river or our trails, is a challenge. We don't have an enforcement mechanism and our police department is trapped and they have to prioritize other items. Um, so it's the same as when we talk about river rangers. Enforcement is a problem until their funding exists to hire rangers. And then I guess the same goes to, um, we hear a lot of, I heard a lot of comments on motorized vehicles, quote unquote, in that definition. And if that is true, truly the definition on Emerald, why are we even allowing motorized vehicles on the core trail? I'm, I'm having a hard time delineating why a single track is being singled out when we have now we're saying community trails that are not going to be singled out. Why is there such differentiation and why are we doing this? I mean, we really are, in my opinion, it looks like almost prejudicing an entire area because of its width. And, and I, I don't know, I don't understand where those limits and parameters are within the motorized vehicle code not only in the House bill, but in what we've described and discussed today. Can you help me understand width issues and why we're having those conversations? Would defer to perhaps somebody from legal on the interpretation of motorized versus non-motorized. Um, from my understanding, the state has helped clarify that allowing the use of class one and two e-bikes on trails where bicycles are allowed. So that being said, um, a lot of agencies and, and communities like ours are having that discussion, should they be allowed there? Um, they don't say the width of the trail, um, whether the intent was there or not. There's state agencies that are allowing this. There's conservation easement areas throughout the state that are allowing this. And it's each municipality's uh, prerogative to go through the public process and figure out if that's something the community wants to have. And again, that's where we are today. Okay. Can I hear from Jason? On the I... question too. What um, did you say, oh, Angela? Oh, just saying that it'd be great to hear from legal on the ADA question too. And if someone is temporarily disabled or what type of paperwork they would have to require, or if it's even appropriate to ask or legal to ask for that, that's your, your first question. No. Great. Um, all right. I will uh, weigh in on both of those. Um, I guess I'll just reiterate what Craig said regarding um, regarding motorized. I think that it's difficult for people to accept that um, we used to use the terminology for non-motorized before e-bikes came into existence. Um, but we do have state law that allows local jurisdictions to make decisions on bike and pedestrian paths. Um, it doesn't say paved path in the law. Um, and we've seen, as Craig described, different jurisdictions take different approaches, whether only they want to only do paved flat trails, they want to do mountainous trails. So Pitkin versus Jefferson, and that's where we are. And, and your city attorney's office feels like you're on firm footing to make those decisions, just like other communities have. You can certainly say no, um, and you can also say yes. Um, with regards to the ADA, you know, folks with disabilities can be on Emerald Mountain with a um, e-bike or another uh, mobility device currently under our current policy, and that's available on our website. Um, under the ADA, we have to accommodate disabled persons um, using electric assisted bicycles as well as other power driven mobility devices. Um, I can certainly try to get you guys some more information. We have this issue on our city buses where people try to bring like a dog. You know, it's, it's not really a place where we want to be pressing people about their disability um, and neither should other users be um, interrogating folks on the trail. Um, I, I, I can try to get some guidance um, on how that works out. There's not a ton of guidance. We've researched this a couple years ago um, in the ADA regulations. Um, 
but I can try to find something more for our Parks and Rec staff to work with. Um, certainly would want to hear if anybody was being harassed um, on our Emerald Mountain Trails or any trail for, um, you know, exercising their rights under the ADA. Sonia, did I see you had your hand up? Yeah, you know, I was just kind of hoping we could move this along to deliberation and a decision. Um, you know, when we had this conversation back in December, um, there are two of us who were opposed to um, having um, the e-bikes on Emerald Mountain. And I kind of thought I heard here in the previous discussion that we had at least two more at this point. So, you know, I'm just hoping we can uh, do as one of the public commenters said and do the right thing, which you know, the last time we spoke about this in December, I was making the point about the degradation of the trails and, you know, whether it's an e-bike or a bike, adding more users to the trails will inherently degrade the trails. So, you know, when we continue to add additional uses and users, um, almost regardless of what type of, of, of use it is, and we do not have a corresponding increase in funding, as Craig pointed out, some of these places where the e-bikes are allowed are very well funded, we're kind of being irresponsible in terms of overcrowding and, you know, just not maintaining and investing our trail system. So, you know, we looked at the safety issues last go around, we looked at degradation of trails, but I think today um, we really had a much more robust conversation because, you know, I've been in land conservation my entire career and it's not often that you get to um, explore the intent of some of these incredible, incredible transactions that so many people in our community have benefited from. and you know, really look at who put the blood, sweat, and, and tears into these questions. Um, what were the, what was the intent of the conservation easement? I mean, I think, you know, we've looked at this and our staff is recommending that, you know, it's okay for us from a legal perspective to um, go ahead and allow these e-bikes on Emerald Mountain. But, you know, just because it's okay or it's a slippery legal area, does that mean it's the right thing to do? Um, you know, when you look at the, the transaction that the Orton family put into the hands of so many of us, frankly, for a bargain sale to some degree, if you look at it, um, are we dishonoring the intent of, of people who are trying to give back to this community by directly violating their wishes of non-motorized recreational use? Um, so I don't know. I'm hoping that some of you folks have been as um, moved as I have by the conversations of the people who we don't usually hear from um, a lot of these folks about what they were trying to accomplish by giving us such a great gift. And, you know, it isn't about e-bikes. Uh, we can talk about e-bikes again in a different way and different places. This is about Emerald Mountain and it's about the intent of conserving Emerald Mountain and it's about the safety of our community. And I really hope that we can expeditiously take em Emerald off the table and then maybe we get to the other pieces of this that, you know, are going to require some more thought and consideration. But I, I think we have four people who are willing to take it off the table right now. Yeah, and for me, I think right now at this point, we've had ample time for input and, and time to think about this. So what I'd like to propose is we get a motion on the floor and then council can start giving their comments in, in light of that motion. So I'd like to hear a motion, please. I move that we uh, ban e-bikes on Emerald Mountain. Are we just uh, voting on each one of the five? Or are we voting? Yeah, I, are we taking? There's five, yeah, let's talk about this. Right, Why? Well, yeah, I think we need, even, even if we start at five and work back to one, we should make a motion on each of them or do it all together and then do whatever we have to do to fix it. But. Um, well, I, I think the, the way to do it, I mean, the ordinance is presented to us in total. So right. I, I think the smart thing to do is for somebody to make a motion about this ordinance and either to say, accept the, accept the ordinance or change the ordinance in this way, whether it's one revision, two revisions. I think we need to have a comprehensive motion from two people, and then we can talk through those, those issues. Well, that's point. why I was asking about other people's opinions on one, two, three, and four, because I'll make a motion that we accept w that we, um, how do we do this? The so first reading of an ordinance to include one, a 15 miles per hour speed limit on specific trails, two, a two year trial period allowing use of class two e-bikes on the Yampico Trail on the Walton Creek Trail, 
And I would change that for myself to one year, three, a one year trial period allowing class one e-bikes on specific soft surface trails and negate number four. But Which we is- haven't talked about the other one. So that's why it's hard for me to do a motion when we haven't talked about the specifics of the other ones, but there it is. So yeah. It's a quintuple barreled motion there. So we have to right. like all four pieces of it. Okay, so we have a motion by Crossan and a second by Sloop. Discussion on that motion. I'll start. I, I'm not gonna support this because I really and truly feel that if we're gonna do e-bikes all around, except for in one spot, then we need to do e-bikes all around. I mean, where this looks on all of the literature written, and I mean, I literally listened, I've read, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. I'm having a real hard struggle with real trying to delineate a winner and a loser here. This is not anything more than what we just discussed with Triple Crown. We had this council state, majority state, that Emerald is not off the books, but then you look at what our policy says and it it's supposed to be just for youth. So this is the exact thing. We are literally alienating a certain spot because we have a vociferous crowd here saying that we should. Why didn't we do that with Triple Crown? Or why didn't we give direction to Gary with saying stay away from Emerald? I, I'm having a hard time delineating how Emerald is any different than a, and I'm not talking about the core trail in as much as I'm talking about the neighborhood trails. To me, if we're doing this, we have to do it all in. We can't nitpick one or the other. And I I think that's being very biased toward a definition of what a trail is. Um, it, It shouldn't be of where it is, but what a trail is. Our Parks and Rec Department isn't defining use of any of these trails differently. So I, I'm, I'm struggling with how we can say that Emerald's different than anything else. So just because it's a width and we got confirmation that there is no definition of width use in any of our, in our, our literature. So I, I can't support any of this at this point. So Heather, you don't see any difference between single track and a protected area? I'm, and I'm not saying that. I'm not seeing any page. difference in the literature. Okay, so there's that discussion. Who else uh, would like Jason, to discuss the motion? Can I just Michael? have a clarification of the motion on the table? Robin stated that of the approved on page uh, two of the presentation, it has 15 mile an hour speed limit, class one e-bikes on court Walton Creek, core Walton Creek two year for class two bikes. Item four is class one e-bikes and neighborhood trails. And then five was oh. class two bikes on Emerald Mountain. She said something. Okay. But I'm sorry. I'm working off of 18.1, the front page of our communication form. Thank you. And there are four items there versus what's on the um, the PowerPoint. The ordinance itself is uh, page 18.278. There's okay. the legal language. So uh, on, on that, fine. And that's what I agree with on there. I, I was, I'm going to support the motion to, to not have e-bikes on Emerald at all uh, at this time. I would rather see the 2A group come up with a trail that is specifically designed that our community cares about e-bike users, develop a new trail just for e-bikes and other people that want to ride it. That's fine. But then we can actually monitor whether or not that trail is is more beaten up, is, is the wear and tear, right? So if we're truly concerned about e-bikes having themselves a trail, fine. We need to build them one. And we have group and we have money to build it, okay? Emerald Mountain is a jewel, and I respect the Orton's easement that they offered and what we purchased. And I think we need to honor that. Bottom line, Emerald Mountain is that. 
It has, to me, nothing to do with that e-bikes aren't allowed up there because we're discriminating. The way you get out of discrimination is building them their own trail. We're not saying no. We're just saying no right here. All right. Thanks, Michael. Who else would like to discuss the motion? Hi, Kellyanne. Um, I'm, I'm really torn on this. I, I really don't think it's fair to say that one way is the good way or one way is the right way. I mean, I really don't think that's fair. I mean, there are extremely compelling reasons on each side of this argument of why we should or should not allow e-bikes on Emerald. And so I think that's why I'm struggling so much is um, I really do think that it allows more people to, to access trails and to enjoy biking, which is a huge part of Steamboat later in life. Um, you know, for different types of disability that maybe aren't physical in nature. Um, you know, I just, I think it opens up a playing field a little bit. Um, I also get the concerns about safety and I, you know, I, I am not a biker, I'm a hiker. Um, and and so I, I don't understand some of the pieces to this, but I had a lot of people write me and say, what am I supposed to do when I'm going up the hill and somebody is able to just kind of go past me with the pedal assist? I, I'm gonna have to get off every time, it's gonna cause such an issue. And I, I just never considered that. Um, on the other hand, as a hiker, I hate having to get off the trail all the time for bikers, right? So there's this also this point of, we have to learn how to share and we have to learn how to allow access to everybody who wants to do it differently. Um, so I, I'm gonna support the motion because I'm on the fence and because I think we can take this up later when we see how e-bikes are progressing forward. Um, but I, I am really on the fence because I kind of wanted to see how a trial went to see if there were issues to see kind of what Michael said, but to me, why not just do it where we're contemplating it, right? Like see if there's wear and tear, see if there's issues. Um, I'm still going to support the motion though. I, I do think we need to think bigger though. It is not fair to say that these trails are for me and, and people that do the things that I want to do. Um, these trails are for everybody and we need to think about that. And the safety thing I think is the biggest thing that stood out for me of if these bikes are 50 pounds and they could cause more issues with um, less technically advanced riders, you know, is that going to be a real problem? Um, that maybe is just a small element of why I, I'm supporting the motion and um, willing to take this up at a later date and time when we have more information. Okay. Other comments on the motion? Um, I will not be supporting the motion. And of course, I am 100% in support of preserving Emerald Mountain as non-motorized single track conservation easement as was intended, which is very different than six foot wide paved core trail and also paths and roads as were uh, identified in the house bill. So that part, of course, I'm 100% in, in support of. But to be honest with you, um, when we make motions and have resolutions that are ordinances, excuse me, that include four elements that we really haven't discussed much um, and it's 10 o'clock at night, I just don't think we're doing our best work. And, and you know, if I actually had my druthers, I would table this entire discussion for a future date because I think we are not doing our best work. And I think we owe it to our constituents to really talk about each of these four elements of this ordinance and not just the Emerald Mountain piece. Um, so I'm going to vote against the motion. And, you know, I'm also going to just note that we do have a second reading. So, I mean, anybody can change their mind about Emerald or any of the other pieces of this. And I just ask that we have it at an earlier time of the evening because I think this council performs better when it's not hour number five. Okay, any other discussion on the motion? Okay, I'll I'm gonna support, oh, go ahead, Kathy. No, that's okay. I'm gonna be supporting the motion. Um, and I, I think we have been listening and it's not just tonight, it's all of the input that we've received, the community input on both sides. And um, I think between first and second reading, uh, we need to take out the trial period on Emerald. And so um, that's, I'm, that's why, and I've spoken earlier that for me, it's a safety issue 
And um, I don't have to restate it. We've heard it all before. So thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm going to support the motion too. I think um, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, we we obviously slow go is what we try to do, especially with any big changes. And I think this is obviously one that it would be a big change. And there are obviously safety concerns and concerns over the intent of the conservation easement on Emerald. So for me, Sonia, I think it makes sense for us to actually vote on all this tonight. Uh, this is first reading. If anybody had any concerns about any of the other items, we could have heard about those as well, but we haven't heard those items. And certainly if anybody has any other concerns about the other items, they can bring them up on second reading. And that's why we have two readings. So I'm comfortable moving ahead. And, and just to be clear, the motion, as I understand it, Robin, is that it's approval of all the items with the exception of the trial period on Emerald, and you, you move to change the two-year trial period to a one-year trial period on the core trail. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Just wanted to be clear on the motion. So what I'm going to do is go around and uh, ask each council member how they vote. Uh, so Robin, I'll start with you. I vote for yes. Okay, Heather? No. Okay, Michael? Yes. Okay, Liesl? Yes. Sonia? Opposed. Kathy? Yes. Okay, and I will vote in favor. So that passes five to two with um, Sloop and Macy's opposed. All right. Staff, did you need any other feedback on this one tonight? Nope, thank you very much for the direction. Okay, so next time we'll have this come back to us in the form of second reading and it will be amended as we've set forth tonight. Correct. All right, and thanks everyone. I know uh, it's obviously a long council meeting. we have They don't normally last this long, but obviously a very important topic. We really appreciate everyone staying with us, giving us all your input and um, all the work that a lot of you've done um, on Emerald, Emerald Mountain in particular. So thank you very much for staying with us tonight. All right, so that brings us to our public hearings. Council, I know we've been at it a while. Do you wanna take a break or do you wanna to try to finish things up? Let's keep going. I'm, I'm gonna be going. taking a three to five minute break. I need three to five. Let's okay, do three minutes five. and then let's be right back. Okay. Three minutes and then we'll finish up public hearings and the rest of the agenda.
Hey, Jason. Hey. I think this is the longest meeting since Walter was president. You think? I, I don't know. I don't remember. It's been a long time <laughs> since we've had one this long. All right, we're back on the air. Let's finish up strong. So agenda item 19, we're in public hearings now. And this is second reading of an ordinance, an ordinance rezoning Bennett subdivision lot one from residential neighborhood one RN1 zone district to residential neighborhood two RN2 zone district, ZMA 20-02. And Julie Baxter is listed on this one, but Rebecca, are you presenting this one? I am, yes, Rebecca Bessie, planning director. I thought I would give Julie a break from staying on so late. Um, oh, so I'll, come on. <laughs> I'll give a really brief overview and then I'm happy to get into this um, in more detail if you have any questions. Uh, this is a zone map amendment application to rezone lot one of the Bennett subdivision from RN1 to RN2. The applicant owns both lot one and the adjacent lot two. Um, and they are, they have submitted an application to replat those two lots to combine them into one um, lot. However, they are not zoned the same. So lot one is zoned RN1, lot two is zoned RN2. Um, so this application is intending to get the two properties under the same zone district designation so that they can, um, they can move forward with their combination of, of the two lots. The change is consistent with the character of the neighborhood. It's sort of a mix of RN1 and RN2 in that area of town. <clears throat> Excuse me, staff finds that the application meets the criteria for approval of a zone map amendment and planning commission recommended approval um, seven to zero unanimously and we've received no public comment on this application. I do know that the applicant um, is also on the line if you have any questions. All right, lucky applicant staying with us tonight. All right. Okay, Council, any questions for Rebecca or the applicant? No questions? I have one for Rebecca. Okay. And that is, um, I totally understand why we're trying to uh, be consistent on the zone district, but what is the long-term plan for a, is there an intent to further subdivide this? Not that I understand, no. So we're just going to have a hundred thousand square foot lot? Uh, yes, potentially. There is no maximum lot size for either RN1 or RN2. Um, and actually, the um, if the applicant moves forward with the combination of the two lots, it will eliminate some existing nonconformities nonconformities on the on the two lots right now there's some setback nonconformities so by eliminating that common lot line and combining the two lots they will eliminate those nonconformities so there is some advantages to the the rezoning and the consolidation as well thank you right any other questions okay hearing none any public comment on agenda item 19 any public comment Okay, hearing no public comment, I'll close public comment. Council, I'll look for a motion on agenda item 19. I'll move to approve agenda item 19. Second. Motion by Meyer and second by Bacino. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, pass the seven to zero. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, and next is agenda item 20. This is second reading of an ordinance, an ordinance vacating a utility easement located on lot one, Dallifson subdivision, 232 River Road, EV 20-05. And Rebecca will be introducing this one as well. Um, yes, this is a pretty straightforward easement vacation request. Um, this is a utility easement that was platted with the subdivision originally. The applicant is requesting to vacate it um, to permit the construction of a garage on the property. Uh, there are no utilities existing in the easement and all utility companies have signed off on the request. Um, we've received no public comment and staff is recommending approval. Okay, thank you. Council, any questions? No questions. Any public comment on agenda item 20? Okay, don't see anyone here for public comment. So council, I'll, I'll close public comment and I'll look for a motion to approve. 
Move, move to approve. approve. Second. Motion by Bacino and a second by Meyer. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. And agenda item 21, second reading of an ordinance, an ordinance amending chapter 16 to add article two to the Steamboat Springs revised municipal code pertaining to river recreation, providing an effective date and repealing all conflicting ordinances. And Jennifer Bach and Craig Robinson, I believe are here. Did you have a presentation for us on this one? You know, we did, but uh, it's pretty much the same presentation you saw last time with some updates. So I can give you the updates or I can walk you through the presentation again. How about you give us the updates unless council feels otherwise? Very good. Um, as I spoke with legal staff, Jennifer Bach, uh, about the, the first reading of the ordinance, we realized there was a clerical error in section 1616B1, and we corrected that reference to the correct section of code. Um, as staff uh, uh, reached out to all of the commercial or the vendors that would be selling these commercial or these recreational tubes, we contacted about nine different uh, stores throughout the valley in Steamboat and let them know about the ordinance. Many of them had seen the information. Some of them just had questions about the process on how they would be uh, uh, paying that fee. And we did send them a draft of the ordinance, let them know there was opportunities for public comment and that it was not a done deal. Um, there was one business that expressed some concern and that business had actually been invited to participate in the process that we were going through, but was not able to do that. Um, and also let them know that there was avenues to reach out to you about those concerns. So um, we did provide that information and we are meeting with legal staff on, I'm sorry, with uh, finance staff about next steps on implementing this if it moves forward. And then one last clarification, as we reached out to, to determine who was selling tubes, we clarified within the ordinance that a recreational tube does not mean a fishing float tube. So if you've seen a fishing flow tube on a lake, it's a roughly $150 to $350 tube, specifically geared toward flat water. Occasionally you might see them on the river, but it's not the intent of the, the fee. All right. Thank you, Craig. Council, any questions on agenda item 21? Sonia, you had a question? Yeah, um, just one technical question. I'm having a hard time locating the ordinance in this, this giant packet. Does somebody have the actual page number of that or it's item number? It's at the very end, I think. I think it's 21.22. Okay, uh, I'll look for that. Then the other question was, I was really actually pleased to um, uh, see support for this from one of the local vendors. Um, and I was actually surprised. We, that just came through, I think, kind of late this afternoon. Um, on email, and honestly, we've been kind of flooded with e-bikes, so I'm wondering if I missed any other um, letters of support or opposition from businesses. You mentioned that there was one, Craig, just, just now in the ones that you contacted, but has there been anything else that's come through from the businesses? You know, so, yeah, I didn't see more than that one. What's that? I've, I only had the same one. I, I haven't had any more than that one. I don't know about any other council members. Um, yeah, that's all I've had. Craig, did you did staff receive any other comments? No. Well, uh, again, we had verbal conversations on the phone, and there was some support, as noted in the communication form, and some concern from one on each side. But I had not seen anything written, and was not aware of the one uh, written comment and support. Okay. Any other questions, yeah, Council? To us. Uh, mm -hmm. look, looks like this afternoon, like 4.53, so probably we were all getting ready for the meeting. Yep. Sonia, let me correct that reference for you. It's 21.288 is the second reading version with the correction. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Okay. Any public comment on agenda item 21? Don't see anybody here for that. So I will close public comments and council, I will look for a motion. Motion to approve agenda item 21. Second. Okay, that's a motion by Crossan and a second by Meyer. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Thank you, staff. Thank you. All right, we have agenda item 22. We have a couple planning commission reports from January 25th and February 8th. Any questions or comments on those reports? It's nice to see them back working again. Yeah. There was a break for a while, but it's nice to see things happening. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate their reports. They're good. Absolutely. Okay, nothing on that. Then we will move on to agenda item 23. It's our city attorney report. Dan had some information on an updated ethics code complaint form, recent developments in municipal case law and legislative update. Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add on those items? Uh, thanks, Jason. Um, so at agenda review, Jason suggested that this is probably worth a 30 or 40 minute presentation, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and disregard that advice. Uh, I did wanna add, um, there is a, in the legislative list, there's an item about um, a statute that extends the takeout and delivery of alcohol beverages um, option that currently exists under the governor's executive order. And uh, that is scheduled to expire this summer on July 1st. Uh, but Kathy uh, advised me a couple days ago that um, legislation has already been introduced uh, this year to extend that. So um, I think we can probably expect that that, uh, that will be an option uh, going forward in 2022. Um, other than that, these were just information items. And if you have questions, obviously I can, I can talk about these items, but otherwise no action required. All right, thanks, Dan. Any questions for Dan? I don't have right. any questions, but I just want to say thank you. I thought that was really a really great summary of some of the upcoming legislation and some of the um, past stuff, and I, I just really appreciate it. Yeah, good work. Thank you. Good. That's helpful feedback because, uh, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what, what kind of stuff is of interest to you, and so uh, we'll keep uh, working on that. Anything yep. around allowing dogs in, in public places is always of interest to this community, I think, Dan. Yeah, you know, I, I saw the dog when I was like, you know, that one's going to have to make the list. <laughs> if you can find a few e-bike cases, that would be good, too. <laughs> Please like. All right. All right. Thanks, Dan. All right, council, we have minutes to approve from January 12th, January 19th, February 2nd, and February 9th. There's a few That's titles so that I want to change and make a lot of changes on number nine. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Move to approve. Right. Second. Second. <laughs> Motion by Sloop, second by Macy's. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, passes Move unanimously. Second. second. All right, motion by Sloop, second by Crossan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oppose. Yeah. Put that on the record. Yeah, yeah Michael. Be a party of one. It's fun. Julie, we want to see that in the minutes that Michael opposed. He wanted a longer meeting. Thanks, everyone. Nice job tonight. Keep yeah, it thanks. Going, boys. Keep it going, girls. Good job. Thank you all. Good night. Have, have a good night. Good night.